Hey, we are live on YouTube. We're live on YouTube. Good morning and welcome to the public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission today, June 13th, 2023. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I'll ask our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Bland. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Yeah. Commissioner Chu. Here. Commissioner Ginsburg. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Master. Here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. All right, good morning again and welcome again to the uh, New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing and public meeting of June 13th, 2023. We have a full day today. We will be beginning the morning with a public uh, meeting to uh, review three proposals by the research department for designation and we'll be voting on those proposals. And then we will move to applications for work on designated buildings. And then uh, we will be reviewing an application uh, for uh, uh, seeking a hardship, um, seeking relief under the hardship provision of the landmarks law uh, is the final item for the day. And that will be a public hearing. And uh, this meeting is being held via Zoom. It's also live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you would like to testify on any of the public hearing items today, you may do so by joining the Zoom meeting at the estimated time for that item, which can be found on our agenda, public hearing agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would just like to watch the proceedings, you may do so at our YouTube channel. And so with that, I will turn it over to our Director of Research, Kate Limas mikhail to take us through the Research Department's agenda. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Item number one this morning is LP2667, Bronx Opera House, 436 to 442 East 149th Street in the Bronx, Block 2293, Lot 46 in part. Item proposed for designation is a four-story Italian Renaissance Revival style theater building built in 1912 to 13 by George Keister that became home to Latin music clubs between the early 1960s and the early 1980s. And I have a little background on this before we get started. Um, after holding the public hearing last month, research staff discovered that in 1978 to nine, the commission held a hearing on designating the Bronx Opera House as a landmark and an interior landmark. The files are incomplete, but it appears it was being considered for its architectural qualities and for its status as a legitimate theater. The owner had defaulted and the mortgager opposed designation for economic reasons. The building was no longer a theater. There were few tenants and there uh, were a lot of back taxes owed um, and a hardship was threatened. The commission voted to deny the designations. Subsequently, the local community and elected officials started a campaign to save the building, a campaign that was supported by then Mayor Koch and it was eventually sold and preserved. The commission is currently considering designation based not only on its architectural merit and early history as a legitimate theater, but also for its cultural significance related to its specific connection to the Bronx's innovative and influential Latin music and dance scene in the 1960s and 70s. This cultural significance was not yet recognized when the building was first considered. And further, since then, the building has been sensitively rehabilitated involving extensive facade restoration by the current property owner who takes great pride in the history of the building and the work that they've done to preserve it. So I will now turn it over to Bill Gay Kosa. Good morning, I'm Bill Gay Kosa from Resource Department. 
The Bronx Opera House was designed by George Carster in 1912 in the Italian Renaissance Revival style. The building served as a popular entertainment and social gathering center for nearly 50 years, from the early Broadway acts along the subway circuit to becoming one of the most significant cultural values, uh, venues for the city's growing Latin music scene from the 1960s to the early 1980s. At the public hearing on May 2nd, 2023, three people testified in support of the proposed designation, including representatives of the Historic Districts Council and the New York uh, Landmark Conservancy, and a representative of both the Mott Haven Historic Districts Association and Bronx Borough Landmarks Preservation Community. No one spoke in opposition. The Commission also received nine letters in support of the designation, including from the representative of East Bronx History Forum and eight individuals. No letters were received in opposition. The Bronx Opera House is located at 436 442nd East 149th Street between Bergen Avenue and Brook Avenue in the South Bronx. The Bronx Opera House is located in the oldest major shopping area of the Bronx in Melrose area shown here on a map from 1921. With the opening of the elevated rail line along Third Avenue in mid 1880s, the process of urbanization began to transform the Mott Haven, Melrose and Murziana sections of the southwestern Bronx. The development only intensified after the arrival of the subway in 1904 and residential housing and small frame structures gave way to new low apartments and large commercial buildings. By the turn of the century, the commercial heart of Melrose with numerous theaters, shops and banks was centered here around the intersection of East 149th Street, Willis, Third and Melrose Avenues known as the Hub. The intersection of 149th Street and Third Avenue became known as the 42nd Street and Broadway of the Bronx, and for much of the 20th century, it was the great business center of the North Borough. The developer of the Bronx Opera House was George M. Cohen, known as the man who owns Broadway. He was considered by many to be the first superstar of American show business, working as an actor, composer, playwright, producer, dancer, songwriter, and theater owner, and creating many popular songs such as Yankee Doodle Dandy and Give My Regards to Broadway. Mr. Cohen opened several theaters in the first two decades of the 20th century, including the Bronx Opera House as part of the subway circuit. This refers to Broadway productions that were tested in cities outer boroughs before going out on regional or nationwide tours. These shows brought stars like John, Lionel and Ethel Barrymore, Gillian Altinge and Cohen himself to the Bronx Opera House. The architect of the Bronx Opera House, George Keister, specialized in the design of theater buildings and his architectural practice was largely active from 1880s through the 1930s. George Keister designed more than a dozen theater buildings throughout Manhattan and the Bronx, including two individually designated New York City landmarks, Velasco Stuyvesant Theater and Hurt and Simmons Apollo Theater. Following the fashion of era's theater buildings, the front portion of the building where the main entrance, lobby, restaurants and the banquet hall were, uh, were located was the public face of the Bronx Opera House. The elaborate front facade of this portion was constructed in the Italian Renaissance Revival style, which features a tripartite design with classically inspired ornament, articulated fluted plasters and carved tympaniums. The rear portion where the auditorium was located had a plain facade without an ornament. By the 1960s through 1980s, the banquet hall located at the second floor of the front building served as a major cultural venue hosting a succession of three Latin music clubs, the Club Caravana, the Bronx Casino and El Ramar, which were central to the Bronx in a way to an influential Latin music scene. The photograph on the right shows the entrance and the signboard, signboard of Club El Ramar in 1979. After World War II, large numbers of people from Puerto Rico migrated to New York, first settling in East Harlem and soon after in the South Bronx. In 1940, there were approximately, approximately 61,000 Puerto Ricans living in the New York City. In 1950, that number climbed to 245,000 and continued to rise in the following decade. For the Puerto Rican community in the South Bronx, music and dance performances were the expression of their identity and culture. 
between the early 1960s through the early 1980s, the Bronx Opera House became one of the most significant artistic centers in the area, being home to the succession of the Latin music clubs, where the era's major Latin stars, including the Mambo Kings, Maquito, Tito Rodriguez and Tito Puente, Charlie and Eddie Palmieri, Johnny Pacheco and Joe Chiano came to showcase their distinctive cultural output. Seen here are some of the ads for the performances in the venues and cover of an album inspired by Bronx Casino containing hits that Al Bravo played here in the venue. Charlie Palmieri and his brother Eddie Palmieri recorded a live album at the building entitled Pachanga at Club Caravan in 1961, which increased the club's popularity and established its reputation as the home of Pachanga. In the New York Times, the Ballroom magazine and seen here, the Daily News acknowledged the Bronx Opera House as a location that was pivotal to the emergence of the Pachanga dance craze. Pictures here show the Palmieri brothers band rehearsing in Bronx Opera House Ballroom, and Charlie Palmieri and Dagmar Jarrell demonstrate the steps of Pachanga. For several decades, the front building of the Bronx Opera House continued to serve the growing Latin community of the South Bronx with dances, concerts, and for many, for many, it is remembered as an important place of social gathering and expression of Latinx culture. The Latin music clubs left the building by the early 1980s, and the former Bronx Opera House was used as a Pentecostal church, Temple de Renovación Espiritual, between the 1980s and the early 2000s. This pl floor plan shows the original layout of the first floor. In 2011, the rear portion of the building where the auditorium was located was demolished and the new three-story office building was constructed on its place. The front portion of 149th Street, which contained the former main entrance, lobby restaurants, and the second floor banquet hall where the Latin music clubs were located, was converted into the Opera House Hotel in 2012-2013 by the current property owner. This sensitive adaptive reuse preserved the historic facade and the building's prominence within the hub. By the time it was home to Latin music clubs, the historic marquee had been replaced and the historic signage and the top floor balustrades were removed. Today, the Bronx Opera House retains its public face with its intact and elaborate facade that reflects its historic use as a theater. It is a marker for its cultural history tied to Latin music, music and culture and continues to contribute to the social life and liveliness of the hub. The landmark site proposed is composed of the historic front portion of the building facing East 149th Street. Once as a popular theater that saw some of the most esteemed Broadway stars of the early 20th century, and then as a social gathering place where Latin music and dance was performed as a cultural expression of the community, the Bronx Opera House has served the citizens of the Bronx and New York for nearly 100 years. Being home to Latin music clubs, the Bronx Opera House was an instrumental place that helped spark a dance revolution with famous acts. Due to its architectural quality and cultural significance, the research department recommends that the Landmarks Preservation Commission was to designate the Bronx Opera House as an individual landmark. Thank you. Thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions for Kate or Bilga? All right, not seeing any questions. I'm gonna ask you all to unmute. We can uh, have any discussion that you all may wanna participate in. So does anyone have any thoughts about this item? I could uh, kick it off with a few thoughts. I'm, um, you know, I'm really delighted we're looking at these items today. Um, this uh, three items came uh, from Bronx surveys as well as thematic surveys that the research department has been working on. And um, it's, you know, I'm really delighted that we are able to follow up on this comprehensive survey that we did of the Bronx last year. We started with our first designation that came out of that survey, the Gompers High School, and uh, these are the next round to come through. Um, and so we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to go ahead? Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, we thank the 
thank you and the staff for this survey uh, of the borough and for the uh, designations that have resulted from that survey. Uh, may, they, may, may the survey and the designations continue. Uh, there's plenty more where that came from borough. Um, in terms of this particular building, I think it's, it's it, you know, the history as has been described to us is, is remarkable and very significant. Uh, the hub is the downtown of the Bronx, um, and it's uh, it has had a hard hard time, as much of the Bronx has had uh, over the past decades. And like much of the Bronx, it's it's seeing a uh, revival and a re-strengthening of uh, many of uh, of its buildings and its blocks. Um, the designation of, um, of this building is very very important to that. Um, because because of the very mixed nature of the uh, of, of the hub, it's it's chaos, it's intensity, it's it's intent, it's development. Um, the preservation of of the history, especially in such a an intact, highly decorative uh, building, uh, is is something that will contribute to the to the uh, development of that neighborhood and of the borough. So I think it's a, it's 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 important for for the Bronx as it redevelops and as it as it grows uh, to at the same time celebrate its history and preserve it and uh, see see how it weaves into the new developments as they develop. So I think it's really wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I just as uh, someone who's served on the commission for a long time. Um, I'm, I am continue to be pleased and impressed with the um, additional information that we get about these buildings as we look into their historical and cultural significance and uh, find that that is uh, really adds so much uh, to your sense of the landmark. So uh, I thank, thank the staff uh, for doing that. And I'm glad to see this tendency over time to include so much of uh, that part of the history of the building along with the, obviously the architectural uh, character. Great, thank you. Thank you, any other thoughts? So, and just to follow up on Commissioner Chapin's thought, you know, this building is truly an architectural, it's already a visual landmark in, in the hub. Um, it's Italian Renaissance revival style facade remains remarkably intact thanks to the uh, current owners. And it remains extremely prominent in the busy hub. And uh, it, as Kate mentioned earlier, we did recognize the architectural significance in the past, in the distant past. Um, but it, to Commissioner Chapin's point, I think that in some ways, being able to look at it today uh, gives us a broader lens. And the current owner since then has carefully restored the building and adaptively reused it. And, um, and our research department has been doing um, much more in-depth and inclusive work and research we, as we have continued to strive to recognize and tell the story of all New Yorkers. Uh, we have now been able to really dig into the research and consider the full history of this building, both its early ties to Broadway, but also its significance starting in the 1950s as a major center of Latino culture and an important social gathering place for the rapidly growing Puerto Rican community in the South Bronx. Um, and being able to now recognize that the music produced within those walls uh, would go on to influence music culture, musical culture nationwide. So um, it it's uh, had an incredible impact here in the Bronx and the city. And as Commissioner Goldblum said, I look forward to seeing it continue to thrive and influence as we move into the future. Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to add something? Yes, I was going to add that it's it's not only culturally significant. It's also architecturally spatially significant yeah. in that the location of it, in that where the train turns and that space and this beautiful facade is really architecturally quite significant. It in is, absolutely. Other three things, yeah. Absolutely. 
and it you know it does really stand out when you are uh, walking on the street here. All right, anyone else? All right, so I think if it's uh, if everybody's comfortable with that, I'd love to make a motion to designate this Commissioner Goldblum. Would you make the motion? Sure. Uh, I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate the Bronx Opera House, 436 to 442 East 149th Street in the Borough of the Bronx as a New York City landmark because of its special character, its special historic and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development heritage and cultural characteristics of the city, state and nation as set forth in the designation report for LP 2667 dated June 13, 2023. I also move that the Borough of Manhattan, Borough of Manhattan, maybe Borough of the Borough Bronx, of Bronx. The tax map, <laughs> block 2293, lot 46, be designated as its landmark site as described in the designation report and illustrated in the attached map. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Second. Thank you. And uh, Mark, will you call the vote? I will. My computer has crashed, so I'm going to call the vote, perhaps a little bit out of order, but Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner uh, Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commis Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. I think I got everybody. Uh, Commissioner Lutfi. You got her. Already. Oh, got <laughs> you. Okay. But thank good. you. Yeah, yes, with, <laughs> with nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's our newest landmark, and I'm delighted. Thank you all so much. We'll move to the next item. Item number two. I am unmuted. Good. Item number two is LP 2669, Firehouse, Engine Company 88, Ladder Company 38 at 2225 Belmont Avenue, Bronx, Block 3086, Lot 38. Item proposed for designation is a 1908 Prairie Style uh, Firehouse designed by Hertz and Talent. Presenting is Lisa Buckley. Good morning. I'm Lisa Buckley from the Research Department. The Engine Company 88, Ladder Company 38 Firehouse was constructed in 1908 to serve the growing population of the Belmont neighborhood of the Bronx. This firehouse, designed by Hertz and Talent, is a rare example of the firm's work in civic architecture. It represents a period following consolidation when New York City employed multiple architecture firms to design firehouses, resulting in a variety of styles, and it is the only known example of Prairie School influence design in a New York City firehouse. At a public hearing on May 2nd, 2023, four people testified in favor of the proposed designation, including the chief of Ladder Company 38, as well as representatives of the New York Landmark Conservancy, Landmarks Conservancy, the Historic Districts Council, and the Mott Haven Historic District Association. There were no speakers opposing designation. In addition, the commission received nine letters in support of the proposed designation, including from representatives of the East Bronx History Forum and eight individuals. The firehouse is in the Belmont neighborhood of the Bronx to the west of the Bronx Park and south of Fordham University. There are currently no designated landmarks in the area with the exception of portions of the Bronx Zoo located within the park to the east of the neighborhood. This 1901 Sanborn map shows the location where the firehouse would be built in 1908. Consolidation of the five boroughs of New York City in, 19, in 1898 led to an expanded and more widely professionalized firefighting force, phasing out the remaining volunteer fire departments still operating in the outer boroughs. Firefighting infrastructure was needed due to the population growth in neighborhoods such as Belmont and led to the construction of many new firehouses in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
The firehouse was originally divided into two separate facilities for each company and was bisected by a wall running the depth of the building. The lot is relatively narrow at 50 feet, and this, along with the mirrored design of the two companies, two companies' quarters, necessitated verticality in the firehouse design. The ground floor originally contained horse stalls, a wash desk for each company, and room for storage of steam engines, ladders, and other apparatus. Officers were located on the second offices were located on the second floor, along with sleeping quarters occupying what was deemed a dormitory floor. The third story housed a recreation room as well as locker rooms and storage. Because it was common practice for the firefighters to eat their meals at home, there were no kitchen facilities in the original firehouse design. The turn of the century saw the use of increasingly mechanized firefighting equipment and an eventual move away from horse-drawn equipment. Ladder Company 38 acquired its first motorized tractor-pulled ladder in 1918, and Engine Company 88 followed suit in 1920, and the horses were retired. The former stable area was later converted to a kitchen. After 60 years of the two companies operating in mirrored facilities, the interior wall dividing them was demolished around 1968. As Ladder Company 38 Captain Doug Mitchell testified in the late 1960s and on into the 1970s, an epidemic of arson overtook the surrounding neighborhoods and the FDNY was stretched to its limits. Engine Company 88 and Ladder Company 38 played an important role in fighting these and other fires within and beyond the Belmont neighborhood for almost 120 years. The firm of Hertz and Talent were engaged to design the firehouse in 1906. The firm was established in 1897 when former Ecole de Beaux-Arts classmates, Henry Beaumont Hertz and Hugh Talent joined in a partnership on their return to New York. Hertz and Talent established themselves as theater design designers and experts on fireproof building design in the earliest days of the 20th century designing such notable Broadway theaters as the New Amsterdam Theater, the Booth Theater, which are both New York City landmarks, and the now gone Helen Hayes Theater. Construction of the firehouse was completed in 1908 and the firehouse commenced operations on November 15th of that year. This would be among the last commissions of the partnership which dissolved in 1911. Hertz and Talent's design for Engine Company 88, Ladder Company 38 is an impressive example of early 20th century civic architecture. It is the city's only known example of a firehouse incorporating prairie style design and its planar facade is articulated with deeply set windows and a grand corbel limestone window and frame it and decorative brickwork executed in both standard and Roman brick. Carved stone signs above the bays identify each company. The firehouse retains most of its original features and details and has very good integrity. The design of the firehouse suggests that Hertz and Talent may have been influenced by the designs of Frank Lloyd Wright and other Prairie School architects. The Unity Temple was completed in 1906, two years prior to the firehouse, and was widely publicized, so Hertz and Talent were certainly aware of Wright's design. Examples of Prairie School firehouses are somewhat rare, but the style is adapted to this use throughout the country, including the firehouse on the right, located in Pittsburgh, and also built in 1908. The Engine Company 88, Ladder Company 38 firehouse was constructed during a narrow 15-year window between the classically influenced designs of Napoleon Lebrun and Sons and the adoption of the standardized model firehouse plan. The research department recommends that the fire, this firehouse designed by Hertz and Talent is a rare example of the firm's work in civic architecture and is the only example of prairie style influenced design in New York City firehouse. It embraces the innovative new style. And it's example, sorry. And takes a more modern design approach compared to the firm's better known theater designs. The research department recommends that the Landmarks Preservation Commission votes to designate the Engine Company 88, Ladder Company 38 Firehouse as an individual landmark. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Lisa. <laughs>
All right, commissioners, do we have any questions for Kate or Lisa on this item? Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna ask you all to unmute. We can have a discussion and then our vote. So, I, you know, this is um, one of two fire buildings owned by the fire department that we're reviewing today. Um, this particular one was constructed in 1908 to serve the growing population of the Belmont neighborhood of the Bronx and to suit the more widely professionalized New York City firefighting force established after the consolidation of the five boroughs in 1898. Um, it's unique, as we've heard in its design, the lone example of a firehouse uh, from the firm of Hertz and Talent, who were Broadway theater designers and became who became well-known uh, advocates for fireproof building design. Um, so the building is very impressive um, architecturally. It's an impressive example of early 20th century civic architecture and uh, designed in the prairie style with prairie style elements. Um, but we also heard testimony at the hearing from Captain Mitchell who spoke so eloquently about the history of the building and the history of the FDNY in the Bronx in New York City. And I wanna thank Captain Mitchell for the information that he shared with us. I know that his testimony was very moving at the hearing, but he also shared other materials with our research team. And I also wanna uh, thank the FDNY for their ongoing commitment to preserving the history and buildings that represent FDNY in the city and, and thank them for their longstanding support and partnership um, with LPC as we have uh, continued to designate their buildings um, and they have uh, under recognized the importance of the buildings in telling the story of the fire department and, and the history of the city. So I wanna thank them for that as well. Um, any other thoughts on this item? I, yes, yeah, Commissioner I, Chen. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. And Commissioner Chen and then Commissioner Chu. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to echo uh, your sentiment uh, is, uh, it's so nice to see a prairie style building in New York City and that it's being preserved. But more importantly, I uh, just want to extend our condolences to the firefighter that lost his life over the weekend. And I know the Phoenix Society that are Asian members that will be held in their gala this weekend, uh, this Friday. So uh, uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, you know, it's it's very poignant that our buildings today tell this history of the, the, the bravest. Commissioner Chu. Um, yeah, I wanted to echo uh, Commissioner Chen's comment about the passing of the firefighter, but I also wanted to just mention that this building is significant, I think, in a lot of different ways as a marker in time um, for not just um, the advancement of firefighting and the equipment that's needed. Um, I think this building straddled a period of time where technology was changing quickly with firefighting, um, um, the implementation of uh, fireproof buildings for structures like this, because a lot of them used to be built in wood. Um, yeah. And also just having a sense of pride in civic structures. I think this is a great representation of a design for a civic structure that serves the city, but um, celebrates the beauty of its architecture and reflects the current trend of the time. I think that that's also important to note. Um, the references of the Prairie style and what was uh, at the time a very um, new style was picked up and, and was uh, put into a building that didn't normally represent that type of style. So I think it's representative of many things that are, are important historically. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, I, I, I want to add with what Stephen was saying, um, I think that the, the 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 way that the building reflects the technology and embodies it, which which was brought out so eloquently by the captain and talked about it, I think is fascinating, and it's it's important that that's part of our record. Um, I guess if you had shown me a flashcard of this building, in, you know, randomly, I, I don't know if I would have guessed uh, prairie style, uh, but I see it. And I, it's certainly an eclectic building of, of, of a kind of very creative blending of, of different elements from different stylistic handbooks. 
Um, and I think it speaks to, in a funny way, to today, where, where you have a city uh, endeavoring on buildings like this to use creative contemporary architecture uh, in the service of uh, kind of an evolving cityscape uh, that is both beautiful and of the moment. I think this was probably in its day, even, you know, um, it's relatively early you know, in, in the development of that relatively modern style that, that they would even call upon this kind of eclectic uh, approach for a civic building, I think is really wonderful. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really um, speaks to the notion that, you know, we're, we're preserving history as it develops, it's ongoing. And this, this building was in its day, probably rather uh, temporary and maybe a little bit unusual. And I think that, you know, that was, it's, it's a good thing that we're, we're protecting it and it, it tells the story. I think it's great. Thank you so much. Commissioner Lutfi. I, I want to echo all of the sentiments of the commissioners who have spoken, and I just want to add a little bit more to it. It's really interesting to me that throughout the city, there are so many um, firehouses that are very architecturally significant and distinctive, and they're almost like... Um, their punctuation marks in, in the landscape in a really lovely way, in the sense that they recall the history of the period. Um, and they also speak to this amazing, um, you know, group of civil servants that through the ages have been here to support us you know, in our communities and throughout the city, and who, uh, you know, they're, they're tireless. And they also, you know, have had this ability to pivot in difficult times. If you think about the role that the firefighters play today, it's so much broader than what it, it was initially. And I, and I know when I say this, everybody will agree <laughs> with this, but we, because I feel like in our hearts, all New Yorkers love, you know, the firefighters <laughs> and their champions. And so I'm so happy that we're able to, to, to really designate this and all of the, any fire engine, significant fire engine um, house that comes before us, because I think they are important architectural, historical, and cultural landmarks um, in uh, in our in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I got one. I got one. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for your really eloquent comments. They were really lovely. Oh, Commissioner Jefferson, did you want to add something? Uh, uh, for me, architecturally. This building, the symmetrical facade, has a certain boldness that I've never seen before. It has this heaviness, this boldness. It's quite beautiful. I mean, in, in its own presence, that I, that that's unique. I think it is. It is unique, and in its style, and the architects who designed it were theater architects, and and as other uh, commissioners have mentioned, it was very contemporary in its time. Okay, so I, again, thank you all for your wonderful comments. Let's go ahead and make a motion to uh, vote on this one. Commissioner Chen, would you be able to make the motion? Well, let me look up the uh, resolution. I'm looking at the screen. I I moved that the landmark preservation. Oh, hold on a second. I move that the Landmark Preservation Commission designate Firehouse Engine Company 88 Ladder, Company 38, 2225 Belmont Avenue, Borough of the Bronx, as a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical. 
historical and aesthetic interests and value as part of development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP-2669, dated June 13, 2013. I also move for that uh, the Borough of Browns tax map block 3086, lot 38 be designated as landmark site as described in the designation report as illustrated in the attached map. Thank you. And Commissioner Chu, would you second that motion? I second it. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Great. Another New York City landmark joining the collection of very special buildings that are individual landmarks across the city. We'll now move to the next item. Great. Item number three is LP2668, Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau, Bronx Central Office, 1129 East 180th Street, Bronx, Block 4333, Lot 1 in part. Item proposed for designation is an Italian Renaissance Revival style civic building designed by Frank J. Helmley for the FDNY Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau and built from 1913 to 50. And presenting this is Marianne Percival. Good morning. The Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau Bronx Central Office was constructed in the early 20th century as the Fire Department of New York City's Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau decentralized its operations. It was designed by the notable Brooklyn architect Frank J. Helmley and built in 1915. Its intact and highly refined Italian Renaissance Revival style design and prominent sighting at the southern edge of Bronx Park lend to its striking presence. At the public hearing on May the 2nd, 2023, the representatives of the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the Historic Districts Council, and the Mott Haven Historic Districts Association testified in support of designation. No one spoke in opposition. In addition, the commission received correspondence in the in support of designation from 23 individuals, including the representative of the East Bronx History Forum. 22 of those individuals were signing as part of a um, campaign. There was no correspondence in opposition. Through the 19th century, New York's fire alarm system developed to meet the needs of the growing city. The system of lookouts and watchtowers who alerted the city's volunteer firefighters by a series of bells was enhanced in 1851, when the towers were connected to each other by telegraph. The city's volunteer firefighting companies were replaced in 1865 by the Professional Metropolitan Fire Department, which was succeeded in 1870 by the FDNY. At the same time, communications were improved by the introduction introduction of a fire alarm telegraph system of public alarm boxes connected to a central office from which signals were then relayed to the appropriate fire companies. Both the public alarm boxes and telegraph equipment would evolve into in the 20th century. Following consolidation in 1898, the FDNY's fire alarm telegraph operations centered in Manhattan were no longer sufficient to handle alarms for the entire city. To improve response time, new central offices were established in each borough, capable of directly receiving fire alarms and transmitting the information to the appropriate firehouse. After creation of the Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau in 1911, an FDNY building plan included new purpose-built offices for the Bureau. The siting of these buildings in large open lots within city-owned parks was intended to protect them from potential hazards that could impact communications. The southeastern corner of Bronx Park was chosen as the site for the Bronx Central Office. Frank J. Helmley was a successful architect in Brooklyn. Trained to Cooper Union, he worked in the offices of McKim, Mead, and White in the early years of his career. 
working independently and in partnership with other architects, Helmley's body of work includes residential, commercial, ecclesiastical, and civic structures. Among the public buildings are the Prospect Park Boathouse, Helmley and Huberty, 1904, the Brooklyn Central Office Bureau of Fire Communications, designated on April the 19th, 1966, Helmley, 1913, and Firehouse Engine Company 268 and Hook and Ladder Company 137, Helmley, 1912 to 13 all designated New York City landmarks. The Italian Renaissance Revival Style Bronx Central Office, along with its twin in Brooklyn, was designed by Helmley in 1913 and construction completed in 1915. The T-shaped building is clad in light brick and topped by a deep terracotta cornice and hipped roof covered in Spanish tiles. Trabiated window openings along the front and side elevations have double architrave surrounds with bracketed lintels and the entrance is similarly treated and features a grill work transom. A broad stoop leads to the, a recessed loggia screened by an arcade resting on a balustrade. The building is identified by a non-historic painted sign above the door and to its side is a Bronx dedicatory plaque from the building's opening in 1923. The side facades of the L each feature a trio of large arched window openings set in an arcaded surround, and the rear facade has a single arched window with similar decorative treatment. The Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau Bronx Central Office is located within a tax lot that includes the large area of Bronx Park. The site on which the building is located is used to support important infrastructure to protect public safety and has changed over time. Surrounding the proposed landmark building are several small utilitarian structures, equipment, and the aerial tower, which have been installed within the last 20 years. The proposed landmark site consists of the footprint, including all its historic features, and the lawn in front extending to the property line. Renovated in the early 21st century with new windows in the style of the historic fenestration and a small addition at the rear, the Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau Bronx Central Office retains a high degree of integrity to its original design and is an excellent example of an Italian Renaissance pavilion adapted for civic use. It is proposed as an individual landmark for its architectural and historical significance to New York City. The research department recommends that the Landmarks Preservation Commission votes to de designate the Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau Bronx Central Office as an individual landmark. Thank you, Marianne. All right, commissioners, do we have questions on this item? All right, not seeing any questions. I'm just asking you all to unmute so we can begin a discussion. Um, and this is another you know, wonderful example of architecture within the fire department buildings, collection of buildings. Um, this building, the, the Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau of Bronx Central Office um, was designed by a notable Brooklyn architect, Frank J. Hemley, and built in 1915. And it is intact and a highly refined Renaissance revival style design. It has very prominent siding at the southern edge of Bronx Park. And, um, and this building is not just a civic building, but an important functional building. And I think, like the last item, its distinguished architecture really represents the pride and the important role and the importance placed on the fire department buildings uh, when they were instructed, constructed. Um, so this building uh, continues to play uh, an important role as part of FDNY's communication system. And even while it maintains these very critical functions, the uh, fire department has supported the designation. And again, I wanna thank the FDNY for their partnership in celebrating their important buildings. Um, any thoughts on this one? Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Goldblum. I, mean, I, I actually saw, I toured, um, this building, I don't know, six, eight months ago, uh, not just the outside. Um, and what struck me about it, I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous building. It really is. 
but it would be great if um, it were possible uh, to make it more accessible to the public apart from through a fence. Uh, it is part of a park, uh, and if if this, and I understand that its its use is highly technical and sophisticated and cannot be in any way jeopardized. But if there were a way to um, preserve that security while allowing the building to be somewhat more publicly accessible physically, I think it would be a a, a benefit to the neighborhood and to the city uh, for that to happen. Okay, thanks. Other thoughts or comments? Yes, Commissioner Chu, and followed by Commissioner Master and then Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner uh, Chu? Yeah, I just wanted to note about the architecture, the style itself, that I think it is particularly beautiful. I mean, this building and structure have such a nice uh, play of weight and solidity, but at the same time, um, depth and delicate quality from the entry uh, recess there, which is really, I think, um, Italian Renaissance revival, talking about Brunelleschi back 13th, 14th century, those were characteristics that his work were really strong, like the delicateness of the arcades um, and hospitals that he designed, and also the massiveness of the structure, I think, for a relatively small piece, this this facility, I think, architecturally in terms of its mass and delicate nature and shadow, I think are just wonderful. Great, thank you. Commissioner Master. Yes, I just wanted to weigh in and say that this, um, this building is uh, architecturally beautiful and I think historically significant, as we said um, with the previous uh, fire engine, um, I think it shows the historical significance of the changing technology um, with firefighting history, you know, in New York City and in the country. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is for this one and the other two items that we landmark today, um, I am so pleased that we are doing more representation in the outer boroughs. Coming from Staten Island, um, it's wonderful to see these individual landmark designations in the Bronx. Great, thank you so much. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, well, I agree with everyone's comments so far. And um, I think these uh, are a great part of New York history, these fire alarm <laughs> telegraph um, um, buildings that um, we have uh, We have one in Queens that I hope we'll get to designate, you know, soon. Anyway, which is in uh, Forest Park, which is a, a lovely, another different, very different architecture. But all of these buildings are, that I've seen anyway, are really quite interesting architecturally and of course, historically. So I'm very pleased that we're doing this today. Thank you very much. Any other thoughts? All right, so let's go ahead and um, make a motion on this one. Commissioner Chapin, would you make this motion? Uh, I actually don't ha seem to have, don't have any mo motion except the Opera House. I couldn't find it. I kept looking for them, but. Okay. All right, Commissioner Master, would you make this motion? Sure. I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate Fire Alarm Telegraph Bureau Bronx Central Office 1129 East 180th Street, Borough of the Bronx, as a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural char characteristics of the city, state, and nation as set forth in the designation report for LP 2668, dated June 13th, 2023. I also move that the Borough of Bronx tax map, Block 4333, Lot 1, in part be designated as the landmark, as its landmark site, as described in the designation report and illustrated in the attached map. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. 
Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that is our last latest New York City landmark. And again, I'm just delighted that we were able to um, designate these three items today that uh, really, I think, um, represent the work that we are doing that we've been committed to since um, for years now and then formally in our equity framework uh, to ensure diversity and inclusion in our designations. Um, all three of these sites, again, were identified as a part of a comprehensive borough-wide survey of the Bronx, um, but they also came out of thematic surveys that the research team is doing, um, both on Latino history and uh, fire department. We have thematic surveys for fire departments as well, and as I said, we've had a long uh, partnership with the FDNY. Um, and I think that these designations are a direct outcome of that survey effort. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to prioritize and advance designations in areas that are less well represented by New York, uh, by landmarks and that tell the full history of New York City. So thank you all for your partnership and thank you for your votes today on these items. All right, we'll now move to the Preservation Department agenda. All right, good morning, everybody. We're gonna to start today's Preservation Department agenda with uh, public meeting items. The first is public meeting item number one, LPC 23-06905. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1965, lot 34. One Cambridge place in the Clinton Hill Historic District. This is a transitional Italianate, neo grec style row house built in 1873 and altered by A.M. Headley in 1919. The application is to legalize reconstructing the parapet without LPC permits. Uh, this was read into the record at the public hearing of June 6, 2023. However, it was not presented at that time and no testimony was heard. Uh, we'll begin after we open the hearing. Sorry. Sorry, I was muted. And I've just asked all of you commissioners to unmute as well so that we can open the hearing before we start this item. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chu, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is open and the applicants may begin. Thank you. Commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Robin, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Robin, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Uh, I know that you're unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Maybe turn up your volume. Can you hear me now? Perfect, thank you okay. very much. Could you, could you state your name for the record? And sure, <laughs> no, no problem. Robin Fleming, RMF Bryan Architects, presenting for one Cambridge place for the legalization of an existing parapet over the two-story portion of a five-story five building with a two-story extension in the rear. The property is located on the corner of Cambridge Place and Green Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District. We originally applied for the addition of a railing at the two-story extension to provide a requisite height protective guard for a roof deck that we were installing during the course of construction. This is the existing elevation, the existing parapet. During the course of construction, we had encountered some structural issues with the parapet separating from the building, as well as significant leakage on the interior of the building. We were concerned with adding a railing to the roof that would incre potentially increase the leakage concerns 
in that we had to reconstruct portions, not the entirety of the existing parapet, but certain portions of the parapet, as well as brick pointing, we decided to extend the height of the parapet itself instead of adding the railing. This is the original condition on the Green Avenue facade of the existing parapet. This is the an elevation drawing showing the extension of the parapet. And this is the final result of the extension of the parapet. The parapet was raised approximately 20 inches. This is all existing parapet. This portion here is the new parapet. And close-up views of the extended parapet. Rear view of the original condition of the parapet. Elevation drawing of the rear parapet. This is the as-built condition of the parapet. This is a view on Green Avenue approaching from Grand Avenue of the existing original condition of the parapet here. And this is the as-built condition of the parapet. This is the existing condition of the existing parapet and the rebuilt condition of the parapet. Existing interior shots of the parapet. These views are the finished result of the parapet. Um, at this point, if the commissioners have any questions, we'll try to answer them. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I don't see any questions at this time. Oh, yes, Commissioner Chu, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just, I guess, just to understand. So there was an application to do work here, um, yep. and it was originally to put a rail. Correct. The wall, but instead you built up the exist up from the existing masonry wall. Correct. Doing a rail. Um, and you're saying that there were concern about adding waterproofing risks with the rail yes and dur during construction we also had significant water damage to the interior of the building because the existing parapet was separating from right. the building right the, the property is located on a bus route so there was heavy you know heavy vibrations and then as you know when you start renovating any an existing building that's over 100 years old we encountered a lot of leakage and were concerned about putting a railing that might, you know, might add to the leakage problems we were experiencing. Wasn't it considered to just mount the railing off the back of the brick wall and not onto the roof surface? Because that would not incur that kind of risk. Well, we were also concerned about the structural integ integrity of the parapet itself. We had to do a lot. It's a three width already deteriorating and separating. So we were concerned about adding anything additional to the parapet. Because even during the course of construction, we noticed that there was a lot of shifting of the building. So we were concerned about mounting anything to the railing and then the in in the initial approval the railing couldn't be right up against the parapet it had to be set back from the parapet six to twelve inches for visibility concerns i guess okay all right i guess that that's it it's really more of a technical uh, response then um, I, we don't have data to support that but structurally the wall if it had issues I would hope that that was addressed in the because that looks like you kept the existing masonry and then added on top of it if the existing fabric was having issues it probably would be a good idea to know what that was uh, because it would still be there now absolutely thanks yeah. Commissioner, Commissioner Lutfi. Thank you, Sarah. I just have a methodology question. So 
there was an application before us. Is that correct? Yeah, the commission approved uh, work here, including a railing at the top. And in lieu of the railing, they construct, they raised the parapet. Right. So my question to the applicant is, you already had come before the commission before and had gotten approval. So when you had a problem, I'm just wondering why you didn't come back and why you took matters into your own hands. That was an oversight on our part. We thought that we could get it approved as an out as built condition. And just to clarify, the railing that was approved was not mounted on the parapet. It was set back from the parapet to be on the roof. Just to clarify that point. Um, I did, Sarah, just one more question for you. Yeah. So do we do that? We, after the fact, just get approval as an as-built? Isn't that so what like happens? Like with any uh, work that has happened a, without a permit or in non-compliance of a permit, they have to come back and seek approval afterwards to cure the violation. And uh, if the work meets the rules, the staff can issue a permit after the fact to legalize it. If it doesn't meet the rules, it comes to the commission and we review it based on appropriateness. And so um, it's, it, I think I wouldn't think of our role as, you know, they did something in non-compliance with the permit and that I wouldn't, so I wouldn't base your decision on the fact that work happened here illegally. I would base your decisions on the merits of the work after the fact. Got it. Got, thank you for clar clarifying that for me. Okay, great. Thanks. Commissioner Jefferson. Okay. Uh, so the, the additional 21 inches of brick. Does it match the existing precisely? Is it precisely matching on the details where you cut out for the for the ladder? Is that detail? Well, uh, I didn't see a detail of that, but it, it looked a little bit not as nice as it could be. But the question for me is the the quality of the brick. Is it exactly matching what was there before? As close as we could get. I can't advance to show you the slides, but you there's port your, you can use your arrow keys or your mouse to go backwards. There you go. Oh, okay. Wanted to show you the Green Avenue side. I can't blow it up, but this is the existing. And this is the new. So we matched as pretty close as we could get in terms of the color, the size of the brick. What about what about the detail of the at the where the ladder is? Let's look at that. Can you blow that up? You have a uh, can you get closer to the top? I don't know how to blow it up. Okay. okay. Um, so that's that's the as built condition. So you can see, you can clearly see an edge, a line, separating right. existing masonry from the new masonry, correct? Slightly. Okay. If we go to I want to show you the existing where the ladder is. Okay. This is the original of where the ladder is. And this is the proposed. So you can see a slight demarcation. And this was stuccoed, so you so, can see. So, 
So the coping stone changes as it turns the corner. Is that happens too? Yes. So, so this is this ma time. this yeah this matches the existing in terms of the coping stone turning the corner. Then it changes into the terracotta camelback tiles, coping stones rather. And that so you, just to clarify the. Um, previous condition with the lower parapet had the, the terracotta coping. And so when yes. you raised it, you just matched what was previously. Right. Correct, correct. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Other questions? Okay, let's move to public testimony. We may have more questions after that. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Dr. Carol, Gregory might be having a technical problem. Okay. Um, Stephen, are you ready to jump in or do you want me to? Why don't I jump in? Yeah. Um, just I'll call the next person when Cambridge, please. Let me just call the person with their hand raised. Um, I'm gonna call CHG. Hey okay, CHG, please uh, state your name for the record and turn on your camera if you choose. You have three minutes. CHG, can you turn on your, oh, there we go. CHG, can you please state your name for the record? Oh, you're connecting. Just need to unmute yourself. You're muted. Okay, I'm gonna bring in uh, the next person while we see if we can get you connected to audio, Rosari uh, Sinisi. Okay, Rosaria Sinisi. You please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the oral testimony submitted by CRNP, that's the Citizens for Responsible Neighborhood Planning on Clinton Hill and Fort Greene, last week responded to applicants' filings of drawings dated May 26th. That version of the presentation was made to CB2's Land Use Committee, which disapproved it on April 19th and also included an application to quote unquote, legalize as built windows, as well as the, the heightened parapet for the property's extension. The applicant's as built heightening of the extension's parapet at one Cambridge place by one foot nine inches is detrimental to the historic design of this building and should be removed and replaced with the original height. It's unpermitted heightening of the extension's parapet creates a top heavy appearance on that section of the building, as well as having a clear demarcation line between the new and old brick. Um, the extension dates from 1919 is on a primary facade parallel to Green Avenue, fully visible from both sidewalks along Green. The addition of this brick adds to the fortress appearance of that wall, which actually began with the addition of an extra floor on the main building facing Cambridge prior to designation of the district. The designation of the Clinton Hill Historic District in 1981 was a large and time consuming community effort initiated by local residents concerned with the preservation of the district's historic character. This designation was the expression of community will and the voices of local groups concerned with preserving that character are heard to this day at CB2's land use committee meetings, as well as at LPC hearings. 
The protection of the Clinton Hill Historic District has contributed to the flourishing of this area and attracts younger generations to this day. All that work and care over decades of stewardship of the architectural legacy of the Clinton Hill Historic District should not be ignored by applicants who disregard approved drawings and LPC should not permit them to do so. We therefore recommend that LPC instruct the applicant to remove its wrong-headed quote unquote as built change to the highly visible Green Avenue facade of one Cambridge place and comply with the approved drawings. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Marie Lovell. So Marie Lovell, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Okay. And once you accept panelist, uh, if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, Maria Lavelle, are you with us? I'm here, but I'm not I'm not to speak. Oh, I saw that you raised your hand. Uh, no, you... the uh, machine went on by mistake. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So I will change you back to attendee now. And I'm not seeing any further hands raised. I did see that CHG uh, previously raised their hands. If you would like to speak, please do so now by raising your hand. Okay, I see Elijah Fox from Council Member OC's office has raised their hand. I have them signed up for a separate item. I will, okay. And I think they see now. So I do not see any further hands raised. So I will note for the record that uh, Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommends denial, citing concerns about sight lines, general appropriateness, and center of process. And we also received letters from Society for Clinton Hill and Fort Green Association. Okay, I actually see one more hand raised, Monica Thornhill. So Monica Thornhill, if you would like to speak on this, please accept being promoted to panelist. Okay. And I'm promoting you to panelists right now. If you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay. I'm trying to uh, start my video, but I'm, I don't quite know where to find the uh, start video. Okay. Well, um, I guess good afternoon, everybody. My sister was trying to get on to speak to represent us. Uh, however, she had been having difficulty. So I'd like to read the comments that she wanted to share uh, with, the, with the group. Um, and I'm just gonna read as if she was uh, sharing. Uh, she says, I'm a member of the Cambridge Hill group. Our family has owned number one Cambridge place since the mid 1950s. I personally have lived in this community for 62 years and still live on Cambridge Place. While my siblings are no longer living in New York, they're still connected to this community and we frequently uh, return, for this is our home where our roots began. Number one, Cambridge Place is our family home that we hold near and dear to our hearts. Our dad has met, had his medical practice on that ground floor of the, of the home and served the community as the neighborhood physician for over 30 years. Despite the challenges to maintaining a corner house, as children, we were taught the importance of preserving the aesthetics of our home and community. From sweeping the sidewalks to waking up at the crack of dawn to shovel the snow for the safety of pedestrians, we have always taken pride in being responsible for our home. I give you all these details as examples to make you aware that as a family, we know the work involved as well as the financial responsibility that goes into maintaining a home, especially a corner brownstone. 
As a family, we have worked hard to sustain the integrity of the Clinton Hill community, and that remains our priority. When we started this project, it was in December of 2018. The intention was to complete it in 18 months. However, it has, it has turned into five plus years due to COVID and various other hurdles. For example, supply shortages and delays, along with unplanned budget overages. I say this to say that we have made absolutely every effort to comply with Landmark's requests and requirements. At no point at this process were we looking to cut any corners or deviate from plans previously submitted to Landmark. Our goal has always been to complete the project with integrity. We are simply a small family business that values our home, our community, and the legacy that our family has dedicated over 70 years to. Thank you for the opportunity to present at this hearing, and we appreciate your consideration in this manner. And this is sincerely, sincerely the Cambridge Hill Group. And thanks for letting us uh, share. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Okay. And I do not see any further hands raised. And as previously mentioned, we did, oh, I see one more hand raised. So Suzette Hunt, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Okay, so Suzette Hunt, if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. First, I deeply appreciate the work of this commission. Thank you so much for making these hearings available. This is actually my first one, which is really exciting. So thank you so much. I just had a really quick question, actually, um, in just listening. And I think um, my question was piqued by a couple of the comments by members of the commission. Um, I just have a a concern, I guess. Respectfully, if a contractor or owner decides to, as someone put it here, take matters in their own hands and fix an issue, while, you know, I understand that issues come up, if a plan's already been submitted to landmarks and an entity decides to cure it without coming before landmarks, then is that not like a loophole that would permit certain things to go through, especially if you can't get members of the community to come and kind of testify um, in disagreement with it, which can be rather difficult given that so many people have so many things going on in their lives. I just wanna understand because as a person who lives here in Brooklyn, there are so many different projects that are going on and so many attempts to try to override or loop around the very um, specific rules and, and uh, requirements of landmarks. And I just wanna make sure I understand that this is not something that is, I don't know, allowable all the time, that it is fine for something to be submitted, approved, and then fixed without approval before landmarks, because that, that is troubling. I just wanna understand, and maybe I'm not understanding all the issues here, but I just wanna understand if that is in fact the case. Okay, thank well, you. We Thank you. Okay. Gregory, do you want to wrap up the testimony? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I do not see any further hands raised now. And as noted previously, uh, Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommends denial, citing concerns about sight lines, general appropriateness, and center of process. And we also received letters from Society for Clinton Hill and the Fort Greene Association. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carol. Thank you very much. And to just address that question, I want to start first by saying that um, the vast majority of our property owners file for permits in advance. We uh, process close to 14,000 applications and issue that many permits every year. Um, the number of uh, work violations for work that has happened without a permit is just a very small fraction of that. Um, however, it is something that we review and take very seriously. 
Um, when it comes to evaluating, as I said in the beginning, when it comes to evaluating work that has happened without a permit, we apply the same standards that we would have applied had the application come to us in the first instance. And so uh, raising, the, uh, raising the parapet, in, if this had been a proposal, would require review by the full commission at a public hearing with public participation. And um, it happened, uh, unforeseen events happened, uh, occurred and it happened uh, for whatever reason, and it is uh, has been built. And so the application is still before us is whether or not raising the parapet is appropriate. And we will apply the same standards that we would have applied had it come to us before the work occurred. So uh, again, th this is, the vast majority of our buildings do get permits and follow it. It's very frustrating when that doesn't happen. I would say that most of the time when applications have occurred, a uh, work has occurred without proper permits, um, we find that it is not intentional. There sometimes may be um, bad actors, but for the most part, it's usually because of unforeseen circumstances that they didn't reach back out to us, the contractor did something the owner didn't know, mistakes happen. So, uh, you know, many of these are not intentional. Nonetheless, we evaluate it according to our standards and we make a determination according to our standards, regardless of the circumstances or the fact that it's uh, happened after the fact. So I hope that explains that. And I would like to turn it back to the applicant um, to respond to other comments we've heard about the appropriateness of raising this parapet. So um, if you're here, I'd like to give you that opportunity to respond to comments. Um, are there specific, a specific comment that you would well, like me to respond to? I don't I don't recall exactly everything that okay. was said. Sorry. The earlier comments. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So th that were that uh that this uh changed the there were comments that it changed the proportion of the facade. Um I think that there I, I can't recall, but there may have been comments again about the material and the material, the relationship of materials on this facade. And I think um you know, I think in your response, you might want to go back to the pre-existing condition of the front facade and respond to how, and I would, if you have a photo, and then talk about how the change in the parapet, um, it, did that detract from the architectural quality of the facade? Did it, did it detract, remove any architectural features? Those are the things that you think you want to talk about. So, Maybe if you start with the pre, a photo of the pre-existing condition and a photo of the new condition, and you can respond to how it changed, it did or didn't change the style or architectural features. Right. The This is the existing or a pre-work original facade. And this is what was built. We made every effort to replicate exactly the details of the coping stones, the brick patterns, match the brick as closely as we could. Um, the proportions, yes, are changed, but I think that that is subjective in terms of whether it's egregious. It wasn't you know, a six foot wall that was built, it was 21 inches. Um, yes, it's clearly visible because there's no obstructions in either direction. So you can definitely see it. But I don't personally think that it impacts the integrity of the facade in terms of aesthetics to an egregious extent. Okay, can you go back to the pre-existing photo for a minute? So this is a building that um, may have had a, a cornice at one time and maybe was altered in the early 20th century uh, to have this band course and then a brick parapet. And that parapet, um, in terms of its relationship to the adjacent building, that parapet uh, came up to just below, it looks like the meeting rail of the second floor window on the adjacent building. Uh, it's been increased 21 inches. 
um, with new brick, not using the exist the pre-existing brick. And right. now it looks like it just aligns with the meeting rail. So it, in terms of its um, proportional relationship to the building on the corner, it, uh, it, it, it's not that much taller, um, mm. but the, you know, there's the, the 21 inches within the, but mind That's, you, this is, this is one building. Yeah. Right. It's okay. An, it's an rear extension to correct. Correct. The corner building. Okay. So it may have always been simple at the top. We don't know that history, right? Um, well, if we go to the, I don't think there was ever a cornice here okay. looking at the 1940s tax photo. So in the 1940s, it had yeah. a plain brick parapet above a band. Correct. Okay. And this is, this is a, a good comparison because we have sort of an uh, apples to apples between the historic view of the historic photograph in 1940 and the current photograph and how it relates to the main building on the corner to which it's added. Okay, commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, I'm asking you, gonna ask you all to unmute so that we can close the hearing and begin our discussion, all right. Um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, so this again is a rear extension to the corner <laughs> building as early as the earliest photograph we have is the 1940 tax photo where the condition looked similar um, and the applicant uh, has raised the parapet 21 inches, rebuilt the parapet in new brick uh, and at a height that is 21 inches taller. And so the question before us is um, in terms of the architectural style of the rear extension or the a building and its rear extension, did this change in height detract from the architectural character, uh, the details, or the streetscape as well? And um, we'll, we'll discuss materiality as well as proportions as was uh, mentioned in the discussion and the testimony. All right, so Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Yeah, sure, thank you, sir. Um, so I don't, I don't think I actually would have approved this as the most desirable alternative when it came before, if it had come before us. Uh, but I'm going to look at it as is this <clears throat> something that could be found appropriate, which is what we do, rather than saying is it the most appropriate, the most suitable. And I don't think that the uh, it, it, given that this building. You know, it's a nice little building, but it is not particularly distinguished. Um, so I, I don't think that raising the parapet slightly is, uh, makes it, you know, gives it an in, inappropriate proportion. We'll see what other members of the panel, the architects think about that. But I think I could approve it. I do also just want to say, as you know, has been reflected by others, commissioners' comments. Please call the commission, email the commission. If you have someone you've worked with on the commission, you should be able to get a hold of them, and just ask them: Is can you do something, and it's going to be approved? Because you're letting yourself in for additional presentation expense, hiring somebody to make a presentation. That really, and you know, going through a whole process with the community board, it's really not to your benefit to proceed and just assume that something's going to be approved when it'll have to come back to the commission. And maybe it won't have to, but then the person will on the staff will deal with it for you. So I just want to urge everybody. Uh, and of course, the unfortunately, those pe people may not be listening in, but you know. Once again, please come to us. And anyway, I, I think 
in this case that I can uh, find this is not, is not such an egregious change that I cannot see it as appropriate. Great, thank you very much. And I think you've made two excellent points. And one is that all owners you know things do happen in the field sometimes. And uh, we do say in our permits that should conditions change in the field, you should stop work and reach out to us immediately. It's always better to be safe than sorry. And you know, to the extent that we uh, can't approve something, it, you will have made a, a potentially costly error. So it's always best to call and find out what the steps are, should there be a change in the field conditions or the circumstances. And uh, your second point, Diana, I think is a good one that, um, you know, that there is no standard or requirement that we find something to be the most appropriate. Appropriateness is a broad term and many there are many different things that can be found appropriate within that lens. And again, I think our discussion is, did it remove any significant features? Did it change the stylistic character of the mm. building? Did it change its relationship to the corner building to which it's an addition? Or does it detract from the streetscape? So those are the things that we'll all uh, talk about. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jefferson. I think I think proportions make a difference. One, B, A, and B, I think the solution that was given by LPC was the correct one and it made sense. So therefore, and, and C, I can understand the community to, to kind of keep some kind of rule-based option so that we can have some way of making decisions. So I cannot support this. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, the previous application uh, was for a roof deck and the railing. And the we didn't, I think, direct them to do that. They came to us and they proposed it and we found that it met our rules and that's why it was eligible staff level permit. Uh, raising the parapet didn't meet the rules uh, because it's a change to the facade and that's why it's coming to us. So I don't, you know, the prior approval doesn't necessarily need to dictate our thoughts today. Um, okay, Commissioner uh, Goldblum. Um, in this case, I agree with Diana. Uh, I think that had this building had a more a designed facade uh, or was more frontal in its nature, seen like intentional in its design, I would have felt that the proportions were more integral or kind of contributing to the significance of this uh, particular structure. Uh, in this case, looking at the looking at the facade, looking at its position, I think that uh, the modest change in the proportions is uh, is appropriate to me. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Master? Um, I understand Commissioner Jefferson's concerns. Um, however, I think that when I look at the building, um, it doesn't bother me that much. Um, knowing the history, that's a little bit more troublesome. But, um, you know, overall, I think I can find this appropriate. All right, thank you very much. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, Diana and Commissioner Goldblum and, and uh, Commissioner Master all said it correctly. I, I think that, yes, uh, the applicant should uh, uh, come to the commission first, but looking overall architecturally at the proportion, uh, you know, uh, you, you could have had the original one or this one, and, and I think proportionally, uh, this is uh, could be deemed appropriate. Thank you very much, Commissioner Latfi. So, when a a community comes to us about designation and preservation in their community, um, it's wonderful, and it's. It makes me feel sad in a way that this has happened. I'm sad about for that reason, because this community is so uh, engaged in um, 
maintaining the architectural landscape of their of their neighborhood. And and I'm also disappointed, as uh, Diana said, that you know the the applicant just didn't reach out to us. We, we're like not the big bad wolf. <laughs> so uh, having actually been before the commission myself, not before, but work with, working with staff on things, I, um, you know, I, I, I find us, are the staff very reasonable and easy to work with. So, so I, I'm, I feel badly about that. However, I do happen to also agree with the the other side of the coin that Diana so eloquently laid out and for the reasons that she laid out that this building is not that significant. Um, the changes are not um, substantial and I don't think it's going to have a, uh, a negative impact on uh, the landscape. So I can you know, approve this with reservations. <laughs> okay, thank you. Commissioner Chu. Um, yes, I think all the input has been, uh, uh, in. I agree with all the input my fellow commissioners have, have, have made. And um, I would tag on to what Commissioner Lupty just said. And I would say it is appropriate, um, not my preferred option, but because of the secondary nature of this piece of the building from the corner, which is really the significant taller element here, um, I would say, yes, it is appropriate. Okay, all right, thank you. So I think we uh, have enough to make a motion on this item, but again, before we do, I just wanna reiterate that it is very frustrating for everybody uh, here at the commission when work happens without a permit. And again, it can be a very, costly error, we may not always be able to find that work to be appropriate. And so owners uh, should absolutely keep in touch with their preservationists, especially if they have already received a permit and have a relationship with us. We work hard to uh, establish those relationships with uh, applicants and property owners, and we are there to assist should anything change in the field. So we'll go ahead and make a motion. Commissioner Chapin, would you make that motion? Yes, sir. Thank you. And the certificate, uh, the matter of a certificate of appropriateness for Brooklyn LPC 2306905, 1 Cambridge Place, Clinton Hill Historic District, a transitional Italian eight now Greco style row house built in 1873 and altered by A.M. Headley in 1919. Application is to legalize reconstructing the parapet without Landmarks Preservation Commission permits. <clears throat> I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Clinton Hill Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the re reconstruction of the parapet at a taller height did not eliminate any significant architectural features that the alteration is located only at the simply designed facade of the rear building fronting um, of the rear building fronting Green, Green Avenue and does not impact or detract from the primary corner building it abuts. And that the uh, reconstructed parapet uh, recalls the step profile, brick masonry and st cast stone coping of the historic parapet. Therefore, then that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Yay. Commissioner Letfi. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. Um, with um, seven in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. All right. So that's approved and we'll move to the next item. It's okay for me to sign out? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. 
But the next item is public meeting item number two, LPC 23-03194, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1838, lot 9, 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District. Uh, this site is currently a parking area and the application is to construct a new building. Uh, this was read into the record at the, on the public hearing of June 6, 2023. It was not presented at, at that time and no uh, public testimony was heard. Uh, we will begin after we open the hearing. All right. And so, commissioners, I'm going to ask you all to unmute so we can open the hearing. Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, Any opposed? All right, the hearing is open and the applicants may begin. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Jackie, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may be. Thank you, Abby. Uh, hello, commissioners and agency staff. Thank you for hearing this application today. My name is Jackie Pudu Vallon. I'm the preservation consultant on this project. I'm here today with the architect, Ana Maria Torres of AT Architects. This project is 162 Hancock Street, a proposal for a new building in the Bedford Historic District. You see it here in elevation where I'm circling. This new building is proposed for a lot on the south side of Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy Avenues, but closer to Nostrand, as shown on this district map. Here are some photos of existing conditions. On the top right, you see the empty lot in context with the streetscape. There are actually two lots, two individual tax lots within this empty lot. Lot nine is where the work is proposed, which you see highlighted here with the, the red dotted line. Going left to right on the bottom, is the view of the lots uh, of the lots as one is standing in front of the area on the sidewalk. Um, the middle view is looking south into the lots. And on the right is the view looking north from the rear of the lots. As these historic maps of the block show, it, it, this has always been an, an empty lot. It's part of the former garden of 168 Hancock Street, a house, a house next door which I'll show you in more detail as we go on. In the upper left corner is the 1887 Sanborn map, which shows this lot remaining as the first houses were being built on this block. The 1908 and 1936 maps show the empty lot remaining as the rest of the block was built out. And the bottom right is the most recent Sanborn, Sanborn map from 2007. Here are some historic photos for context. On the far left is the photo of 168 Hancock Street in the 1940s. Again, this is the, the house which uh, these lots were um, part of um, and were used as a garden for this house. Um, then the same house is shown in the 1980s tax photo followed by the lot itself in the 1980s. And on the far right is 160 Hancock Street in the 1940s, which also shows a portion of this lot. As the old maps show us, this district is largely characterized by row houses built in the late 19th century. These are these were uh, designed in the ornamental revival styles that were popular at the time, such as Italianate, Neo-Grec, Queen Anne, Romanesque Revival, and Renaissance Revival. Some of these styles are illustrated here in photos of houses on Hancock Street in the 1940s and which still stand today. The three photos on the left are the Queen Anne style row houses at 250, 246, and 242 Hancock, which are part of the same row built in 1886. At 224 Hancock Street is a Romanesque revival style house built in 1889. And finally on the far right is 150 Hancock. I wonder if I can zoom in on this a bit. Uh, so one, uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, yes, yeah, so 150 Hancock, this is a, a Queen Anne style row house built in 1886, which is part of a row that are to the west of 162 Hancock Street. Uh, 150 Hancock is the mirror image of 160 Hancock, the house neighboring the lot, the lot where 162 will be built. You'll note it, this, this house, um, which I'm highlighting here, um, has an asymmetrical fa facade 
with a shallow projecting rectangular bay, which at the parlor floor is articulated in rusticated brownstone that returns and has a decorated parapet as a crowning element at the top of its facade. It also features red brick at its upper stories. All right, now let me try to zoom out again. Let me go back to normal view. Oops, went too far. And here's a survey map showing the lot and its relationship to the neighboring empty lot and the house at number 168. So here's lot nine. This is uh, an existing um, tax lot that remains between it and the house that was originally using this area as a, as a garden. So I'm trying to advance, bear with me. Okay, oops, I'm sorry. And with that, I would like to introduce the architect, Ana Maria Torres of AT Architects, to present her design. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Torres, and I am the uh, architect of Records for the Project, and also I am the principal of AT Architects. Uh, thank you all for your time today, and thank you, Jackie, for the introduction and putting the site into a historical context. Can you please, please put uh, the previous slide of the survey? Thank you so much. Uh, the lot nine as, um, is now 162 Hancock Street and is one of the individual lots, as Jackie pointed out, of the uh, original property of 168 uh, Hancock. Uh, the lot is 24 feet by 100 and is adjacent to 160 Hancock. The lot is part of a very well preserved block within the core historical district and the architectural style, as uh, Jackie mentioned, of some of the existing buildings is the block range from Neo Greek, uh, like for example, 168 Hancock. Then it was designed by M.G. Morrill in 1881 with a later addition in 1890 of a mansard roof floor. And then you have the three, the Queen Anna, then is the buildings next uh, towards 160 uh, Hancock. It's very compelling uh, for me to have this opportunity to work with the vanguard of urban development of 150 years ago, which interestingly were built by real estate developers. Uh, Rock houses uh, flesh out, as you all know, the street uh, grid uh, form uh, into buildings. Next, please. This uh, uh, building that we are proposing here today, the design is uh, then uh, is uh, one to carry and is carrying the existing uniform distance from the street to the building uh, to form a continuous plane with the adjacent uh, neighboring building. The bay window and the facade uh, of this proposed building are aligned with the bay window and the facade of the adjoining building. Next, please. <clears throat> In this slide, uh, you can, um, it's just kind of an analysis of the south and north uh, uh, side of this uh, particular block. Um, this uh, uh, particular block is very well preserved. And in here is just an analysis of the massive, but also of the heights. Uh, in the side, south side, where is 162 uh, Hancock is placed, uh, you can see in the diagram, then the average building height in the block is 40 feet, uh, with a uh, hazard control height, uh, you know, changes in height, uh, like the 168, uh, then it's 54, and all these heights are related to the roof line, uh, to the roof height, and not to the ball heads or parapets or anything like this. Uh, 200 Hancock uh, with a building height of 48 feet, and then in the corner, then is the higher one of 62. Next. This is a more simplified view of the, of the scheme than we saw before, just with the lining out all the heights of the buildings and in the high in the average height of the north on the north side varies between 40 feet and um, 50 feet. Next please. 
In the next three pages, it's the same analysis just to see the facades in a li little bit a larger scale for reference. Next, please. Next. Next. <clears throat> and here you have a view of the rear facing going facing north. You can see in the openings where is lot nine. Uh, next to 160, what is now 162 Hong Kong, the lot 10, then is the next uh, empty lot, and then you have 168. And this is the view of the rear facade where it's accessible to take pictures from the ground. Next. In the next two pages, is uh, based on to show the um, how the building is seen from the street, from the different angles of the street. In this uh, particular one, is the front view, uh, is a, a view from the cross the street with a height, with an average height of six feet, uh, a person of a size, uh, sorry, six feet high. And in the right of the, the drawing, you can see there is a, a hatching area. Then it's indicated what is actually visible and what is not visible from the street level. Next. In this one is the view uh, going west, uh, walking west, west uh, from Marcy Avenue to Northern Avenue. And these two points of view. One, if you are walking, on the street, on the sidewalk, uh, parallel to um, 162, and when you are walking across the street on the north side of the street, then in the north side, you have a more disadvantage or you have more overall view, then see the, the penthouse and the ball head of the building because the lot, the pen that is next to it is not, is an empty lot. Next, these are the large, if they are renders than you saw previously in the slide before, but a larger format and also in here, you can um, see that the intent of the proposed building is uh, this for the stoop and the doorway. Uh, they are following the characteristics of existing line up in length and materiality. Also, you can appreciate uh, the knee walls then you saw then as shown on the render on the bottom. This actually they are the existing new walls that are now in the side, and they are defining these kind of gardens in front of the align with all the new walls that are in the in the in this uh, side. Next, this is just the same view across the street. Next. This is the roof, uh, the roof uh, plans, and also they are indicated for uh, to establish the relationship of the footprint of the proposed building versus the footprint of 160 Hanko and 168 Hanko. Uh, the proposed uh, building is aligned, as you can see, with the uh, facade and the bay windows, and um, in it's also in between the existing massive, the 160 uh, Hancock, it has an extension in one of the sides, and 168 Hancock is a much larger building in, in the block. Next. The next uh, following pages are all the 2D architectural drawings for the front, the rear, and side facades, and they are followed by longitudinal sections. This is the front facade, as uh, Jackie was showing it before. Next. The rear facade. Uh, the rear facade, uh, if you see the levels of the buildings, they are at the same height. We will review it later on the render. And then you have the rear facade of 168 Street. Next. The side facade, which is proposed because it's uh, visible uh, now since uh, the lot next door is uh, is not built, it will be continued with the brick treatment of the front facade. Next. 
This is the longitudinal uh, section. Then is uh, the just exactly where 160 um, uh, Hancock is. It so will be kind of the 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 adjacent uh, property line. And the uh, the structural approach for building this building is to don't disturb the existing building and is being created a completely separate. A kind of a structural box between the foundation, the two wall, the two walls, and the slab, and also with a, a foundation ledge like you have in the in the details on the right hand page to avoid any dis disturbance or any possible um, intervention with 160 Hancock um, Street build, existing building. Next. This is towards the other side. Next. <clears throat> uh, this design uh, uh, proposed utilize uh, the same material traditionally used in brown stones. Uh, the materials used were in, in brick houses with a six inch of brown stone facing. And um, the rear and the side facades were also in brick. Uh, this building proposed uh, the same uh, uh, materials and the same materiality uh, of brown stone and brick. Next. To the, this lot is 24 feet uh, wide, which is wider than some of the fronts in the block. And uh, to break uh, the mass uh, and also to follow the the um, kind of layout of the neighbor building, we are proposing a continuous vertical bay window. It then has the same depth as actually as the neighboring building, then is 14.5 inches. The treatment of the bay window as happens in the in the different buildings uh, then they are existing right now, changes from the first floor to the upper floors. The first floor is framed by using the honest stone as an accent, and the rigidity of the corners in this lower level is uh, of the rectangular angles are softened by curving the corners at that level, and can you appreciate that in the render? Next. And sorry, yes, sorry, do you mind to go back? Uh, sorry, Jackie, to the previous, and you can see the same kind of examples of continuity with the vertical volume in here in the picture that we have from 150, 56 Hancock Street, 150 Hancock and 210 Hancock Street as some of the uh, buildings when they are in the neighborhood and in the block. Next. All the windows in this proposed building are individual and they are also the same size and proportion. They are in frame with a brown stone molding it has to create an accent and contrasting with the brick of the facade. They are, we are proposing to have transom on the top, maintaining the treatment of the existing buildings. Like, for example, you have 150, then we saw before, um, 159. In, uh, then um, they are, you know, kind of proposing a modern interpretation of the, of the ending. Uh, of the kind of parapet of, of the building, following samples like the 959, where they are flat and it's a treatment. Um, they have a different treatment than a projecting cornice. Next. <clears throat> this is the view of the rear facade. And uh, as we say before, the brick will continue from the front facade to the side facade and wrapping around on the uh, on the rear facade. They are a larger windows uh, just to have a much, uh, you know, more, uh, more connection with the outdoor space. And we are creating a small trellises, it's no balcony, it's a small trellises to emphasize the connection with the outdoor space. Just to be specific, the roof height of 160 and 162 are at the same level of 40 feet. The difference, the difference is in the treatment. Uh, the, the treatment of 160 has a railing, and we just create a parapet that is 42 uh, inches of, of, of height. 
And yes, we are doing a penthouse. The knees allowed by zoning. Uh, the knees uh, set back from the front uh, facade, uh, 15 feet, and also set back from the rear is more or less in the deep in the middle of the footprint of the proposed building. And the height of the roof at the penthouse is 49 feet. The wall head is a 57, which has an inkling a plane that you will not see it from the when you are across the street in um in the north side of the building and um just to put in the perspective for example the wall head of 168 is a 64 feet high next next Okay, thank you, Jackie. <laughs> this is a viewpoint from going walking from Nastrom to Marcy. Um, we didn't have in the visibility a study this point of view because actually the whole block is built. Then you will not see, um, you will not have the same kind of uh, view than you will see it when you are coming in west, uh, coming to, towards Nastrom. Then uh, in here you can uh, it's possible to appreciate the the intent of the build the proposed building is the string force of the neighboring facade. We are reflecting that in a in a more modern interpretation as a continuous uh, horizontal band. In that way, we maintain the threefold division of the existing facade of the building. Then it's located to the right side of 162. Then we are consist we are how we are doing it or is one first string force between first and second floor, second between um second and uh, uh second and third, and um then the last one is between the third and the parapet. Next. As I mentioned before, uh, the design utilizes the same materials than traditional uh, were used in brown stones uh, or in row houses. There was brick and uh, a brown stone facing, uh, and brick for the rear and the side facade. That is the that is the uh, the proposed uh, materiality for this building. And if you can see in the picture of the brick. Then you can see then the uh, joints and the grout is visible, but that is not intent. The grout will be the intent to have in the same tone or very close tone with the brick. Then it will be a kind of monochrome uh, facade between the brick and the grout. And the brick size that we are proposed is eight inches long by 3.6 uh, broad by 2.5 inches uh, thick. Next. Uh, we are proposing a black uh, painting steel railings. Uh, we are proposing brick moldings around and frame individual windows. Next. Uh, we are also proposing a stringed uh, force, uh, then it's kind of a modern interpretation and uh, tribute to these houses. Next. And um, it's kind of Yes, uh, everything has a bit of a modern tone to it, but we are trying to give a tribute to remind us that even in the most uh, impermanent of the cities like New York, no all is transitory. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Master, please go ahead. Yes, I had a question about the rear of the building. Um, does the rear of the building line up with the other houses adjacent to it, or does it jut out a little bit more? Uh, sorry, you are talking in height or in or in the, the depth or in, uh, on in on in uh, the profound the the length the the, the depth. Okay, the depth actually. Yes and no, sorry. <laughs> it's not a clear cut. Uh, if you can put the roof line, uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie, in the 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 page, I will tell you the, the roof plan. 
the page is, um, sorry, is 13, page 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bit more. Oh. Mm, no, sorry. I have it as a page 13, but it's next, keep going. No, you need to go uh, further, uh, further. Uh, go to 15, no, don't go backwards, go the okay. opposite. Oh no, actually go backwards. Ah, so confusing, I have a different presentation. Keep going now, 16, 17, 18. Sorry for the time, yeah. Oh, there um, is. is you, ah, sorry. sorry, as you see, uh, our width in the longest part is for, our, our building is also not straight on the back. It's uh, 40 feet six, but the the 160 has one extension then goes longer and we are kind of in between in that particular portion then we are within the footprint of 160 but in a different manner is Great. that clear is that yes. clear the answer yes. and can the i team? just ask what what is that uh piece of the rear yard that's surrounded by the fence is that just Oh, is this is garden. That part oh. is garden. It's just then because it's creating a cellar. Then it has kind of a, call it entertainment room, you know. Then instead of creating an English uh, kind of just a, a straight uh, concrete wall as a retaining wall for the garden, we are stepping it up and then having like a access, then you will have like a platform, you have a garden and you're stepping up and you have a side step that goes to the uh, back of the garden. If you can see, uh, Jackie, if you don't mind to put uh, the section, one of the transversal section, then is the last one. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. You see, we have at the cellar level, is a, a like a you know flat level and then you have a step in garden with a stair then going to the regular level of the garden in the rear then it's garden is not anything built thank you you okay other questions right i don't see any other questions at this time so we'll take to uh, we'll move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. As always, we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance and then get to everyone else. And whether or not you signed up in advance, please raise your hand so that we, as we work through the sign up list, we can also identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Collin to take us through the testimony. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Carroll. We received a large number of signups for this item, so we will be hearing from those people first. The first member we'll be hearing from is Council Member Chi Osi's office. So I will be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm New York City Council Member Chi Ose. I represent Bed Stuy and parts of North Crown Heights. I'm speaking on the yard space at 162 and 164 Hancock Street. Uh, as a resident of Bedford Stuyvesant myself, I'm passionate about preserving the cultural and historic integrity of the neighborhood. Uh, respecting the architecture of the neighborhood, especially in landmark districts, is paramount to preserving the neighborhood's unique character. It is my hope that you would strongly consider the request of this long-standing community of residents that has cared for and preserved the neighborhood over many decades. Let this be an opportunity for a win-win, adding much-needed housing to a neighborhood that needs it while preserving its historic character and unique charm. Uh, I feel like we've seen so many buildings go up in our neighborhood, and yes, housing is good. Uh, however, when the buildings do not fit the character of the beautiful bed in which we all live, uh, it presents uh, further obstacles, um, I believe, for future developments within the city and within our, our district as a whole. So um, there's my testimony. Please consider uh, our requests. And I'm happy that a lot of my constituents are, are also testifying after me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Okay. Next up, we'll be hearing from Evelyn Collier from Brooklyn Community Board 3. So Evelyn, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. 
And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Unmute. Good morning. Um, Carol Chow, um, Commissioner Chow, uh, Carol and the commissioners. My name is Evelyn Collier, uh, Chair of the Landmark and Preservation Committee, has been selected to read the resolution for Community Board 3. Uh, I'm reading in reference to LPC application docket number 23 03194, 162 Hancock Street, and the Bedford Historic District. Um, block 1838, lot nine. Uh, the proposed project was presented for a review hearing at a regular schedule CB3 Landmark Preservation Committee on Monday, uh, March 13, 2023 by WebEx. Uh, it was presented by Jacqueline Per Duvalian and who's the preservationist and the project architect, Adam Maria Torres. Uh, the committee observation, a new building at 162 Hancock Street is presented to the context of a second, much larger new building proposed as an adjacent lot number 10, now known as 164 Hancock Street. 164 Hancock Street is rendered, but the but it appropriateness is not part of the application. Both parcel 162 and 164 once comprised the ground of a 30-foot wide mansion, scaled brownstone with two unique west-facing bays at 168 Hancock Street. The building was built in 1881 by MJ. Morell, who was known for V-shaped bays and distinguished his design from others. In September 21, the applicant purchased 168 Hancock Street with his grounds, lot nine and 10, as an RB6 development site. Soon after, the park-like side yard was almost stripped of its historic trees and was no longer a community-friendly gathering place as it had been for decades. The full garden, sorry. The full garden hosts many events, parties, weddings, and daily neighborhood activities and early his, history driveway for one of the district's first automobile um, will wound carefully around the garden trees toward the back of the 136 foot deep setting to an original garage. This was no parking lot. I'm trying to get my thing to advance here, sorry. I'm not advancing. Oh, it's two. Stuck and I'm not going forth. <laughs> mm, this is weird. Okay, finally, sorry. Committee comments um, related to the proposed new bill on 162 Hancock Street. The committee contend the following. The brownstone corners are not historically correct. Cornice is a typically wood or pressed metal, occasionally molded fiberglass. An extent examination of the cornice type on Queen Anne building on the block is recommended. There should be no bulkhead or minimal bulkhead to be fully invisible from the front and the rear. There should be no roof deck with visible railing. There should be no trellises or balconies at the third or fourth level. There should be no sliding door on the rear of the building. There are excessive windows to doors other nearby properties have bays windows to give continuous sun exposure throughout the day. The proposed window configuration only allows for midday sun exposure. Windows on the ground floor have too much glass and not enough measurement between the windows. The approach looks more like a commercial loft building. Brownstone is omitted at the base of the building. The stoop is too steep. The stoop needs a landing at the top and bottom. Landing on the block average at least two feet. Additionally, the stoop appears too narrow for the building's width. Stoops on the block are typically one third of the width of the building. The wrought iron work Eve is too- Evelyn, I'm so sorry. If you could please uh, wrap up your statement. Uh, you're above three minutes. All right, let me read the details here. Uh, the railings on both proposed new buildings need to be matched, need to match to related. The knee wall need to be retained. It is built in 1880. The massive massing at the upper level makes the building too heavy. Identify and current zoning issues and impact on both proposed New building design, 168 Hancock Street. Um, the proposed building will significantly impact the district form and is not aligned with the historic character of the district. 
Community Board 3 voted not to support the project. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from, I do not see Rona Morissette, so we'll be moving forward with uh, Claudette Brady. So Claudette Brady, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Okay. So Claudette Brady, I've promoted you a panelist and if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, all right, thank you. Good morning, Chair Carroll and commissioners. My name is Claudette Brady. I am a community activist involved in the designation of the Bedford Historic District and the Stuyvesant Heights Expanded District. In 2008, in the garden that was once on lot nine, the Hancock Street Block Association started the initiative to landmark the Bedford Historic District because we wanted to protect the unique sense of place that is the block and is Bedford Stuyvesant. Sense of place in a broad sense is the relationship we have with each other as individuals in the human collective, the relationship we have within the built environment to each other and or, or lived experience within that environment. On, in architectural terms, sense of place is a historic district that is a, exemplifies a unique architectural character or architectural influence. On Hancock Street, the human sense of place was created by the first African-American woman to live on the block. This woman hosted Sunday dinners for, to welcome African-Americans to the neighborhood and started the whole, the Hancock Street Block Association. Nancy Chase and her husband, Arthur Chase, continued that human place making by opening their yard to the neighbors on Hancock Street and neighbors throughout Bedford Stuyvesant and Brooklyn. As a collective, we oppose the new construction because we feel that it does not enhance the current built environment and disrupts the cadence and the rhythm of the sense of place. While the architect has um, matched the plane of the existing infrastructure, the buildings, windows, doors, and other architectural elements do not align with the adjacent Queen Anne buildings and disrupts the rhythm of our block. We would like to see the architect go back and return with a more inspired interpretation of 160 through 150 Hancock Street. Additionally, when we saw this proposal, it was shown along with 164 Hancock Street. We request that the LPC reserve all judgment on this building until we can see the full impact of not just 162, but 162 and 164 Hancock Street on the built environment on Hancock Street and its sense of place. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up we have Omar Walker. I see that you're in a meeting, but you do not have your hand raised. If you could please raise your hand. Okay, I see you now. So I am promoting you to panelist right now. If you could please accept. Okay. Okay, Omar Walker, you are now a panelist. If you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, my name is Omar Walker and I will just read my statement. I'm a community member, but also a resident along the two or leader of the 200 Jefferson Block Association, uh, which is adjacent to this block. Dear Landmarks Preservation Commissioners, I'm an architect, professor of architecture and neighbor writing to express my concerns about the proposed construction of two of townhomes at 162, 164 Hancock Street. This location has historical significance as part of the grounds of 168 Hancock Street, 
a prominent brownstone mansion designed in 1881 by Marshall J. Morrell, or Jeremiah Johnson, a well-known real estate auctioneer related to the influential uh, Dutch families of New York, uh, such as the Remsons and the Vanderbilt's. Uh, the property includes a five-story addition inside bay uh, done by renowned architect Montrose Morris, making it the first brownstone mansion on the block and a significant structure. It features a decorative fenced carriage run that starts at 192 Hancock Street, extending behind all the homes leading up to the grounds of 168 Hancock Street, uh, proposed at light lots 9 and 10. These void spaces are integral to the historic district and should not be separated from the mansion's historical value. Designing within a historic district is a privilege, not a right. The developer who acquired 162 um, to 168 Hancock Street was aware of its landmark status. Therefore, all proposals for this site should enhance the district's character rather than detract from it. However, the current design for the new building lacks contextual awareness, properly proportioned fenestration, proper scale, and modulation of the facade. A rear cornice, stone door and framement is missing. Um, it looks like they've discontinued parts of the brownstone that they've done at the second parlor floor. Um, and we're seeing brick for some reason, um, which is not typical of the adjacent row of 150 to 160 Hancock Street designed by John Prague. Uh, to improve the proposed design, we recommend constructing twin 24-foot wide historically contextual townhouses, which is not unusual to this block. This block has precedent for wider buildings that are 24 feet, um, which have well-proportioned uh, parlor stairs. Um, we propose an integral bulkhead and penthouse that blend seamlessly with the project's design. Additionally, Lot 10 should be a five-story structure with a wraparound side yard consistent with in-cap buildings on the street. The overall facade design should precisely match the adjoining buildings at 150 to 160 Hancock Street, and the stoop should be conjoined and integrated into the cheek wall, similar to Prague's design at 112 uh, West uh, 112 and 114 West 18, uh, West 87th Street. This is actually a photograph showing that, um, which you can all see here. I'm happy to also share my screen as well um, and show you guys that photograph. But the historic photograph shows a proper integration, which would allow for ADA access. The proposed exterior cellar entrance. Omar, I'm terribly sorry. If I could please. Not a problem. I'll wrap up. Yes. The proposed Thank exterior you. cellar entrance and railing at the front of the building is highly inappropriate. I've never in my life seen anyone propose a stair going down to the cellar at the front of this building. It would break the street plane, uh, which is typical to this block. All proposed materials should closely conform to the historical context, particularly the brick, which is a red smooth face brick. Uh, the current proposed brick is not an appropriate material. In conclusion, the proposed is not yet a resolved design that meets the caliber of this historic row and requires more research. Um, we ask that you reject this proposal today and any future schemes come before this um, committee. Again, for review, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Rona Morissette Barrett from the Hancock Street Block Association. Hold on, let me get something. Rona, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Okay, and if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the state your yes. name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Carroll and fellow commissioners. Let me just make sure, yes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Rona Marset Barrett and I am the president of the Hancock Street Block Association too. I've lived in Bed-Stuy for about 18 years and on the block for about 10 years. This yeah. side yard or former garden at 162 Hancock Street is a place that many members of our community hold near and dear to their hearts, myself included. Community members were deeply wounded when all of the trees were suddenly cut down without warning. Although there was a time that the Chases, the former owners, used a section of this side yard for parking, it was actually a gathering space where community members fellowshiped and had many celebrations. It was also the only green space on our block. 
and the trees and the landscaping provided a beautiful and natural transition between 160 and 168 Hancock Street. As numerous articles have stated over the years, this side yard or former garden is located on one of Brooklyn's most premier blocks with respect to historic architecture. Walking tours are conducted on the block during the warmer months. So if anything is to be, to be built upon it, then it should live up to this high standard of architecture. As the neighborhood continues to be colonized by profit-driven developers, the culture and identity of our beloved historic landmark district becomes threatened. There is an affordable housing crisis. Will these apartments with forced balconies, roof decks, will they be affordable to the average member of the community? Bed-Stuy has its own unique culture and we must preserve this uniqueness and prevent developers from disrupting the streetscapes. If you look at page eight of the presentation at the streetscape, even were it not outlined in red, you could run your fingers along the streetscape and guess which is the proposed building. If the proposed building is not of a certain standard, it will tarnish the architectural prominence of the block. Lastly, after the building was sold, I walked over one day and introduced myself to the, to the developer as the block association president. And I said, we'd like to have a relationship with you. And I gave him my, my number. He declined to give me his number, but said he would contact me. No contact was made until a year later when the community board got involved. This among other things has led us to believe that the developer doesn't have the, the community's best interest in mind. And we are grateful it's in the hands of this great governing body. We ask that if something must be built on this land, that it either blends in seamlessly with the other beautiful homes on this block, or that it be a building that further enhances the architectural prominence, the architectural reputation of the block. Chair Carroll and fellow commissioners, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Trent and Marlena Jacklich. So Trent and Marlena Jacklich, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Carroll and, and commissioners. My name is Trent Jacklich and uh, I live on Hancock Street between Nostrad and Marcy Avenues. I strongly oppose the plan for the proposed new construction at 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District in Bedford Stuyvesant. The design presented today for 162 Hancock Street has many shortcomings and is inconsistent with the historic architecture on the block and the district. While it attempts to draw inspiration from the Queen Anne style, it falls short in terms of vibrancy, creativity, and surface detailing failing to apply the design principles showcased in Ms. Torres' own documentation. One particular concern is the placement of the bay windows. Starting on the parlor floor and overhanging the basement, they result in diminished light and cast shadows over the basement level. Additionally, the use of four windows on the parlor floor without any masonry between them is inconsistent with the historic row house design on Hancock Street and the Bedford Historic District. A three-sided bay window would not only provide more natural light, but also align with the existing historical character of the block and district. Furthermore, I strongly urge the architect to abandon her attempt to replicate the narrow four-story buildings that comprise 150 through 160 Hancock Street and instead seek inspiration from wider five-story row houses prevalent on Hancock Street and within the district. By embracing the scale and volume of 162 and 164 Hancock Street within a historic context, Ms. Torres can better honor the architectural integrity of the block. Most importantly, I have significant concerns regarding the presentation of 164 Hancock Street at a later date without addressing the many shortcomings of the proposed design for 162 Hancock Street. These buildings should not be treated as separate projects when they have been designed in conjunction with one another. Given the larger size and greater challenges proposed, posed by 164 Hancock Street, it is imperative that both buildings are evaluated together. 
Considering these reservations, I respectfully request that the LDC table the review of plans for 162 Hancock Street until the applicant is able to present it together with plans for 164 Hancock Street. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Uh, I hope you will consider my recommendations. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Carla Huddleston. So Carla, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Okay, and um, once you are a panelist, if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me everyone? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, good day commissioners. My name is Carla Huddleston. I am the vice president of the Hancock Street Block Association and I live a couple of doors down from the proposed project. The plans as proposed are not appropriate for this historically important landmark block and the overall Bedford Historic District. The 80 intact row homes that make up this beautiful block rival that of, of many other prominent blocks throughout New York City in terms of architectural distinction. The varied architectural styles on the block include 19th century Queen Anne, neo greek French Revival, Renaissance, and Romanesque Revival. They all come together harmoniously. The proposed plans for 162 Hancock do not have a sense of place and are not seamlessly aligned with the rest of the block. They are that of a generic brick box building, which is grossly out of character of all the other architecturally rich buildings. The plans reference 250, 246, 242, 222, and 150 Hancock Street as in inspiration for their design. However, these homes were all masterfully designed by some of the most prolific and prominent architects of, of their time, including Montrose Morris, Brooklyn's most sought after architect, John L. Young, who was known for his handsome designs with a specialty in, in Renaissance revival style, and John Prague, one of the most prestigious architects of the latter part of the 19th century and designed many of the homes on the block and over 300 buildings in Manhattan. There is a considerable disconnect between what the developer is proposing and what they're using as inspiration. Hancock Street, in particular, this block, has always received enormous amounts of attention from preservationists and has been featured on countless numbers of walking tours with the mansion of 168 Hancock and its garden grounds, now known as 162 and 164 Hancock, having served as the anchor of the block for over 130 years. One of the main reasons I moved to and purchased on this block is because of the beautiful stretch of intact and intact and architecturally rich brownstones. The mansion of 168 Hancock Street and the large grounds with the garden and an area that the previous family used for parking was a spotlight for me. Further, the trees on the open green space and the cheek wall where people would sit and gather were just so welcoming. Once the developer bought the property, they immediately cut down the 50 plus year old trees in the side yard, making what is now known as 162 to look in a sad state. Aside from the simple features, the plans propose a penthouse setback on the fifth floor, as well as a six floor bulkhead for roof access that can easily be seen from the street in the gap view from anyone walking by. This will immediately ruin the streetscape. This community worked tirelessly to get this block and the Bedford Historic District designated a landmark in 2015 to protect our streetscapes from such development that is being proposed. No new homes have been built in this block in more than 130 years. This is an opportunity for the developer to build something grand and that honors the block. This is of great concern that after the third iteration of presenting the plans, the design still fail to honor and respect what's currently on the block. The proposed plans will have a detrimental effect on the block's character and longstanding history. Commissioners, I ask that you please consider the cumulative impact of all these matters in making your decision today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy, I'm promoting you to panelists now. Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HTC believes that this proposal needs further refinement and study. In particular, we believe that the building's rear yard bulk is excessive and that its top two floors should be brought into alignment with the neighboring row. 
On the front facade, we feel that the parlor floor door and frame's use of brick is awkward and needs further study. We also find the building's street facing parapet and cornice to be unresolved and in need of further refinement. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Monica Smith. So Monica Smith, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, good morning, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. My name is Monica Smith, and I live on Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy Avenues. I strongly oppose the plan for the proposed new construction at 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District in bed -Stuy. One of many concerns is the rear of the building. With its deep terraces, it resembles more of a Holiday Inn than a historic residential structure. We emphatically urge the removal of trellises on the upper level. The architect claims these are terraces because the floors are not solid, but this allows for the possibility of turning them into balconies cluttered with furniture or used for storage. Additionally, we recommend reducing or eliminating the height of the bulkhead. Considering these reservations, we kindly request that the commission postpone the hearing until both 162 and 164 Hancock can be evaluated together. Thank you for hearing our testimony. We hope you will consider our recommendations. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Nicole Graves. So Nicole Graves, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, good morning everyone. My name is Nicole Graves and I reside on Hancock Street located between Notion and Marcy Avenue. Um, I am an officer on the Block Association as well as a member of Community Board 3, which represents Bedford Stuyvesant. As a long-term resident of Bedford Stuyvesant, I am passionate about preserving the cultural and historical integrity of the neighborhood respecting the architecture of the neighborhood, especially in landmark districts. The current renderings presented today are inappropriate and do not respect the architecture and history of the community. I strongly oppose the, um, <clears throat> the proposed developments presented today for 162 Hancock Street. It is important to preserve this community's unique character given it's the rapidly changing and given the rapid changes that are going on in the area and maintaining the beautiful neighborhood that we all know and love. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Andrea Weller. So Andrea Weller, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Andrea Weller. Um, good afternoon, Chair Carroll and Commissioner. Um, I am a longtime resident of Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy Avenues, as well as a trained architect and concert preservationist. I strongly oppose the plan for new construction at 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District in Bedford Stuyvesant. The proposed design is not in keeping with the architectural character of the block or the historic district. Furthermore, the design language and material usage in this building is grammatically incorrect. Regarding the material use in the facade, in a historic context, the use of brownstone should cover the entire surface of the parlor floor, including the front door opening. The relief panels should be incorporated above all windows, not just on the recessed portion of the building. The current approach of using brownstone relief panels, lintels, and sills is a misguided attempt to mimic the design of the adjacent buildings. If the architect is inclined to use 
is not inclined to use terracotta, I recommend taking inspiration from the design of 150 Hancock Street instead. In addition, the use of brownstone along the edge of the building gives the appearance of coining, which is typical. It's typically seen in freestanding structures or at the end of row houses. Since the applicant plans to develop the adjacent lot of 164 Hancock Street, the brownstone at the edge of this building will only emphasize the discordance between the two buildings. Finally, the use of brownstone at the cornice level is not a part of any building on this block, nor should it be included on that level due to its heavy grounding nature of this material. As suggested to the architect on multiple previous occasions, the cornice should be a pressed sheet metal or similar looking material which should include historic ornament interrupted only by vertical elements which serve as capitals of the columnar elements of the facade. The current design shows the exact inverse of this historic diagram and design intent and a continued misunderstanding of historical material grammar. Considering the anticipated significant alterations to the design of this building, I request that the commission ask the applicant to return with revised plans for both 162 Hancock Street and the renderings for 164 Hancock Street so the entire development can be reviewed as a cohesive unit. Thank you for hearing my testimony. I hope you will consider my recommendation. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next on the list is Giselle Hurtado. I do not see your hand, oh, I see your hand raised now. So Giselle, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank Hi. you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Giselle Hurtado and I live on Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy Avenue. I am testifying today because I opposed the design for the proposed new construction at 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District of Bedford Stuyvesant. The building is a plain Jane, and it could not be more out of place on our historic dis district block. There are many inherent flaws in the design plan of 162 Hancock Street, but I'm not gonna go into details now as my other panelists have done so, because the building should not be presented to the LPC at this point. It, it is only half of the project planned by the developer. Its partner building 164 Hancock Street will be even larger. Together, they have the potential to destroy the architectural integrity of the block. I therefore ask the Landmark Preservation Commission to postpone the review of 162 Hancock Street until they can see the massive, the massive impact of both buildings together on this streetscape. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Okay. Next up, we'll be hearing from Hank John Brickman. So Hank John Brickman, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Can you hear and see me? Hello, yes, I can hear and see you. Great, um, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. Uh, my name is uh, Henke Omrigman, and I'm testifying today because uh, we oppose the proposed plans for 162 Hancock Street. Uh, when my family and I moved to this block uh, uh, over 20 years ago, we immediately uh, appreciated our good fortune, not only because of our exquisite uh, building, um, but also because of the community. Um, I, I have never been welcomed into a neighborhood uh, with such uh, warm and, uh, and welcome uh, attitudes uh, from uh, our neighbors. Um, this block is really, truly special, uh, not only because of its architecture and the architectural significance of the buildings, but because of its residents. Um, they are cherishing this block. They are, this block is the pride of, uh, of uh, the residents um, uh, through good and bad times uh, to preserve the integrity of the block. And for most part, we have been very successful at that. 
it's not a crime to uh, buy a building and plan to um, uh, buy a property and, and plan to build on it. Uh, but the re real issue is uh, they, how they have gone about it uh, so far. Uh, they cut down the trees, uh, as others have already said, uh, really a, a, a great loss. And the property is now taken over by, by weeds. And then they hired an architect by her own admission, hasn't even uh, visited the block when she designed the original uh, buildings. Um, uh, the proposed plans for 162 and 64 lack familiarity with the Brownstone Brooklyn and are fundamentally flawed and, and don't fit into um, the street, let alone the historic district, as many others have already said. What's even worse is that the developers are now attempting to push through the project uh, one at a time, when in reality, um, its development are compromising two buildings and, and occupy 50 feet of streetscape and not just one building. The, develop can, the development cannot be evaluated on a building by building basis. The full impact of 50 feet of streetscape must be assessed as a whole. Without considering the plans for 164 Ancorp, I don't believe the LDC will be able to determine the complete impact of 162 Ancock on the block and in the Bedford Historic District. I kindly request that the Commission postpone the review of 162 Hancock until the developers are able to present the plans for 164 Hancock. In, in doing so, please grant our beloved and historic and important block the high level of respect it deserves. Thank you. Um, for considering my testimony, and I hope it will be taken into account. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we have uh, Janet Park on the list. Janet Park, if you are with us, please raise your hand. Okay. I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janet Park. I'm a resident of the block and member of the Hancock Block 2 Association, and I oppose the proposed plans for 162 Hancock Street. In March's presentation for 162 Hancock, a building I lived in previously had been used as an example on a page meant to show that the architectural character of bay windows on the block had been incorporated. Seeing the photo of my old building initially, I thought of my previous neighbors, my lovely neighbor whose plants thrive at her parlor, bay or her parlor level bay window, my neighbor whose cat loves watching birds from their bay window, and my neighbor who has grown herbs and tomatoes from her window. Then I saw that the render looked nothing like the examples of bay windows on the page, no consistent set of three windows at each level, no outward bowing, and all the the previous examples that did show true bay windows have now been changed out. So now neither examples nor renders show true bay windows on page 25. It feels flippant at best to see the beautiful homes on this block used to try and pass off honoring the architectural character of the block instead of actually reflecting its characteristics. The first render missed entirely the point of a landmark block. With consequent presentations, changes were not made accurately enough to show good intentions and work. The zip code for this project has been incorrect on now all four presentations. And prior to any presentations, the developer was not respectful to block association leadership. So the frustration and concerns of our community members are more than warranted. There's a ripple effect of harm that starts here from projects and developers that come in and are not considerate of an existing community and landscape. I have faced housing instability because of the kinds of profit-driven management companies that follow these projects. I've witnessed how the transient tenants that follow benefit, benefit these institutions and threaten long-term residents. It feels simple to me. Respect should have been shown, proper research should have been completed, and the proposed render should have been contextually accurate from the beginning yet they're still not, which is why we are here today. Please hear us well that the proposal for 162 Hancock Street continues to be inappropriate for the block. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next on our list is Daniel Thompson. So Daniel Thompson, if you are with us, if you could please raise your hand so you could say so. Okay, I see your hand is raised. I'm promoting you to panelist right now. 
Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm Daniel Thompson. I'm a uh, resident of Hancock Street. Uh, and as a member of the, uh, the planning committee for the Bedford Historic District, uh, I learned by walking block after block of the district, collecting signatures and distributing information about meetings, what a rich architectural legacy we have. The Bedford Historic District is a virtual catalog and exhibit of the finest designs and materials of the late 19th century domestic and institutional architecture. Secondly, I became aware of the passionate regard and care for this district by its residents. House Proud does not come close to describing how much the community loves its streetscapes, homes, and gardens. This shared appreciation also helps form the sense of community that we have created here. And an indignity or an abuse in one block affects all of us. The site being developed at 162 and 164 Hancock has inaccurately been described as an empty lot. It was never that. The five-story mansion at 168 Hancock was designed and built with a 40-foot side garden with a brownstone wall and center gate entrance. For over 30 years, this garden with mature trees, shrubbery, and plantings was a treasured meeting place for the community. This was all destroyed immediately upon purchasing purchase by the developer. Um, this was basically the closest thing we had to, to a community park. If this garden is to be developed, the new structures must be up to the quality and visual character of the rest of the block. Other speakers have detailed the most egregious errors in this proposed designs, such as the massive penthouse and bulkhead, the absence of a correct cornice, the disproportionate size and scale of the entrance doors and stoops. This will be the first new construction on this block in over 130 years. Please do not allow the history and legacy of this area to be squandered on insensitive design and construction. We would ask the LPC to delay consideration on 162 Hancock until it can be evaluated against the design for 164, a much larger building. They are not separate projects, it is one project. Thank you for your time and attention to this critical development in an historic district. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Christina Conroy from the Victorian Society in New York. So Christina Conroy, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Mute. Sorry. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society, New York. Now, the Victorian Society is always pleased to see a proposal which is responsive to its neighbors, its street, and the historic district. We also appreciate when applicants provide good historic material to support their proposal. A new building in a densely built up historic district is always a bit surprising. So we were glad to see this excellent set of historic maps. The applicant also provided uh, many helpful context photos. And more importantly, their design is excellent in terms of materials, details, and scale. Five years from now, many people won't realize it's a new building. We do, however, offer two suggestions on ways it might be improved. There are many drawings of the front facade, but in most of them, the area cladding is concealed by a fence. On drawing 32, you get a partial view. There doesn't appear to be any water table where the facade meets the paving. We suggest creating a strong base to building by changing the masonry cladding below the windows, either in detailing or materials, to replicate historic water tables. We also question using the same windows with transoms on all three upper floors of the front facade. The top floor windows on historic row house windows are often different from those below in terms of size or detailing. We suggest reducing the height of the window openings or using arched transoms, but leave it up to the obviously talented designers to work on this. If the front windows at the top floor are reduced in size, the loss of light in the living room could be mitigated with skylights hidden behind the parapet. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Margot Hughes. So Margot, I am promoting you to panelist right now. 
And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Margo Hughes, and I'm a homeowner on Hancock Street across the, uh, across the street from lot nine and lot 10. Uh, my now uh, high school and college age children played in the back and side yards at 168th Street, Hancock Street, under the watchful eyes of Nancy Chase with her grandchildren for over a decade. Um, this space provided, um, this, um, I'm sorry, she provided a space to create a village where we raised our children. While my family and I mourn the loss of Nancy and Arthur Chase and the community space they provided, we understand the applicant's right to build on the site. We, however, object to the proposed building as its integration into the existing built environment is disjointed. The building stoop, door, window, and architectural elements do not align with the adjacent buildings, breaking the rhythm of the streetscape. Additionally, the brownstone cornice is architecturally inappropriate and should be replaced with a wood or metal cornice, refer referencing existing cornices on the block. The building and the applicants proposed for lot nine disrupt the architectural style of this historically important block. I strongly oppose it. Thank you for your consideration and my testimony. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Lizzie Spano. So Lizzie, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Yes, hi, good afternoon, Chair Carroll and commissioners. My name is Lizzie Spano and I live on Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy Avenues, about 10 doors down from the proposed building. I'm here today to express my opposition to the proposed plans for 162 Hancock Street. Our block is one of the most celebrated in the Bedford Historic District and this building will, will represent the first new construction here in roughly 125 years. The developers have a high standard to meet, but their plans fall far short of it. I'm not an architect, but as a creative professional, I can see, as anyone can, that the buildings on the block, though diverse, are sensual and intricate. Visually, the block has a fluid and ornate quality. It is steeped in the distinct ar architectural flavor of the Bedford Historic District. In contrast, the plans for 162 Hancock Street depict a prim and proper building resembling a dormitory or a state office building. While some of the materials may be consistent with the block, their usage is completely off. The building feels rigid and suburban in its tone. Even the rear with its, trellis its trellises that are only technically not balconies gives off a frat house vibe. Wouldn't it make more sense to design something closely based on the existing beautiful structures? As it stands, 162 Hancock Street is not deserving of being in the same architectural company. But as much as I want to focus on the flaws with 162 Hancock Street, there is a bigger problem. The building is only half of the larger project that the, de that the developers are proposing. Its partner, 164 Hancock Street, is even wider and bulkier. Together, both buildings occupy 50 feet of streetscape and have the potential to destroy the character of our historically significant block. It's unclear how the Landmarks Commission can evaluate 162 Hancock Street without seeing plans for 164 Hancock Street. Therefore, I urge the LDC to table the review of plans for 162 Hancock Street until the developer is able to present it together with plans for 164 Hancock Street. Thank you for considering my testimony. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up is Jackie Gasowski. So Jackie Gasowski, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay. Whoops. <laughs> okay, I'm with you. I'm just fumbling my paper here. Um, hmm. Good afternoon. Um, 
Good morning, Chair Carroll. It's afternoon now and Commissioner. Um, my name is Jackie Gasowski and I am here today with my husband, David. We are homeowners on Hancock Street and live directly across the street from lot nine. Arthur and Nancy Chase, the former owners of 168th Street and its adjacent garden, were not just our neighbors, but our friends. They hold a special place in our hearts. I am grateful that they graciously allowed me to host my retirement party there in the garden. It was not only a celebration of a milestone in my life, but it also a celebration of new family and friends on Hancock Street. When Nancy passed away, neighbors came together to decorate the garden and honor her life. Accompanied by a musician from the block, we sang as her spirit found its way home. Before the sale of 168 Hancock Street and its side garden, I would open my front window and be greeted by the treetops of the green oasis. It was a place where neighbors and passerbys would often stop and sit on the stone wall and enjoy the shade on hot summer days. Sadly, the developers cut down those trees over a year ago in anticipation of building 162 and 164 on Hancock Street. Now, when I look out my window, I see a barren lot strewn with garbage and infested with rodents. My husband, Dave, and I were actively involved in the designation of Bedford Historic District. We went door to door, speaking with neighbors, distributing flyers, and even providing transportation to meetings for elderly neighbors. It was a year long process that required perseverance and dedication. From this experience, I am keenly aware that the proposed plans for 162 Street do not meet the standards of the Bedford Historic District or of our architecturally celebrated block. Furthermore, I fail to see how the LDC can properly assess the plans for 162 Hancock without considering them in conjunction with the plans for the neighboring property 164 Hancock Street. Both structures together makes up the intended development that will replace the garden. Therefore, I respectfully request that the commission postpone the review of the plans for 162 Hancock Street until the applicant is able to present them alongside the plans for 164 Hancock Street. Thank you for considering my testimony. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Stuart Elster. So Stuart Elster, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, um, good afternoon, um, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. My name is Stuart Elster and I live on the Han on Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy Avenues. Um, I am testifying today because I oppose the proposed plan for the new construction at 162 Hancock Street in the Bedford Historic District in Bedford Stuyvesant. Uh, the proposed building does not align with the architectural character of either the block or the Bedford, Bedford Historic District as a whole. Uh, specifically, I want to draw your attention to the building's stoop ratio, which significant, significantly deviates from typical row houses on Hancock Street. On average, the stoops of existing houses measure 76 inches, comprising approximately 31% of the width of a 20-foot wide townhouse. In contrast, the stoop of the proposed building is only about 25% of the building's width. To maintain the rhythm and consistency of the block, I recommend widening the stoop to match the measurements of existing stoops. This adjustment will not only ensure a larger entrance door, characteristic of row houses, but also allow for a more balanced distribution of masonry around the door, eliminating the planed asymmetrical placement of the planned proposal. In line with existing architectural characteristics, the stoop should include a bottom landing with a depth similar to the average two feet 
found on block landings. Additionally, the new post requires a more substantial dimension, matching the height, width, and depth of posts found on 150 and 160 Hancock Street. The handrail and baluster also appear too thin, and I, I suggest incorporating handrails with greater mass. Thank you very much for hearing my testimony. I hope you will consider my recommendations. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Achusia Maha. So Achusia Maha, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I'm calling because I am the granddaughter of Mrs. Janitha Rose. Our family owns 150 Hancock and we've owned this house since 1937. And I just wanna say my grandmother probably would roll over in her grave if she saw that building there. Um, she was president of the Block Association uh, back in the 70s and early 80s. And they hosted Easter egg hunts and every kind of event you can imagine in that garden. And I kind of get emotional when I walk by it with my son and tell him that his great grandmother used to host events in there. And to see it now rat infested and cleared is pretty sad. So he had to leave the call just now. But um, when he saw the building, his first thing was, oh, is it a school? It looks very pedestrian. It is not in context with anything else. And I love seeing our house being shown all through these presentations because I feel nothing when I see this building. Um, the, the stoop is not nearly as grand as the rest on the block. And I would hope that the developer would even consider uh, evening out the lot sizes because when the other building comes up for proposal, these two buildings are asymmetrical because of their unmatching widths. So I'm asking you guys to hold off on behalf of my family um, and some of our neighbors here who I'm so glad everybody came out today, but I'm hoping that you guys hold off on voting on this property until we see both of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Morgan Muncy. So Morgan Muncy, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes, hi, uh, good, um, good afternoon, commissioners. And um, I have to say I'm strongly uh, opposing this project. I, I think it's, um, I'm a local resident of the neighborhood. I've been in the neighborhood for 18 years. Um, it hurt me when I uh, went by this site a year ago to see all the trees cut down. Um, I give walking tours of this block, maybe uh, three a year. And this block was special. This block was a block uh, that was built because it was actually the land of this block was on the Capitol Line grounds where the 1876 World Series happened. And it was a fishing pond, a uh, skating pond, I'm sorry. And in order for them to develop, for, in order for the developers to develop on this block, they had to have a gimmick, which they made all the houses special on this block. And for now, um, 140 years later, this new, uh, proposal that really almost, I find it very offensive. Um, it does look like a school. I have to agree with my, my neighbors. Um, it looks out of place. Um, and I'm just, I just hope that you guys uh, hold off until you see the whole picture of this, of this uh, project. Um, the scale and proportions of this are completely off. Um, the, the stoop, as everybody says, is off. But the main thing that gets me is the stair in the front that goes down to the cellar, that's nowhere else in the neighborhood. I've never seen it in any landmark district. And for that to get approved would be like really hurtful for everyone on the block, uh, in the neighborhood actually. So I wanna say, I do not approve this. Uh, I, I would like the commission to really look at this in, in, in detail. Um, look at the whole picture. The backyard is like, I can't even get into that one right now because it's so crazy. It does look like some hotel or a frat house. And, and I just just hope it does not go too far uh, with this current plan. 
Um, thank you for cons your consideration. Uh, to my views, I'm just so passionate about this not going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Peter. So Peter, if you are with us, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hmm. Okay, I'm having difficulty finding Peter. He seems to have left. Okay, he declined to be promoted to panelist. So I will move on to Dutch. So Dutch, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me now? Hello, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm a resident on the block and I currently have an application with you guys. Um, I've lived here now for about 10 years and work closely with landmarks um, to achieve a permit and we're faithfully and diligently trying to execute the permit. Uh, having said that, I've been involved because I know what's happening on the block. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the architect's efforts, not unnoticed, um, but I feel like the struggle with scale, proportion, and the use of materials is significant. Um, and I'm just, there's been a lot of disconnects between what's being said, what's being proposed, the site, and the block. And uh, even when I looked at the application, I was a little bit surprised to, say, to see that they were actually going to use quarried sandstone or brownstone, when typically that type of work is done with scratch coat and tinted concrete. So I'm a little bit shocked, but, you know, if they can find real brownstone, that would be amazing. And I think that should be acknowledged by the commission. Uh, but I just want to make sure if they're going to put it in the application, if they actually use it. The second thing is, um, you know, if I squinted real hard at this, I could almost see a passable application. But I think what's missing in just listening to everybody, and I would urge the commissioners to come do this, is to come down and walk the block. And if you actually look at the amount of buildings on this block with incredible detail, the paucity of what's being presented in this application is significant. And when I think of Daniel Thompson and I think of Rona and everybody in the block that walks it, that sees all the detail and the effort that both architects and owners put into this block in the 1890s, what's being presented today just falls way short of what we have. Um, so I would urge the commissioners to come walk the block with Ronan and if Morgan's willing to just see what's here, look at it again with your eyes and see it in its entirety. Because when you look at the application, that's where I feel like the disconnect is. And it's um, it just doesn't reach the standard of the block and it's a special block, especially when I think about what Gene Lofty said about the previous application at one Cambridge place. It's in, it was a, an insignificant building on the, on the block. I would ask you to find an insignificant building on our block. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but I really think the commissioner should come walk the block before either before making a decision on this application. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Katherine Abrams. So Katherine Abrams, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Okay, I'm waiting for you to accept being promoted to panelist. Okay, see Catherine Abrams declined to be promoted to panelist. Uh, so let's see, okay, she's raising her hand one more time. Uh, 
Okay. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. Catherine Abrams, you will have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, we can hear you. My name is Catherine Abrams. I reside on 86th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. For over 20 years, West Park Presbyterian oh, uh, has- Catherine, I'm terribly sorry. This is uh, not for West Park. Well, that's the matter on which I am going to speak. Okay. Well, actually, yeah, why don't we wait idea. until we're presenting that item and we yeah, welcome we're your not testimony. Take that testimony now. But we're reviewing a different item now. And when we okay. review West Thank Park, you. we'll call you again and make sure that Thank you raise you. your hand. Okay, great. I will. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, so I do not see any further hands raised from people who haven't spoken yet. I would remind everyone that people can only speak once per item. Oh, I see a couple, a few additional hands raised. Uh, so we will be hearing from Andrea Mason. So Andrea Mason, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Um, Hi, good afternoon, Chair Carroll and the commissioners. My name is Andrea Mason and I am, I live on Hancock Street between Nostrand and Marcy and we've lived on the block for almost um, 10 years now, eight, eight years to be exact. And I am an architect. Um, I'm testifying today because I oppose the plan for the proposed new construction at 162 Hancock Street. Design, the design of this building is of utmost importance because it will represent the first new construction on the block in, a, in a, approximately 125 years. Within this context, it is important to note that the developer of 162 Hancock Street is also developing the neighboring property at 164 Hancock Street. Together, these buildings would occupy 50 feet of street facade, thereby changing the architectural character of this beautiful and historically important block. Um, evaluating 162 Hancock Street without considering the plans for 164 Hancock Street does not make practical or architectural sense to me. I urge the LPC and post to postpone the review of 162 Hancock Street until it can be evaluated in conjunction with the plans for its larger counterpart, counterpart 160. 64 Hancock Street. I hope you will consider my testimony and thank you so much for your time um, today. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Yep. And next up, we'll be hearing from Suzette Hunt. So, Suzette Hunt, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Suzette Hunt, are you with us? Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so sorry about that. Good afternoon, hello again, Chair Carroll and commissioners. Thank you for allowing our community the opportunity to respond to the proposal for 162 Hancock shared here. Um, again, my name is Suzette Hunt. I've served on the neighboring Macon, McDonough, Davis and Lewis Block Association. Uh, within our shared district for almost 10 years consecutively as an officer, including service as Wallach Association president. I've lived on Macon between Stuyvesant and Lewis since 2008, which is another beloved bed block within our shared landmarks protected area. I'm here today standing in solidarity with our friends and neighbors on Hancock Street, as I too oppose the plan presented for 162 Hancock. 
As I stated in my question raised earlier in a matter presented before you today, we appreciate this board and your efforts to preserve our historically significant areas across New York City. As one of the very fortunate residents within our landmark blocks here in Bed-Stuy, we take our roles as custodians of our community's beauty and architectural significance very seriously. I ask that you please help us. Please support us by scrutinizing the proposal shared here very carefully, presented in part without 164 Hancock, which should also be considered for the reasons shared by my fellow neighbors in their testimonies. For us who have actually lived in this area and who have to live with what is built, this is not an aesthetically pleasing design by any measure, given the standard set by all surrounding buildings on this block which is absolutely stunning. And I do also encourage the members of the commission to come and look and see this wonderful, wonderful community and this wonderful block, which would be harmed aesthetically by this design as presented here today. It is not at all beautiful by our standard. We have been besieged by really awful building designs all around us in areas that do not have the protections we enjoy as residents within landmark areas. I respectfully request the commission propose decision on this proposal and assist us in making sure that what does get built is actually respectful of our architectural standard currently in place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, I see that Peter is back. So I am promoting you to panelist right now, Peter. Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, are you with us, Peter? Hi, this is Assemblymember Stephanie Zinnerman. I don't know oh, why hi. this is coming up as Peter. Is it my turn? Yes, it's your turn. Okay. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I am New York State Assembly Member Stephanie L. Zinnerman, representing the historic and vibrant neighborhoods of Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights in the 56th Assembly District. Today, I am here in full support of my constituents, neighbors, and friends to oppose the LPC application for 162 Hancock Street. As a third generation Bed-Stuy resident and representative for this community, the preservation, protection, and progress of our district is of utmost importance to me. My success in this role and the ultimate success of our district is based on listening to the voices in our community, coming to consensus, and working in partnership to achieve our goals. We are here for the preservation of this block and the heritage that you have heard from the previous speakers, but we're also here to preserve the trust and the ongoing relationship between government, its agencies, and the people. We are a people power with democracy whose voices matter. Today, you have heard from a united group of residents dedicated to community stewardship and the Hancock Block Association and our local government entity, Community Board 3. Um, you have heard and know of the expertise and the experience and a willingness to work um, with this architect to fit in um, as a good neighbor. They are not here simply to oppose this project. They have come to you in good faith and as good neighbors to educate you about the architectural history and community heritage of this block. And so we urge you to do what is best for this community and vote to delay this vote until the other project can be properly reviewed and all of the suggestions that were made today um, can be reviewed. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And I do not see any further hands raised. So I will just note for the record that we received 55, oh, I see. Uh, okay, so I see a hand raised that has already spoken. So I will just note for the record that we received 55 additional letters from residents recommending denial. And I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carol. Great, thank you very much. And um, before I turn to the applicants to respond to the testimony, I do wanna note 
um, that this uh, application is for a single building and to the extent that there is a future application for another portion of the building or a separate building that would be reviewed by the commission at that time and based on circumstances at that time, any um, action which uh, happens on this site would not guarantee an approval on the other site. Um, I think that to the extent that they wanted to have something that was designed uh, in a unified way, the application would have been better to come to us as a whole, um, but they chose to come forward with a single application. We can't compel them to come forward with the other application, but we also, any action we take would not uh, guarantee a similar or action on the adjacent uh, lot. Um, but after that, uh, after this, I'd like um, the applicants to respond to the comments, uh, you know, talk, I think we heard comments on the development history of this site and the uh, you know, appropriateness of building on the rear yard of, of former of, a, of the <clears throat> adjacent building. And, um, and then also we heard many comments on the design and the depth and the height and scale. So if you can address those, that would be great as well. Uh, thank you, Chair Carroll. Um, I'd just like to make a few points, and then I'm sure Ana Maria Torres, the architect, would like to uh, respond to uh, questions about her design. Um, first, I want to just thank members of the community for all their, their thoughtful testimony, um, in, in particular Ms. Collier um, and her comments and the resolution from the community board um, and members of the, of the Block Association. Um, we actually did reach out to the Block Association at the same time that we reached out to the community board, and we did that once we had a public hearing presentation that was ready to be able to show them. So um, we were making it you know, from the beginning a good faith effort to include community input and um, and get their feedback. Um, and I think we have also at the same time made a good faith effort to respond to their concerns that the the proposal you're seeing today is a very different design from what had first been shown to the to the uh, block association. They were actually the first uh, group that we presented to. So after we got comments from the block association, we then made changes that were later seen by the community board, which was really much more um, uh, in line with the proposal you're seeing today. And uh, even since that community board meeting, there have been refinements to the design as well. Um, I also want to you know, as Chair Carroll just clarified, yes, we there is a forthcoming application for the neighboring lot, lot 10. Um, and because of, you know, some uh, issues that we're still waiting for to be resolved with other city agencies, we have not been able to um, present lot 10 yet. But we, you know, we do hope to, to show you that as well very soon. Um, but yes, we did show that to the community board um, and to the Block Association because they, they had questions about what else was going to you know, hopefully be next door one day. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Anna Maria so she can uh, respond to uh, questions about her design. Um, thank you, Jackie, and thank you to all the members. I kind of emphasize again what Jackie was mentioned and, you know, have been trying to um, reflect the comments and uh, incorporate uh, uh, comments and work on to by the community, then has not been, um, they have not been ignored or not uh, taken into consideration. Um, in response to heights, uh, the height of the building, and actually sometimes renders and perspectives get a bit uh, confusing and kind of misleading, but uh, in reality, the height of the stoop in relationship with the height of all the stoop they are actually at the same height because in one of the comments when this was addressed, we lower um, the the height of the basement and they will be aligned, even though in here in this particular picture version is much more higher. But in 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 a two D uh, section, the uh, Jackie, can you put uh, the two D uh, drawing, please? I don't have control anymore. Oh, you don't um, have control. Oh, sorry. Right. Oh, do I? I think you do know because you. Move I it. think I do. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, you can put uh, one of the um the the two D facades. Okay. 
Sorry, there's a delay. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get there. Okay. I'm sorry, do you know which page number? Keep going, keep, keep going one, uh, one up to next, next. Yeah, this one. Um, the, the, there is, uh, you know, I think we have the differences you have uh, in the 160, there is one step that you have a landing and then one step when you are in the door. In here, we have all the steps and then you have the landing to go to the door. But the height of the building is 40 feet as the height of the nearby building. The penthouse uh, with a uh, bald head uh, is uh, within the zoning, um, the zoning regulations, and they are all complied with the zoning regu regulations from the front facade. And the visual study that we did is actually accurate, and you will not see it. Yes, you will see it if you are looking frontal to in the rear facade. Um, the, as I explained it before, the uh, the rear facade feels a bit massive because we put the parapet as brick instead of to be a uh, uh, railing. Uh, saying that um, the the length or the depth of the building in relationship with the buildings next door, they are within the parameters. We are not actually beyond the parameters on the depth of the building, and. Um, and the other comments that we say we were using a natural stone. Yes, it actually was by one of the community members uh, when we have one of the presentations, then they offered information of one of a particular place where it's possible to find a brown stone, a real brown stone. Then we are not trying to present one thing and do something else. Um, in any way or manner in this uh, building. And yes, uh, it's uh, as an interpretation of, uh, of uh, proportions and scale, and we are in a larger building. The width of the stoops is uh, 62, where is within the dimensions on the other stoops. And, um, and basically that is kind of, uh, basically, that is the most important high lines thing we have. We understand, I have not been seeing the, the, this property before. I have not been seeing the trees. I was not, we were not uh, uh, part of when the trees were cut or not. And yes, it's unfortunately, then um, we didn't have the opportunity to see the original property in the, in the, in the most, uh, you know, amazing state as the neighbor uh, are describing. Uh, then uh, we are trying to really work with and within um, the neighbor quality and we are not trying to be unrespectful or trying to minimize the importance on the block. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, commissioners, do we have any final questions before we move to our discussion? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Yes, I have one question. In the rear facade, the, the, the balconies, are they metal or are they, are they metal attached to the brick? I'm a little confused. Yeah, actually, uh, Jackie, can you put the rear facade? Uh, yes, the 2D. Yeah, Oops. yes, you can, yeah. They are uh, trellises, yes, they have a super structure of metal and they are um, yeah, attached to the brick, but they have their own supporting structure in its own. They are metal trellises for uh, planting and uh, because uh, it's a brown stone and because, as uh, you know, they have different apartments per, per uh, level uh, to have the possibility to have an open space. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, any other final questions? All right, commissioners, I'm gonna ask you all to unmute so we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. All right, uh, Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. 
All, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion now and the application before us is for a new building on this site. <clears throat> so the first question is whether a new building uh, is appropriate here at all. And then the, if you find that a new building can be uh, appropriate in this location, then the question that you should comment on uh, are the, it would include the height, massing, depth, mm -hmm. Uh, materiality and the design and composition and proportions of the building uh, and its front area way and uh, rear yard elements. So we'll begin that discussion now. Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start this one? Sure, thank you. Um, okay, uh, a very uh, um, impassioned uh, amount of testimony was, I mean, I, I think it was very impressive and I wanna thank personally all the all the people who came out to speak about this and to speak on behalf of your neighborhood, it's, it's really moving, um, really, really moving to hear people speak in that way about the place that they cherish. Um, and I hope, we, I hope we can do it justice. I, I, I believe we can. Um, I think that this design has a lot of things going for it. I think there's a lot of strength to it as a concept, uh, but it needs work. I mean, as a concept, the way I view this is that the architect has chosen not to do a straight historic, you know, uh, uh, reimagining of, of a historic uh, style as if it was built in 1880, uh, nor has the architect chosen to do a um, purposefully differentiated modernist uh, uh, contrast to the neighborhood but rather has sought to do kind of a postmodern, uh, contemporized, but traditional uh, design that seeks to emulate the details and qualities of the historic environment without uh, literally transposing period details to it. And I think that that's a reasonable approach. I think the, uh, the, the threshold question of whether or not a building can go here the, for me, it's it's clear that a building can go here. Um, in terms of the comments uh, from many many of the residents about the uh, uh, whether or not I think the commission should wait for the second building, which uh, was acknowledged to be on the way, I really don't think that that you know apart from what Sarah said, which I think is completely correct. Obviously, we by the the applicant has made a choice the choice to present one building now and another one later. By doing so, they put yet more limitations or difficult hurdles when they do building number two, because now building number two has to not only work with the neighborhood, but also has to work with building number one. So um, by uh, putting this forward to us at this time, I think the applicant and certainly Jackie who's been around quite a while, knows that building number two is gonna to have to be uh, complementary to not only the neighborhood, but to the new building as well. And we will certainly judge it that way when it comes before us. In terms of the specifics, front of the, the, uh, the front of the building, I think the retention of the existing areaway wall is, a, is, is the right move. I think that the applicant can work with staff on modifications to the stoop design and proportions uh, that um, should seek to uh, make it comfortable and uh, have a good fit with the, with the neighborhood. I think that the notion of an, of an areaway stair to the cellar is unusual. I think that their ADA solution is very, uh, very clever and appropriate, but I think that these stairs, the cellar stair, if it's necessary from an egress perspective, should be done under a a bulkhead, or maybe you move it against the side of the building and build it into the into the water table that uh, the Victorian Society talked about. There, there, there are solutions for uh, for this that would comply with code that would not involve a very deep, very open areaway that I think would be unusual. Um, I think that the facade design on the front, again, has some interesting starts, 
and uh, needs work. The, um, I, think, I think that the one takeaway that I think uh, the applicant should take is that even while working within this particular postmodern style, there's nothing keeping them from enriching it in a, you know, not in a historically specific way, but in a way that's commensurate with their design with detail whether it's brick detailing or the brownstone detailing or other materials, <laughs> I think they need to look at this at maybe like quarter inch or half inch scale, really zoom in and think about detail. If there's one thing that you take from the building next door to the right, it is the detail, the, the, carved, uh, the carved panels, the surrounds, the window headers, the cornice, the finials at the top, I think there's a level of detailed development that needs to be brought to this within its, con its contemporary-ish style. Um, I think that another major threshold choice that was a mistake <coughs> was the proportioning of the facade. They did the right thing, I think, in seeking to do an A-B facade, where you have a, an A panel, that's where the entry is, that's recessed, that, that let's say the street plane, let's call it, and then a bay window panel that's offset and asymmetrical. That's consistent with the buildings to the right. The problem is that the proportions, even though the building is wider, I think that the proportions don't flow. I think that there's a rhythm to the, build, to the buildings to the right that they're seeking to tie into. They've made a choice. They didn't make this a three-sided bay window or a two-sided bay window. They made this a kind of rectangular pop that is seeking to uh, recall and play into the rhythm of the buildings to the right. So I think that the proportions of the of the pop of the rectangular bay have to be more commensurate with the proportions of the uh, buildings to the right. And that includes the openings, uh, the, the window openings uh, on the second and third floors. I think that um, the entry bay is also peculiar in that it's asymmetrical. If you look at it, it's kind of leaning left. And for a, for a building that's actually wider than the, the, the row, right, that's to the right, I think that the choice to kind of jam your windows to the far left and make it asymmetrical is peculiar. Um, and I think that once, you, once they restudy the bay window proportions and the facade proportions, to have that rhythm kind of read across, I think that a solution that is more appropriate to the entry bay will arise. I think that the cornice material is, uh, should be revisited. I think that either metal or fiberglass would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. I don't think it needs to be, again, historically uh, literal transposition of the buildings to the right. But I think that if you look at the streetscape on this side of the street, one thing that does stick out is the animation of the skyline whether it's by use of the finials as to the buildings to the right, or by use of the bay windows that go all, that go all the way up to the cornice, which is a characteristic of the buildings to the left, or the, the mansard on the mansion. I think that the, the notion of animating the, the, um, the sky space, you know, the skyline of the building is, is one that they should explore within their vocabulary. I think that the um, bulkhead is too visible and is too high. The drawings show it is nine foot 10, the top of the bulkhead above the floor below it. That's nuts, bring it down. The stair needs to be seven feet inside clear. The bulkhead needs to be eight feet inside clear and it can be pushed way back. We, uh, we often approve bulkheads that are within three to five feet of the rear facade. So I think that this should, that should be revisited because we don't know what's going on on, on, on building number two. If they had shown us building number two and it, it blocked it, they might not have had that comment. But I think that because this is a standalone application, we would apply, I would apply that standard to it. And uh, I think also that the side facade should be a common brick. It should not be the face brick. Um, I think in terms of the rear facade, the um, comments that many of the comments uh, I felt were correct. The top two floors should align with and continue the window rhythm of the neighboring row of buildings. 
Um, I think that the parapet should be eliminated and a railing should be put in its place to emphasize continuity with the buildings in this image to the left. I think that the balconies can remain, but should only remain on the right side bay or the left side bay so that they kind of take up the volume of the tails. If you look on the block, there is a series of tails that the town brownstones had. I think that the use of balconies in lieu of the tail is appropriate, but I don't think a full width balcony, and I don't think a balcony that has a trellis on the top floor should uh, be uh, used. Um, I also think that the windows should be revisited on this to, at least on the top two floors, not including the bulkhead, not including the bulkhead, um, to suggest a level of continuity with the neighbors that would be more commensurate with them. Great, thank you very much for your comments. Commissioner Chu. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum, for those comments. I think you've covered a lot of really good territory. I agree with everything you've said. Hopefully I can add some to your your comments um, and be useful to this applicant. Um, first of all, I do wanna say, I know this block, it is incredible. And the existing historic buildings all represent such great examples of their period as well. So the, the fact that you've got such great fabric here is if you choose the route of going more towards uh, um, being sympathetic to the historic fabric as opposed to a modern interpretation, you do have a lot of great examples around you. So that I see that as a positive thing about this block. Um, about the specific issues, if we can go back to the front facade for a moment. Okay. Um, so I think one of the things I wanted to just speak to towards the character of the facade um, I think the massing in general, whether it's appropriate, I agree with the previous commissioner in that it is appropriate to have a, a, a development here on the site. However, if I look at the character of the facade, the predominant sense of this block is that masonry is, is the primary element. All these buildings have a great sense of weight and material depth on these masonry facades, both sides of this empty lot to the right and to the left. Um, and because of the, the, the sheer density of windows on this proposal, I feel like it's overstepped that proportion of masonry. So that as a common, I think you can interpret in, 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 and look at different solutions that might help that. Um, maybe it's the number of windows. I think that the comment about the proportions previously made was excellent about the AB proportion. If the B were reduced and the A increased, I think naturally the window proportion of glazing would go down. Um, if I look at this image straight off, it appears that the A bay here is as narrow as the neighboring lot, which is a narrower lot, which seems odd if even the same or narrower it appears. Um, and so the predominance of the front entry, which is significant on this block, is, is hurt by this entry experience. The, the sense of procession and arrival, celebration of entry is, is lacking, I think. Um, there are lots of comments about the stoop width. I agree with them in overall proportion. Um, I think, again, relating to the AB proportion, that would help solve that because the stoop could get wider. Its relationship to the building facade wants to feel integrated. It does not want to feel as a, another element tacked on the building. So how you address that brownstone stoop to, to engage the facade will be really important. I don't see the point in the brick at the parlor level at all, honestly. When I look at this and the fabric around you, every building has a significant weight to the parlor level down. And there's a great sense of the bottom of the building the weight of the lower level stacked on top, if not even projected from the upper floor, I think is, is a precedent, which in this case, because you recessed it, it, it challenges that sense of base on this proposal. Also coupled with the big hole of the stair, I think start to, I feel like the base here has lost its significance that the other lots all seem to, to, to uphold. Um, 
about the again the, the there's a, an expression on the left side of this facade which is very thin and i think that thinness is also being traced as an ornamental almost coining around this facade over the top and back down again and that framed expression is unlike anything i've seen on this block every other facade respects its neighbor as a horizontal continuation and not frame itself as an ind individual marker. Um, so to that point, I want to just carry on to the, to the top, the cornice. Um, both sides of this lot, uh, when I say this lot, I mean the empty one to the left, have relevance and, and design continuity to their neighboring structures. On the left, there, the projected cornice continues even at uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the number of the, the taller building on the left goes, rises higher, but there's such respect to that datum, which is to the left of it. And here you see all the houses that are to the right have a slightly recessed uh, massing at the top, which give, um, as, as, as Commissioner Goldblum pointed out, a very defined and articulate nature to the, to the profile at the top. That setback does a lot to, to highlight the detail of the roof edge. I feel like either you respect that massing because otherwise, I, unfortunately, it feels like a blunt forehead. Um, and it's, it's very square, unlike the slightly recessed, more ornamental neighbor to it. So I do feel like it lacks articulation. It's not continuous. There seems to be something, a panel above that a bay that is not consistent on the right. It feels lacking in articulation, almost blank in, in this current proposal. So I do think a lot of work needs to be looked at it in section profile and detail articulation. Um, let's see, I think that hasn't already been said. I, I'd actually, if we can also look at the rear now, Okay. Um, I do want to point out the, the bulkhead too, since you can see it here and, and, and very clearly from the corner view, I completely agree that it's too visible because of the lack of any structure in the lot adjacent. And if it can be reduced in height, I also think it feels like a jumble of volumes, which I don't think would be that difficult to simplify. There seems to be like three different boxes attached to create this bulkhead. And it just adds to a little bit of that visual clutter at the skyline there. Um, in terms of the, the, the rear lot or the rear facade of, the, of this proposal, it seems really unfortunate that the projected bay is the one that's adjacent to the very otherwise continuous rear facade of, of the historic houses next to it. Um, I kept looking at your plan to see if you could actually flip the bedrooms from the rear to get the more in line plan to, to, to have some, some relationship to the fabric that's there because the balconies that project just essentially augment to the fact that it doesn't doesn't relate to, to the massing of the neighboring houses. And I do support this other comment that was made about maybe just using the, the, the uh, projected elements on the one bay and not both, because it does completely um, cover this facade. It really shrouds it. Um, let's see if I'm missing any other points. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Everything else was said so well previously. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Jefferson. <laughs> um, okay, where I look at this, it's, it's a new building. And the architect has, has a different concept, a modernist concept of this building on this block. And what he has done, he has taken the idea of density, which is kind of a modern idea, but I see it on the, build, the existing building, density of windows, regardless of, of the space between them, and use that in an aesthetic framework for his building, for her building. 
And if you go back to the front facade, I, I think it works beautifully. The, the datums with the existing building with the rest of the block works well. I think the building is, has a unique presence of its own, which is what the architects wanted to do. So I, I find this a very reasonable um, building. I think the, the bulkhead is too large, should be reduced. I think the coping, um, the cornice, I think it's fine. I think it works well. I think the architect has used her aesthetic to create a building that has a strong presence on this block. Thank you very much, Commissioner Holford-Smith. I actually missed the presentation, but I, okay. I heard a lot of the um, uh, testimony. So, and I've obviously I've heard comments and I guess I can say that even not having heard the uh, presentation from the applicant um, that I am in alignment with the comments of uh, Commissioner Goldblum and Commissioner Chu. Um, I think especially the, the as actually Everardo mentioned, density of windows, but I think it, in fact, it should be the opposite. It should be a little more predominantly masonry than, than window. Um, okay. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, very interesting case. Um, you know, uh, thank goodness for Commissioner Goldblum and for Commissioner Chu who knows this block so well. It's clear from the testimony that there is a lot of tremendous passion for this block. And I think the couple of things, I, 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 won't, I, I agree with a lot of comments and I just won't, won't, won't play designer here. I just think that Fundamentally, when you come to an intersection, when the word commissioner keep on using, uh, choose keep on using, keep on using is obviously continuity. You have a, a, a continuous uh, sort of a facade in the front and then the back. And so you're coming to a point of interruption, so to speak. And so the approach here is that the applicant chose to be almost like a terminus point here, which is taking a risk because you then have to your left, um, another vacant lot. And by going first with only one building, it limits even further uh, the modification and the flexibility down the road in case you need to make adjustment, right? Because right now you're still on the uh, design stage and therefore anything is possible could be adjusted. Uh, and once this thing um, is modified, it becomes much more difficult, then puts all of us in a more of a uh, difficult choice of looking at now you not only have uh, only uh, uh, one interruption but two interruptions in the middle and how do you um, blend in so to speak uh, uh, that I do not know but clearly some of the comments is absolutely correct the bulkhead must be reduced uh, and uh, some of the, uh, the comments so I would defer to uh, the rest of the commissioners to see how they feel okay thank you very much Commissioner Chapin yeah, um, I, um, excuse me, let me just see if I'll, yeah, I just want to make sure I was unmuted. Um, I uh, a bit uh, agree with, uh, I would agree, I would agree with Commissioner Jefferson about it, you know, it's, it's, it's approach in general. Um, but I think um, that because it has this relationship that it's trying to achieve especially with the buildings very close adjacent to it, that uh, I support uh, Commissioner Goldblum and Commissioner Chu's remarks. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, obviously, but I, I think that uh, they made very good points in particular. Um, I think that the um, solid to void uh, proportions uh, need to be looked at a little more that the um, proportion of the stoop and left side to the bay section is a little off because of the width of this building as opposed to the building adjacent to it that that needs to be adjusted a bit. Um, I, I definitely think that the cornice uh, should be more robust and articulated and maybe deeper and um, 
I think that the bulkhead is is definitely needs to be reduced and and simplified. On the rear, I think that we do allow a lot of latitude in the rear, but this doesn't seem does not seem to have much relationship to other houses. And it would be nice if it were possible to, um, following some of the comments uh, by commission, Commissioners Goldblum and uh, Chu, to maybe have it um, achieve a little uh, more relationship with the back, because there's such a row there. Uh, if there's some way to, uh, to achieve more relationship in the back. Uh, so those, are, those would be uh, my comments. Great, thank you very much. Commissioner Master. Yes, first of all, I wanna commend um, the public testimony. It was very moving to see so many people in the neighborhood come out, um, describe your personal stories, your love of the neighborhood. Um, it was uh, tremendous. Um, there's a lot of um, caring there for the, the houses here. Um, I'm going to agree with um, Commissioner Goldblum and Commissioner Chu. Um, and to quote one of the uh, folks who had testimony, they said that the problem with this design is that it breaks up the cadence and rhythm, um, the sense of place of the neighborhood. And I think that essentially captures it for me. Um, so I would find this, I think that of course, you can definitely build on this plot but that the, uh, the plans need some work. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners, uh, for your thoughtful comments. Um, and I do want to note for the record that Commissioner Lutfi uh, is recused on this item and has not been present for the entire session, either the presentation or the testimony or discussion. Um, and I want to thank also the public for coming and participating in our uh, hearing today and uh, sharing your testimony and comments. And um, so we have very, um, I think, thoughtful direction here from our commissioners. So we'll take no action today and we'll ask the applicants to um, think about the comments we've heard from our commissioners and make revisions and they're welcome to come back when they've made those revisions. So thank we'll you. Take, thank you. Thank you. So no action today, and um, we are very behind schedule, so we are going to make some adjustments to our agenda, and I'll uh, turn it over to Corey to just walk through what those adjustments are. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so starting with the remaining public meeting items, there are three of them that we, sorry, four of them that we will not be able to get to today. Uh, we will uh, schedule those for an upcoming public meeting. Uh, and any of those that were read into the record and not presented previously or had testimony heard, uh, we will again do so at that time. And so those are items three, LPC 23-07630, 34 Veranda Place in the Cobble Hill Historic District. Item four, LPC 23-09371, 169 Congress Street in the Cobble Hill Historic District. Those were both read into the record previously. So we will uh, again, reschedule those for an upcoming hearing. And then items five and six, public meeting items five and six. Uh, these are regular public meeting items, uh, LPC 23-10485, 2026 Avenue in the Sullivan Thompson Historic District. Uh, we will add that to an upcoming agenda as well as public meeting item number six, LPC 23-05732, 56 West, West 12th Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. And then finally, we also will um, read into the record a new item that was scheduled for the first time today. That would have been public hearing item number one, LPC 23-01451, 225 Prospect Place in the Prospect Heights Historic District. So we're reading that into the record today. Uh, to Again, not being presented, no testimony being heard. We'll do that at an upcoming hearing uh, that we'll reschedule this for. Um, and with that, we will move to the final item. Public hearing item number two, LPC 22-09135, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1217, lot one, 165 to 167 West 86th Street, AKA 541 Amsterdam Avenue, the West Park Presbyterian Church individual landmark. This is a Romanesque revival style church complex designed by Henry Franklin Kilburn and built in 1889 to 90, which incorporated an existing chapel designed by Leopold 
Heidlitzen built in 1883 to 1885. The application is to demolish the building pursuant to section 25-309B2 on the grounds of hardship. Uh, and this was last presented at the public meeting of July 19th, 2022. And of course, no action was taken at that time. The commissioners, only some of the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, I can't find Tony Snyder. Tony Snyder, if you could raise your hand, please. Thank you. Uh, Toby is logging on right now. He should be on just in just a few minutes. And well, I know we do have a number of people here to testify, but if you could not raise your hands at this time, that will help us to find the applicants and we'll let you know when it's time to raise your hand. And I don't see Roger or Rick. I think they are all um, going on. Dan Kaplan is apparently on, but has not been promoted. Dan was promoted a while ago. I'll try oh, again. Okay. Well, maybe he missed it. I don't see Dan Kaplan. If Roger or Rick is here, could you please raise your hands? Um, Rick is says he's probably listed as Goran uh, Jovanic. Okay. He's trying to change his name, on at least on Zoom. And I think Dan is promoted. Okay. I think um, if anyone else comes along, I think Corey can help. Um, I don't want to hold us up any longer. So I will... Uh, Give the control you have to Toby on. Toby. Yeah. Okay. Great. So Toby, yep. um, you know, you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Whoever is beginning, please state your name for the record, and you may begin. Okay. Um, I am starting off. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Valerie Campbell. I'm a partner at Kramer Eleven, and we are land use counsel to the church and to the West Park Administrative Commission. This is the third public hearing slash meeting on the church's hardship application. After the second meeting, the application team was asked to respond to a number of questions about the church's application, to submit additional materials and to conduct additional studies, including facade probes and a window survey. The church submitted a comprehensive written response to these requests on April 13th. Today, I'm joined by Roger Leaf, the head of the West Park Administrative Commission, Rick Lefebvre from Facade MD, Dan Kaplan and Toby Snyder from FX Collaborative, and Adam Wald and Sharon Locatel from Appraisers and Planners. Together, we will give a brief overview of the application and the additional materials that have been submitted since July of 2022. <laughs> we also have other members of the project team available for questions, um, after our presentation, including Ken Horn from Alchemy Properties, Jim Brand from LBG, Mohamed Raoul from Severud Associates, and Elizabeth uh, Pinocchio uh, Pode Consultants. So as I stated at the first public hearing, the application that it before, is before the commission is unusual. The commission is not being asked to determine whether the proposed demolition and new building is appropriate. Instead, the commission is determining whether the church has satisfied the extraordinarily rigorous standards set forth in section 23-309, subsection two of the Landmarks Law for the issuance of a notice to proceed with demolition on the grounds of hardship. In this case, the church must meet the statutory standards applicable to not-for-profits that first own a landmark property that no longer supports the purposes of the not-for-profit and second, have a contract to sell the property to a for-profit purchaser that is contingent on a demolition approval. <clears throat> the availability of the hardship application is a necessary and constitutionally required component of the Landmarks Law. Since its establishment in, six, in 1965, the Landmarks Commission has only considered 19 hardship applications. Some members of the commission may recall that the commission granted a not-for-profit hardship application for St. Vincent's Hospital in 2009 under the alternative judicial test for not-for-profits. More recently in 2014, the commission denied a for-profit hardship application for city and suburban homes 
finding that the applicant had not demonstrated that the buildings could not earn a reasonable return as defined under the landmarks law. This application is proceeding under the statutory test for not-for-profits, which also requires a reasonable return analysis. Next. We believe that the church's <clears throat> application is clearly satisfied the um, standards for notice to proceed with demolition based on hardship. To summarize the requirements of section 25309, which actually I think was on the prior slide, my uh, mistake, a not-for-profit application must show that it is exempt from real estate taxation and that it is entered into a contract to sell the property, which is contingent on the issuance of a notice to proceed with demolition. The applicant must also show that the property would not be capable of earning a reasonable return as such term is defined in the landmarks law. This definition is a return of 6% calculated on the assessed value of the landmark. The not-for-profit applicant must also show that the property has ceased to be suitable for its purposes. And finally, the prospective purchaser must show that it intends to demolish the building and construct a new building with reasonable promptness. We would respectfully suggest that the commission carefully consider the following factors. First, the calculation of whether the building, if used by a third party other than a church, could generate a reasonable return as defined under the landmarks law. This evaluative calculation must include the cost to repair the facade and make the building structurally sound, as well as the cost to address the numerous life safety and accessibility issues that would have to be addressed in order to get a certificate of occupancy that would allow the building to be used by a new owner. Second, the analysis of whether the building is suitable or appropriate for church use must also address the cost of making the facade and structural repairs that are required to cure the outstanding Department of Buildings violations on the church and to allow for the removal of the sidewalk bridge. We believe that the materials that have been submitted to the commission with respect to this application demonstrate that the church's congregation has made valiant attempts to maintain the landmark since designation. In addition, the landmarks law does not provide any authority for the proposition that the congregation should be somehow compelled to transfer its property to an unrelated entity based on unfunded promises of restoration. At the 2010 designation hearing, the then pastor of West Park Church, Robert Brashear, testified against designation, noting that his 14 year tenure at the church had been a constant struggle with one building issue after another. Seven years after designation, the congregation could no longer afford its pasture and it sold all of its other property. This is a critically important application for the future of West Park. We thank the commission in advance for its time and consideration, and we look forward to responding to your questions. Before I turn the presentation over to Roger Leaf, I would like to briefly locate the church and discuss the basis for its designation. The church is located on the northeast corner of 86 in Amsterdam. It is outside of the historic district and opposite another individual landmark. One of the first things that the church investigated when it was designated was the possibility of transferring development rights to other sites, but there are no feasible receiving sites since the church is surrounded by developed residential buildings. Next. This is a recent photograph of the church. The sidewalk bridge has been up for more than 20 years in order to protect, protect pedestrians from the deteriorating facade. Next. West Park looks like a single building, but it is actually two buildings. An earlier chapel built in 1885, designed by Leopold Edlitz, which is shown on the right, and the main sanctuary and unifying facade designed by Henry Kilborn and constructed in 1889. The church was designated in 2010 and the church opposed designation at that time based on its deteriorated condition and the congregation's struggles to maintain the building. Roger will now give a brief description of how the burden of maintaining this building has impacted the congregation and depleted all of its resources.
Is Roger um, on the listed on here? Roger has not joined us. I don't see him. Sorry. There, there's an attendee NYC Presbytery. Raises that would, that, raises that would probably be him then. All right, promoting. My So is that Roger? Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Great. My apologies. Um, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I am Roger Leaf, Chair of the West Park Administrative Commission, speaking on behalf of the church. I'd like to begin by summarizing some of the major points in our application for hardship. West Park has been the owner of the building since it was constructed in the 1880s, and like all Presbyterian churches, the congregation is solely responsible for its upkeep. The burden of maintaining the building has only grown over time, which has taken its toll on the congregation. The church had nearly 300 members in the 1990s, but membership started to decline as building condition issues worsened and accelerated dramatically after the building was landmarked in 2010. Currently, the church is only able to cover its operating expenses by going even further into debt. Next slide, please. The building's condition issues are clearly evident to everyone, and they've been getting worse for decades. The sidewalk shed has been up for so long that most area residents cannot remember what the building looks like without it. Because of the building has been used as a church since uh, before most city building codes were enacted, it's been grandfathered from having to meet numerous life safety and ADA accessibility regulations, but this does not mean that the building is entirely safe. The church has been continuously cited by DOB for safety violations that the church does not have the resources to address. In 2022, structural issues were so serious that the sanctuary had to be closed for several months. Next slide, please. The building was unheated and empty when it was landmarked in 2010. The congregation had made a deal for the demolition of part of the building for the construction of affordable housing, and the proceeds from that development would have been used to restore the rest of the church. Landmark designation caused the developer to pull out of that deal, and the church had uh, then had to sell an apartment for pastoral housing to pay for immediate repairs. The congregation immediately began working diligently to find an organization to share the space, but all these efforts fell through because the cost of building repairs. The number of potential partners the church talked to are too numerous to list here. Instead, I refer you to our responses to questions from the commission staff that were included in our April 13 submission. Within days of the city council's vote to approve landmark, the church did hold a congregational meeting to consider the possibility of selling the building. Only 27 congregational members were present, and after considerable date, the congregation voted against selling largely because it felt it needed more time to consider its options, and because it believed that the $20 million that Gail Brewer had promised to raise would eventually be available for building repairs, but sadly, this never happened. Next slide, please. This is a partial list of the fundraising efforts undertaken by the church to make repairs. The proceeds from these efforts were used for new fire safety equipment, repairs to damaged pipes and bathrooms, repair to basement for flood damage, and to replace the roof on the parish house. Not on this list are the numerous loans that the church had to take out to keep the lights on, including loans from its own members. Next slide, please. For over 200 years, the Presbytery of New York City has been serving churches and worshiping communities in all five boroughs, including many that are individually landmarked or are in historic districts. Its responsibilities, however, are to assist churches in ecclesiastical matters and in compliance with the denomination's constitution, which is called the Book of Order. It, is neither, it has neither the authority nor the resources to help pay for maintenance of its member churches. 
But even if it could, the cost to restore this building far exceeds all of the Presbyter Presbytery's financial assets. In our prior testimony, we provided extensive documentation describing the duties and responsibilities of each body of the hierarchy, and I refu refer you to those submissions. Next slide, please. To quickly summarize the church's plans if its hardship exemption is granted, the building would be sold to Alchemy Properties for $33 million. Alchemy would construct a new residential building on the site and would also provide the church with $8.8 .8 million in funding to construct a 10,000 square foot worship and community space that would be retained by the church and would occupy most of the ground floor and lower level of this new building. Proceeds from the sale would provide the church with an endowment to maintain the space and support its mission. But the bulk of the proceeds would be deposited into a restricted fund managed by the Presbytery to support outreach and community programs like food pantries, soup kitchens, and the like in Presbyterian churches across the city. Next slide, please. The church went through a rigorous process uh, that led to the selection of Alchemy Properties as its development partner. We interviewed nine developers had extensive that had extensive experience in complex development projects and working with landmark properties. This list was quickly narrowed down to four finalists and Alchemy stood out for its breadth of resources it could bring to the project and the work it has done on historic structures like the World Worth Building. It is important to note that the church's initial plans did not involve the complete demolition of the building. We looked at a wide range of development options before deciding on the current plan, which turned out to be the only one that was economically feasible because of the manifest condition issues, particularly to the facade of the church. Alchemy's team of experts helped us explore the wide range of development options, which are detailed in earlier findings and in the appendix of this presentation. Next slide, please. The list of professionals working with the church includes experts in design, construction, restoration, land use, zoning, and financial analysis. Clearly, the church could never have been able to assemble such a qualified team without Alchemy's assistance, and we are grateful for their support. I would now like to ask two members of this team, Rick Lefevre of Facade MD and Toby Snyder of FX Collaborative, to walk you through our assessment of the building's current condition issues and the new studies that were undertaken since our last public hearing. Next slide. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Lefevre. I'm a licensed professional engineer and I'm the president of Facade MD Architecture and Engineering. I have 37 years experience in the assessment, preservation, and restoration of facades, primarily here in New York, but also throughout the eastern half of the United States. In 2021, I was asked by Alchemy Properties to provide a professional assessment of the exterior walls of the West Park Presbyterian Church Building at 165 West 86th Street, including current conditions and recommendations for repair. I emphasize the word repairs as the understanding from the beginning was that the intention of the project team was to repair the building. As a result of our analysis, other members of the project team developed cost estimates for the recommended repairs and calculated the ramifications of these estimated costs. Next slide, please. Our assessment of the exterior walls included a visual review of the building exterior from ground level and available interior spaces, examination from close range using a boom lift for three full days, examining every accessible wall area up to and including the very top of the bell tower and review of relevant available documentation describing the original construction and subsequent repairs and assessments. Our examination of the building noted extensive spalling, disintegration of stone surface material at locations throughout the street facing elevations. This is clearly the primary reason why a sidewalk shed was erected over 20 years ago, as Roger had previously said, for pedestrian safety from stone fragments falling from the building. Next slide, please. As noted earlier, the building is a bearing wall structure clad in two types of red sandstone. 
The majority of the street facing walls are clad in long, me long meadow brownstone from Massachusetts with rusticated surface. Detailed trim and orientation consists of lighter colored Lake Superior redstone sandstone from Michigan, selected for its finer grain composition. Sandstone is a sedimentary family set of stones consisting of layers of sand and sediment deposited over millennia and bonded together through pressure and heat into stone. Sandstone wasn't as a popular building material because it is soft and easily carved. Next slide, please. The most common mechanism of sandstone deterioration is freeze-thaw action. Stone surface is porous, allowing water to rainwater to penetrate. Each time the temperature passes below 32 degrees, Penetrated water expands approximately 8 to 10 percent in volume, cracking and pulverizing the surrounding stone material. Here we see uh, photographic evidence of the deterioration of the red sandstone on the left and the brown sandstone on the right. Cracked and, stone, uh, cracked and pulverized stone material adds additional water into the stone surfaces, aggravating and extending the problem. The binder materials in sandstone are susceptible to being dissolved in weak acids, such as our local rainwater with its acidic pH level. That process increases the surface porosity of the sandstone and leads to further degradation. Over 20 years ago, the deteriorated sandstone was ground back to sound surface and patched with cement-based repair mortar, which is evident on the left side uh, photographs. Since that time, the sandstone has continued to deteriorate, undermining the stone material to which the cement-based patches were adhered. We continue to find fragments of stone and cement patches on top of the sidewalk shed. You can see up to the right of the hand in the upper left photograph, a cement patch that formerly covered the deteriorating sandstone material to the extent that much of the previous cement patch is missing. The same at the lower left photograph. Um, this is a freeze panel on the Amsterdam Avenue side of the building above the, the uh, sidewalk shed level where lettering that was uh, initially carved into the stone has deteriorated to the extent that only a few letters remain. Disintegration of the stone, and disintegration is the descriptive word used in, used in DO, uh, DOB violations that are current, is not limited to the fine grain red sandstone ornament, ornamentation, but is also in the field of the rusticated brown sandstone. Our physical examination through sounding, which is gently tapping the stone surfaces with a plastic headed hammer, noted deterioration and surface separation at areas of rough surfaced brand sound, sand, brown sandstone, as well as the red sandstone. Next slide, please. Also problematic in the exterior walls is deflection. Bearing walls rely on verticality for stability and to support structural members resting on the interior portion of the wall. Our close range examination of the bearing walls noted an outward lean in the south gable wall. To the extent that the ridge beam at the roof level was no longer supported by the wall and was in need of immediate stabilization, as is visible from the center photo on the right side. With this, I will pass to Toby Snyder of FX Collaborative Architects, who will go into this uh, situation further. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Toby Snyder. I'm Design Director and Senior Associate at FX. Um, I'll summarize some of the other critical findings that the consultant team put together as part of the application and responses to the commission's questions. Uh, so this is a report uh, from the structural engineers at Severed Associates. They did surveys of the building and found the following. First, the building walls are leaning out outward from the sanctuary over the street, the south, the south facade leaning over uh, into the street and the, the north facade leaning northwards uh, out of the sanctuary. 
the the section of the facade that Rick mentioned earlier on 86th Street was separated from the roof um, and not adequately braced against wind loads, nor is the roof and sanctuary ceilings adequately supported. There's indication of excessive deformation of wood trusses and or excessive lateral movement or settlement at the truss bearing points, and there are cracks in the roof truss. In the bearing walls themselves, there are various through cracks, areas of missing and deteriorated mortar, and signs of trapped moisture. At the bell tower on the corner of 86 in Amsterdam, 25% of the brick is cracked, deteriorated, or missing mortar. The stair joists inside are also severely deformed and cracked. Uh, we'll come back to some other uh, findings on the structural condition that have been found out since this initial report. <clears throat> Um, next, as it pertains to the fire protection and life safety, CCI code consultants were brought in and reviewed the building. Um, the building would require significant and intensive upgrades to comply with current codes. In short, it's missing all major life safety features and systems. It doesn't have an automatic sprinkler system. The fire alarm system is antiquated and it lacks audible or visible notifications. It has open stair halls made of flammable materials. It doesn't provide two fire exits for the office or assembly spaces east of the sanctuary, and there's no emergency lighting. Um, CCI also reviewed the ADA accessibility. As the building currently stands, it is excluding a great number of folks from being able to access any of its spaces, starting right off with the fact that both the Amsterdam and 86 entrances are not ADA accessible. There's no accessible routes from the sanctuary to any level of the building, including the balcony. The restrooms are not ADA accessible, nor are the interior doors, door hardware, stair railings, the, are, they're all non-compliant. <clears throat> Uh, we talked a little bit about DOB violations. So the, the photos on the interiors that we've shown you show a, a combination of existing conditions that need to be addressed and grandfathered conditions such as life safety and ADA issues that would have to be brought up to code should the primary use of the building cease to be a church. But that does not mean that the conditions are safe. Um, they, they should be addressed. The church building has a number of DOB violations for, from various units involving far, involving far more than just the obvious facade problems that have necess necessitated the sidewalk shed. These include uh, folks from special operations, construction safety enforcement, emergency response, forensic engineering, <laughs> borough enforcement, as well as the sidewalk shed maintenance. These violations date back years, but are still being issued as recently as May 30th of this year. Some of the most critical violations noted are the sections of the facade spalling severely, uh, ornamental masonry with potential to detach and fall onto the public roadway, the exterior wall being out of plumb and leaning, and damaged and disintegrating masonry at several locations. <clears throat> Since we presented these findings last year, in response to the commissioner's questions, the applicant team has undertaken some additional new studies as they pertain to the major issues of the sanctuary walls and revised cost analyses. Um, as noted in the structural engineering uh, report, both the north and south walls of the sanctuary are leaning excessively, that is leaning outwards. So a, scan and, a scanning and monitoring team um, had the engineers at Krypton Engineering do a scan of the exterior of the south wall and from what they could measure from the 86th Street sidewalk shed and above, it was leaning out eight inches towards this, the street, and most likely more than that if it could have been measured from the sidewalk level where the fulcrum of the wall is. The north side, albeit a shorter wall, is uh, leaning out four inches. <clears throat> That's likely caused by outward forces on the trusses that support the roof weight. This is further confirmation of the detachment of the south wall from the roof um, that had left the roof ridge beam unsupported. Krypton was also asked to see if the walls are continuing to move. So they installed four tilt monitors in July of last year on the interiors of the north and south walls. And they measure both horizontal uh, movement in the plane of the wall and leaning movement over time. They're, uh, they're sort of zeroed out when they're first installed, regardless of what angle they're installed at, in this case, the, the eight, eight or and four inch leans. Um, and what we've learned from then until April of this year, when we uh, submitted our reports back to the LPC, is that the west side of the south wall, that, that is the one uh, leaning over 86th Street, was experiencing both the greatest continuing outward lean and also the greatest uh, lateral movement in the plane of the facade. 
I'm going to turn it back to Rick to discuss the probes. Thank you, Toby. Uh, at the request of the commissioners and for additional information, four investigative probes were performed at selected locations. The probes involved removal of portions of cladding stone to expose underlying conditions, including the metal anchors that connect the stones with the brick walls behind. The probes revealed no functional connection between the cladding stones and the brick wall behind. Uh, the upper right photograph shows one of these metal anchors. The metal anchor was intended to fit into the slot that's approximately two or three inches further to the right of the vertical portion of that uh, anchor. Unfortunately, this was an original piece of uh, construction that uh, was not where it was not placed where it, it should have been. The other two photos show the dark patch of uh, corrosion where an anchor that was in fact originally installed has corroded clear through. So there is really no structural connection between the cladding stone and the brick wall behind. Metal anchors intended to hold the cladding stone were found to be either improperly, install, improperly installed, that is not fit into the slots as I just described, corroded and therefore reduced in structural value or missing entirely. These were just uh, confirmations of uh, conditions that we had already suspected, that we have uh, multiple issues with the uh, integrity of the walls. With that, I will pass it back to Toby Snyder. Thanks, Rick. Um, so after um, the structural engineers at Severed noted the excessive outward lean of the walls, they put together the following design, uh, conceptual design for bracing that would be required to stabilize them in their current uh, outward leaning place, not to bring them in, but to just stabilize them in, in their, their current outward lean. So first, uh, if you look at the south elevation here, a sort of A-frame uh, of steel girts would have to be built on the inside faces of both the north and south walls, and then have them tied together uh, with tie rods spanning across the sanctuary space through the roof to hold them in tension and, and in place. This is to reinforce the walls to prevent excessive stresses placed on the church's masonry units and mortar joints. So this, this could stabilize the roof system so that the tops of the walls don't continue to thrust further outward, but it would not pull them back into a plumb condition. It would just hold them in place in their current outward lean. Uh, this work is estimated at $1.8 million. Um, some code issues. It, it bears repeating that in any scenario where a church doesn't remain as the primary user, a significant amount of work needs to be completed to bring the project up to current codes. The grandfathered conditions are only allowable if a church remains as a primary user. What we are showing here is some of the extent of that work if, uh, for instance, some other owner takes over the property. Uh, and we're showing just the first and second floor here. But in short, it would be a total gut renovation of the cellar, first, second, third, and fourth floor of the parish house, requiring two new sets of fire stairs, a new egress door to the street cut through the facade, um, new ADA accessible bathrooms and all the associated plumbing, a new elevator, um, and ADA accessible ramps for egress. The cost of this is estimated at $4 million. Um, we were asked for additional uh, information by LPC on the condition of the windows. So uh, Liberty Stained Glass Conservation was engaged in November of 2022 to provide an assessment of the church's at least 60 stained and leaded glass windows. And, and some of their findings include um, uh, that 11 windows were found to be visibly in danger of falling out of the matrix. 75% of the windows exhibited excessive flex from even mild pressure. 60% of the caulk holding the protective glazing has visibly failed. Uh, and the tower windows were an immediate concern and uh, recommended to be removed immediately. The construction estimate for this work is $1.9 million. I'll now pass it back to Roger Leaf. After a thorough review of previously analyzed and new building issues, the team developed a revised set of estimates of the hard cost for third party use. These include a best case using the building's existing interior space, an infill scenario that includes creating new floor space in the sanctuary and the gym of the parish house, and a residential scenario in 
uh, involving the construction of 20 new apartments within the existing building envelope. The hard costs do not include so-called soft costs, which are typically 25 to 30 percent of hard costs, but this would include for architects, engineers, attorneys, permits, financing, and the like. However, the updated estimates of our hard costs are remarkably close to our original submission, within 1 percent in the base and infill scenarios and within 3 percent of the residential scenario. Adam Wald of appraisers and planners will now walk you through the reasonable return analysis he's conducted using these updated estimates. Adam. Thank you, Roger. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners and LPC staff. My name is Adam Wald. I'm an executive vice president with the firm of appraisers and planners. Uh, we are a real estate appraisal and consulting firm based in Manhattan. I'm also joined today by Sharon Locatel, president of our firm. Our firm was engaged by the applicant to provide economic analysis component of the hardship application. We provided our initial analysis within a report dated April, 2022, that was included as part of the initial submission. We have been recently tasked with updating our analysis uh, for the most recent submission using the updated findings from the construction professionals and updated costs provided by LBG. Right, next slide. Uh, the economic analysis is used to determine whether a reasonable return, as defined, can be achieved following a renovation and restoration of the property. Uh, the purpose of the report was to determine whether a reasonable return can be achieved um, uh, and defined, sorry, the reasonable return is defined as the net annual return of 6% over the value of the improvement parcel, as Valerie referenced earlier. For this analysis, the uh, assessed value is 3.46 million, which is the actual assessed value of the property. We are guided by the landmarks law and LPC's previous applications of this method in the stall matter. Uh, next slide. The economic analysis has five basic components. Uh, we estimate a market rent for the subject property as renovated and restored, estimate stabilized operating expenses for the property as renovated and, and restored, determine stabilized net operating income for the property as renovated and restored, and capitalize the net operating income into value using a loaded capitalization rate, and then determine if the calculated return achieves a 6% return above the actual assessment. I'd like to call your attention to bullet point number two. This is where the renovation and restoration costs Roger reference are incorporated into the reasonable return analysis. Per LPC statute and LPC accepted methodology in previous hardship applications, the total development costs are multiplied by 2% to produce an annualized cost. This annualized cost is then folded into the analysis as an expense in the calculation of net operating income. As Roger referenced, we reiterate that the total renovation and restoration costs are exclusive of any soft costs or financing costs. However, in previous LPC hardship applications, LPC has accepted these soft costs. We have elected to omit them in our analysis. Uh, next slide. The economic analysis was applied across three development scenarios, all of which were aimed to exist within the envelope of the existing structure without any expansion. Uh, they are simply a community facility commercial use, which uses the existing footprint and square footage of the, of the property. Then there was an infill community and, and commercial use scenario, which when working with FXC attempted to maximize all available square footage within the envelope. And then there's a residential or multifamily scenario in which also involved an infill component uh, in which we create 20 apartments ranging from studios to three bedroom units. Under all three scenarios, no reasonable return is achieved. Next slide. This is a presentation of the, the three scenarios. It's a summary of, of the analysis. Uh, under the base and the infill scenario, there uh, is negative net operating income. And we would note that these, the base and the infill scenario do not include real estate taxes as an expense. Under the multifamily scenario, real estate taxes are also excluded as an expense, and it results in a, a very small net operating income. When folding in real estate taxes as an expense, as shown on slides 64 and 65 in the appendix of this presentation, 
This results in a negative net operating income of negative $525,000. Next slide. Uh, at the request of LPC, we were asked to consider the impact of historic tax credits on the reasonable return analysis. We determined that the use of federal historic tax credits could potentially reduce the net development costs by between 13.6% and 14.45%. There are several caveats to the assumptions that could mitigate the total benefit. For example, under the multifamily scenario, in order to create legal light and air for residential use, over 60 new windows we need to be punched through the roof and the facade as depicted on slide two in the appendix in this presentation. It is our understanding that such a drastic change to the property would likely render the property ineligible for federal historic tax credits. Nonetheless, our analysis includes the impact of the federal historic tax credits on the net development costs for all three scenarios. Our conclusion was even uh, folding in historic tax credits does not achieve a positive return and does not achieve a reasonable return. Next slide. So this is the summary of our conclusions. Um, due to the lack of positive net operating income, the reasonable return is not achieved. And in all three scenarios, we do not meet the reasonable return threshold. And I'll turn this presentation back over to Roger. As Adams analogous uh, addresses the first major consideration that the commission must consider, which is whether the building can earn a reasonable return if used by a third party. The second major consideration is whether the building is suitable or appropriate for carrying out the religious purposes to which it is devoted. Next slide, please. The cost to repair the building for church use by West Park must remedy all outstanding DOB violations, including repairing the facade to the point where the sidewalk shed can be removed and addressing all structural issues and repairs needed to make the building safe. The hard cost for this work is 26.4 million, which like the analysis for third-party use does not include soft costs. It also doesn't include any funding for ongoing repairs or maintenance of a 140-year-old building. It also would not include any cost to address the grandfathered building and code issues and accessibility issues, although any responsible owner would want to address these costs as well. Next slide, please. Adam's analysis showed that three scenarios for the third party use would not generate a reasonable return as defined in the statute. In fact, following the statute, following the rules of the statute, none of them would even earn a positive return, except for a small positive uh, return in the case of a multifamily program or, or project that very likely would not be acceptable to the commission. A major driver of this analysis is the cost to restore the building, which we are confident will be validated by the commission's team of independent analysts. But even if the cost of our estimates were half of our projections, none of these three scenarios would meet the statutory requirement for a reasonable return. We've included the supporting analysis for this statement, and it can be found on page 66 in the appendix of this presentation. Next slide, please. The second major consideration is suitability for religious use by West Park. It's important to reiterate that the church has already exhausted all of its resources by trying to maintain the building and is now deeply in debt. Continued use of this building for religious purposes by West Park would inevitably drive the church into bankruptcy. The mission of the church is to provide a spiritual home for its members and service to the community. West Park can do neither if saddled with the overwhelming burden of maintaining this building. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there is no scenario whereby the building would be suitable or appropriate for sustained use by West Park. In fact, the costs of repairs far exceed what it would cost West Park to purchase a new building on the Upper West Side for worship. The purchase price, or sorry, the purchase of West Park by another faith based organization is also highly unlikely. In the last 10 years, there have been 65 sales of religious properties for over a million dollars in the borough of Manhattan. Of these 65 sales, 61 were purchased for demolition or for third party use. Only four were purchased by a faith based organization, and only one of those was on the Upper West Side, a property on 97th Street that sold for $3.7 million. 
Clearly the high cost of restoration makes the building in, uh, uneconomic for religious properties, not just for West Park, but for virtually any congregation. This concludes the formal remarks of our presentation. We would be happy to answer any questions from the LPC commissioners and staff that you may have. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So I think we'll move right to public testimony. Um, but before we do that, I do wanna just uh, comment on a few things. I would like to um, remind everyone what the application before the commission today is and what it is not. I think there's uh, been a lot of um, you know, uh, interest in it. And I just wanna be sure that it's clear what it is we are reviewing so that we can have the most effective testimony. The church has submitted an application under the hardship provision of the Landmarks Law, and this provision concerns applications in which the work is not appropriate under the Landmarks Law, but a denial in the applicant's view would result in a hardship as that term is defined in the Landmarks Law. The application before the commission is not an application to de-designate the church, nor is it an application to demolish the church. This application presumes that the demolition is inappropriate and would be denied. And the hardship provision is an important part of the Landmarks Law, safeguarding it against claims that the law's requirements in a specific situation effectuates a taking of private property without compensation in violation of the federal and New York constitutions. And just to, this is very technical, but just to be clear, a taking, uh, occurs in two instances, when the government physically occupies private property for public use, uh, but also it occurs when a government regulation essentially eliminates almost all economic value from a property. The hardship provision was included to avoid claims that regulation under the landmarks law was too burdensome. Um, so, you know, I, with respect to designations, the issue of landmark designations and takings was decided by the Supreme Court in the Penn Central case, but, uh, but this is specifically about the, the question of regulation. And so to determine a hardship, the landmarks law requires that the church must show three things. One, that the property is incapable of, of earning a reasonable return defined as a net profit 6% uh, of the assessed value. Two, that the property has, quote unquote, ceased to be adequate, suitable, or appropriate for use for carrying out both the charitable purposes of the owner and the charitable purposes to which it had been devoted when it acquired the building, unless the owner is no longer engaged in pursuing such purposes. And number three, that the purchaser, quote, seeks and intends in good faith to demolish the building immediately, unquote, and to build a, the new building with the, quote, reasonable promptness, unquote. I strongly urge that everyone uh, here to testify today focus their testimony on these three elements. We understand uh, and share your connection to the building. Um, we designated this building. And uh, you know it's an important landmark, but that is not what is before the commission today. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is we have a lot of people who have signed up to testify. So please note that there is a three minute time limit for each person testifying. And I would ask that everybody respect that time limit so that we can ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. And if you're not adding anything new to the record or you concur with prior speakers, it's perfectly okay to simply say that you support or oppose based on the testimony of a previous speaker. And I can assure you that brevity goes a long way after hours of testimony. Um, but, and again, it will help us to get to everyone today. And so the way that we'll this process will work as we will largely call people in the order uh, they signed up. Anyone here to speak that didn't sign up, we will call you after those who signed up in advance. 
And if we call your name and you're not here or responsive, we will skip you uh, and move on in the interest of time. Um, but you can always raise your hand at the end to be called. So uh, raising your hand will be the tool. So if you if you aren't able to speak when we call your name, just raise your hand uh, at the end and we will certainly call you then. Um, we will also keep the record open for one additional week to allow written testimony. So if you're unable to speak today, you may submit written testimony that will be reviewed by the commission. And um, with that, I will turn it over. Sarah, to yeah. There, I just noticed that Commissioner Holford Smith has her hand up. I don't know if that's uh, was intended. Okay. So I think she may have a question. Okay, please go ahead, Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, yes, I have a question. Isn't there a current um, proposal to purchase the building? Um, hasn't that been offered from an organization to purchase the building from from the church? Is that still the case? The applicant respond. Uh, yeah. Carol, if I could respond to that. We have uh, been told on various occasions of an interest in discussing a purchase with the church, but there is no formal offer on the table other than the one that we have signed in a purchase and sale agreement with Alchemy Properties. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so before we move to the testimony, are there any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. And um, and again, we will start with anyone who signed up in advance and then try to get to everybody else. Uh, so please do be respectful of the time limits. Okay, Gregory. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Obviously we have a lot of signups, so I will be getting right to the first sign up, and that being Senator Brad Hoyleman Siegel. So Senator, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify before you today on this crucial issue. My name is State Senator Brad Hoyleman. I represent the 47th Senate District, which runs from Christopher Street uh, in the village to West 103rd. Uh, it is worth mentioning that in our Senate District, another hardship application, as was noted earlier, was considered for the demolition uh, and reconstruction of the historic St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, that is a day in the Landmarks Preservation Commission histories that, in my opinion, will live in infamy. Infamy. I I'm here today to echo Community Board 7's resolution from June 2022 and the efforts of Councilmember Gail Brewer and preservationists such as Landmark West and the New York Landmarks Conservancy and urge you to reject West Park Presbyterian Church's hardship mm -hmm. application. As you know, the permitting of the demolition of a landmark on the grounds of hardship is extremely rare. There have only been 13 such applications in the entire history of the LPC. I believe that this sets a dangerous precedent by granting the hardship and permits owners of historic buildings throughout our city to engage in demolition by neglect when preservation becomes expensive. That's precisely the circumstances that the creation of our landmarks law sought to prevent. Most recently, the church has become a burgeoning home for the arts, thanks to the center at West Park, which is built upon West Park's mission for the West Side for spirituality and social justice, including serving as the launching pad for the social services organization God's Love We Deliver at the height of the AIDS epidemic. As a testament to its local importance, community members have worked tirelessly to help preserve it, raising over $3 million. And last Saturday, over 250 Upper West Siders rallied inside the church to bring attention to its fate and celebrate its role in the neighborhood. The message was clear. This church is too important to our community to be sacrificed due to a lack of consideration 
of alternatives. As the case of West Park Church shows, if we want to protect beautiful historic buildings, we can't encourage demolition by neglect. Instead, the complexity of the situation demands creativity, compromise, and attention to our past. I strongly support Councilmember Brewer's efforts to honor the landmark designation of this special place. And as Community Board 7 noted in its June resolution, demolition is simply not the only option, but it is irreversible. I'm not here to demonize the developer or especially the church and its membership, which admittedly is dealing with a difficult and complex financial issue. But with such rich history at stake, this conversation cannot be focused on your first test only, the economic analysis and reasonable return for the developer. If the hardship application is approved, what's the return for the community? What's the return for other religious congregations that will lose their spiritual home? The artists who will lose their performance space, the dancers and musicians who will no longer have studios in which to perform. I urge the LPC to reject today's hardship application and give the community more time to explore alternatives to demolishing the church, allowing the second test to be fulfilled, to allow the church to perform its historic mission, acknowledge the renewed effort to raise the necessary funds to purchase the building from the church, as well as innovative ways to preserve the structure of the church while proceeding with some form of development in order to generate revenue. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony, Senator. Thank you. And Next up, we have Councilmember Gail Brewer. Uh, Councilmember, if you are with us, please click the raise hand function so I could call on you. Okay. I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate being here. I am Gail Brewer, city council member and as the Senator said, I believe that the Presbytery has not demonstrated a financial hardship as required by Section 25-3092 of the city's landmarks law, and their application must be denied. The applicant is seeking to demolish this last of its kind church, not by reason of economic hardship, but rather as an economic opportunity. As you know, I landmarked the church in 2010, and I do want to thank all the commissioners who have come to visit this beautiful church. Hardship applications are appropriate only in those rare situations in which the landmark has sustained such massive damage that it simply cannot function for its intended use. Here, yes, need of repairs, but the church continues to function and serve the community graced by its beauty. It's a greatness which 12 years ago, the commission designated it as one of the Upper West Side's most important buildings. That the center's architect and engineer, they have conducted a comprehensive assessment of the building and that there is no reason why their opinion should be given less weight than those of the applicant's design team, which you just heard from. Quite the contrary, the architect for the center, West Park, is the only design professional, in my opinion, who has conducted an up-close visual and personal inspection of the church facade using a boom lift. I want to be clear, WGE, a nationally recognized firm, and Slocum, a cost estimator, have conducted an independent assessment of the church, and they concluded that the cost of repair are a fraction of what has been represented by the applicant. WJE, which has conducted assessments of both the structural integrity of the church and the facade, has confirmed that the building is in far better shape than what has been represented here by the applicant. WJE's estimate has been separately and independently corroborated by architect Paige Crowley. The church's insurance carrier has surveyed the church every year and repeatedly issued policies co providing coverage, another independent confirmation that the building is structurally sound. By contrast, no independent third party has verified or otherwise corroborated the applicant's assessments. I also want to mention that just recently when the uh, applicant acting, you know, on behalf of uh, the representatives interfered with the boom lift inspection by arranging for DOT to revoke the boom lift operator's permit. And just as the center was about to begin the examination, that's the center's engineers and architects. 
This occurred in September 2022. I had to then contact DOT, challenge the legitimacy of the revocation, and arrange for reinstatement of the permit. Once the permit was reobtained, the assessment confirmed that the facade was in much better condition than what you saw pictures of today. Then a separate inspection on May 10th when some of the commissioners kindly visited. The LPC staff repeatedly worked to facilitate a dialogue between the new commissioners and the applicant's design team only and refused to allow the center's architect to do the same. Only after I intervened were the commissioners permitted to listen to the center's architect, who was the only person, as I said before, to have conducted an up-close visual inspection of the church. I know that you also feel that the church applicant has ceased to be suitable for carrying out its intended purposes. And I'm very clear on what the three items are. The church, though, is currently rented and sublet to artists and, and religious organizations which use the facilities. The sanctuary has been sublet to religious organizations that for years have conducted services on a weekly basis. There's a wonderful church there now every single week. Musical performances take place every single day. The church is adequate, it is suitable for charitable and spiritual uses all the time. To just talk about the concerns that the chair brought up. Earn a return. This, the center for, at West Park has already put in half a million and let me be clear, we do and can raise some money to purchase the church from the presbytery. All the presbytery has to say is we're not doing alchemy, Give us the money because you deserve to be compensated. Number two, suitable for use as a religious institution. There is a religious group there every single Sunday and there are tons of congregants. Number three, you're supposed to demolish ASAP. Well, guess what? There's a five-year lease for the center at West Park. So you're not gonna be demolishing ASAP. I wanna also mention because money comes up. It's not in your list here, but let me be clear. Debbie Hirschman is now, she's fantastic. She's now head of the center at West Park. She raised $95 million to build JCC at 76th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. I was there when she started. I watched her build it and raise some money. And of course, as you know, on Saturday, we had a lot of celebrities, all of whom want to raise money. This is the original home of God Love We Deliver, the original home of the public theater, every elected official, Hundreds, if not thousands of people are supportive of keeping the current building and we want to compensate the um, presbytery, but we do not want this church torn down for expensive condos and not one unit of affordable housing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Assembly Member, Council Member. Uh, next up, we have Robert Fultz-Morrison. Uh, Robert Fultz-Morrison, if you are with us, please raise your hand. And just to note, to make everything run smoother, if you are, with us and would like to speak, please click the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen so I know that you're with us. Okay, so Robert Fultz Morrison, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for a few minutes of your time. I'm the Reverend Robert Holtz Morrison, a retired Presbyterian minister living here in New York City. I previously worked on the Upper West Side and for about the last 40 years of my ministry, um, been responsible for upwards of probably 150 um, in relationship to 150 different churches and been very curiously following during those 40 years what's been going on at West Park. So I do value their legacy. I want to speak though in support, in support of the hardship application of the West Park Presbyterian Church. Commissioners, you already received a longer testimony from me that was written. So let me make three short points why I want you to support the church's hardship application. The first is I'm one, I'm one of many in the religious community of New York City that are concerned when landmarking and preservation overtake the decision of a religious corporation regarding the use and the repurposing of its property for its spiritual and its missional purposes in its community. Religious organizations and their buildings need to be adapted to the religious purposes of the gathered congregants 
and the changing community contexts and needs. Our buildings are not simply to be preserved as mere monuments. Second, as you have read in detailed documentation provided to you, the present building continues to endanger the community surrounding it and perhaps within it. And I pray, I pray it will not be a disaster waiting to happen by stalling on granting the hardship application. I know it's unpopular as some believe it is to do and has been stated, but I believe the building needs to come down so the plans, alchemy and others can go forward. Third, there's an urgent need already expressed by both the governor and the mayor to add more housing units to this city and state. In the past few years, churches in this presbytery already have added 296 more housing units by repurposing their properties that they own. Granting the hardship application with the plans for the future use of West Park's religious property will allow the church to increase available housing in the city, continue the legacy of its religious life and its service to its community on site and offer new community space for the arts and for additional programming. And so I encourage you, the commissioners, to support the hardship application of the church. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we have Warren McNeil. And as noted before, please, if you are with us, I see your hand raised now. So I'm promoting you to panelist right now, Warren McNeil. Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Warren McNeil, a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church USA. And I serve as the stated clerk of the Presbytery of New York City. In my role as a Presbytery leader for ecclesiastical matters and Presbyterian polity, I clearly understand the challenges of the West Park congregation in its desire to upkeep of their building and the purpose it was formed more than 160 years ago to serve as a worshiping community. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of the West Park congregation hardship petition pursuant to section 25-03B of the landmarks law related to their sanctuary building. This landmark can happen in 20, 2010 over the objections of the congregation. And so the commission has put the West Park congregation in the situation in which they find, currently find themselves. Many of the church leaders have spent countless hours and resources trying to keep a building up that is more than 140 years old. This building is a vital part of the Upper West Side, but however, the West Park congregation now has determined that it is time to repurpose the building in which it has sought to live out God's call to them that was placed more than 160 years ago. The West Park Church has not been an example for trying to keep the building up to codes and to live out its call in the West Park, Upper West Park section of, of the city of New York. Members of this congregation has sold the land. They have continued to find ways to raise money and even at the point of having to take out loans for members of its own congregation. Our Presbyterian polity requires that every church maintain its own buildings. This commission's decision more than 13 years ago was wrong. And today you had the opportunity to correct that mistake and assist a small struggling congregation on the Upper West Side to go back to being a church, a church that wants to serve the community and its people. The people of the West Park congregation only ask to be given a chance to participate in their own rescue by asking this commission to grant their approval of the hardship petition. I ask this commission to do the right thing and vote the approval of the hardship commission, hardship petition 
requested by the West Park Church in accordance with the statutes. I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next on our list is Russ Jennings. So Russ Jennings, if you are still with us, please raise your hand so I know that you are available to speak. Okay. Okay, I do not see your hand raised, so we will be moving forward with Michael Hiller. So Michael Hiller, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Mike. Hi, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I thought I would be getting a little bit of latitude on the, on the time. Uh, in any event, Michael Hiller, Hiller PC, on behalf of the Center at West Park, the principal tenant of this landmark building, we rise in opposition to the application and ask that it be denied. Before I get into my remarks, I want to address the question that was asked by Commissioner Holden Smith, which was whether or not there had been a request to purchase this building and an offer had been made to, be, uh, to purchase the building. Uh, Mr. Leaf said that there was no other offer except the pending offer. That's not true. On, I'm looking right now, if I could share my screen with you, I would, but I have an email from Ted Berger to Roger Leaf on uh, June 11th at 7, 10 p.m., copy to an assortment of people containing a full offer to purchase the church. Uh, and I understand that there are additional interested parties, but that the Presbytery doesn't seem to be pursuing them. Uh, in any event, over the course of the rest of the afternoon, you'll be hearing from a series of witnesses who will no doubt uh, tell you that the application doesn't come close to meeting what Valerie Campbell uh, referred to as, quote, the extraordinarily rigorous standard imposed by the law, the landmarks law for granting demolition of this landmark building. Among others, you will hear from Justin Spivey, a structural engineer from WJE, who has been evaluating this building for over a year. He will confirm that the building, while old and in need of some repair, is structurally sound and capable of continuing its use as a religious and community facility. And that will be a recurring theme for you today. Michelle Dalha, an architect from WJE, will also provide testimony. And she will testify with respect to the facade that while it's in need in some, of some local law 1011 work and some repair, it can be repaired at a fraction of the cost that's been represented to you. And it makes sense because a building that was constructed over 130 years ago is going to require some maintenance. And regrettably, the Presbytery has not engaged in the maintenance necessary to ensure that this building can be preserved unless, the inter until, unless action is taken. We encourage the Landmarks Preservation Commission's regulatory division to impose the requirements that the Landmarks Law uh, does impose. I, I do want to emphasize the three requirements uh, that were referenced by the chair moments ago. The first one is that the church, the applicant must demonstrate that the church has ceased to be suitable, adequate, or appropriate for its intended uses. That's the language of the landmarks law. And it makes clear that the unsuitability, inadequacy, inappropriateness of the building for its intended purpose must already be extant. It must already exist. And what you're going to see is that the church right now is in active use as a religious facility, as a community facility. Uh, I understand from um, Ms. Campbell that she argues, and uh, she's a smart lawyer, she argues that uh, in her papers that it's not sustainable in the future as a church. But with all due respect to Ms. Campbell, that's not the standard. And I suspect Ms. Ms. Campbell is trying to change the standard because she recognizes that her client can't meet the standard. But when the, the standard cannot be met by the applicant, the choice is not to change it. The choice is just to deny the application as Gail Brewer and Brent just said. The second requirement talks about whether or not it can be operated as a for-profit facility. And by that meaning, could, could it generate a 6% reasonable rate of return? And the applicant argues that it cannot profit at all because it requires massive repairs that and the costs of which are in excess, according to uh, the papers we saw today, in excess of $26 million plus soft costs and professional fees. That's where Ms. Ms. Dahlhoff and Mr. Spivey come in. I am not going to speak to those issues. They are highly technical. I will simply point out that the two instances in which we endeavored to engage in a wholesale evaluation of the building through WJE, twice 
we were required to ask Ms. Uh, Gail Brewer to intervene on our behalf. And I just wanna say, the whole purpose of being here is so that the Landmarks Preservation Commission has all the information that it could possibly require in order to adjudicate this appropriately. I'm sure that the commissioners want to know everything that would be relevant to a determination as to whether or not this building can be preserved. And the last thing anyone should be doing is stopping well-regarded, nationally recognized engineering firms from providing information to each of the commissioners. So I encourage each of the commissioners to ask Ms. Dahlhoff and Mr. Spivey questions today about what they saw. They submitted reports on June, on June 9th. They are dated June 8th and June 9th. And you will see that in each instance, they completely deconstruct the analyses by the applicant's design team. I submit to you that if you review those reports and ask pertinent questions, you will find that Ms. Dalhoff and Mr. Spivey have, are able to prove to you that this building can be used for its intended purpose. And if it were a for-profit facility, it would be a profitable one. Lastly, the third required showing is gonna be addressed by my colleague, Mr. Hi, I'm gonna wrap up, uh, concerning um, whether or not the building um, can be automatically turned, uh, demolished and uh, immediately demolished and then uh, promptly uh, a new building can be put in this place. I can simply tell you that they will not be able to make that showing for the reasons Mr. Sakai will say. And I will remind the commission that just 12 years ago, this commission designated this building as one of the Upper West Side's most important buildings. Every effort should be made to preserve it. I urge you all to consider what you hear today from the other members of the, uh, the Center West Park and members of the public who have been pouring out in droves. The C and also CB7, uh, Brad Hoyleman, Gail Brewer, Linda Rosenthal, all the public officials who have spoken out on this issue have spoken out against granting this application. And, and I would urge the commissioners to take that very seriously because those are the individuals who have spent the most time looking at this issue. And with that, I'm glad to conclude my remarks unless the commission has any questions for me. Great. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Michelle Dahlhoff. So Michelle Dahlhoff, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Actually, actually, Gregory, I think they wanted Justin Spivey to speak next. Oh, okay. My mistake. Okay, so I will bring her back to attendee and Justin Spivey, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners and members of the public who've very patiently waited uh, through the meeting until this time. I'm Justin Spivey, a senior associate and structural engineer with WJE Engineers and Architects in uh, Philadelphia. My colleague, Michelle Dahlhoff, is in New York. And our um, investigation of this church and updates to that investigation following uh, the, the new information that was provided by the applicant in April has found uh, numerous inconsistencies within the reports and between the reports provided by the applicant. Uh, one of those is uh, whether uh, the building falls under the New York City Department of Buildings facade inspection safety program requirements, uh, which it does uh, as confirmed in the DOB's database. Uh, Michelle will speak uh, to the exterior masonry issues. Um, I'll speak a little to the, the structure. Uh, this is largely in our June 9th uh, letter to uh, the commission. And uh, we actually quote uh, from some of the commission's incisive questions to the applicant, um, including about the uh, areas of wall that are uh, reportedly displaced outward. Um, the as the, the commission's uh, questions to the applicant note, uh, there, uh, uh, the walls in question are only small portions of the exterior perimeter of the building, and uh, they're topped and uh, predominated by gable end walls. And uh, the 
illustration on the, the third page of our report uh, highlights a drawing by Severed to show that the majority of the roof load on this building falls on the two primary trusses that are inboard of the exterior walls and parallel to them. Uh, the gable ends behind the areas of wall that are reportedly displaced outward. The roof framing is parallel to them and does not load them, uh, despite several references to a ridge beam in the applicant's testimony today. Uh, it's actually a ridge board, which does not load the wall. And in fact, it's that lack of connection of not having a robust framing member bracing the top of the wall that did allow it to displace outward until the church resolved the problem by bracing it. Um, we also uh, looked at uh, the scheme put forward by the, the applicant structural engineer to introduce girts and ties. Uh, across the sanctuary, while the, the ties in the sanctuary attic may be a prudent measure to, to stop further outward movement of the walls to the, the extent it's continuing. Uh, the girts, uh, which are a majority of the cost, 1.2 out of 1.9 million in LBG's estimate, uh, those girts would be highly disruptive to the sanctuary and don't address the problem of the gable end walls not being anchored to roof structure. Uh, the uh, engineer's statements about the displacement being excessive are not backed up by uh, any reference standard. And the monitoring that shows continuing movement at one of the four instrument locations, again, these are on the, the sections of the wall directly below the, the gable end walls. Those um, sensors are uh, not described in the report, uh, nor is their installation method calibration or anything else that we would need to, to really evaluate the data that's, that's presented by the applicant. Um, finally, uh, with regard to CCI codes assertion that the cost of exterior masonry repairs uh, would contribute toward the cost of alterations in triggering a full code upgrade of the building, that hasn't been our experience that uh, stone units are routinely removed from facades and repaired or replaced, and reinstalled without that being considered an alteration to a load bearing wall. It's typically done one or a few stone units at a time with temporary shoring in place to not consider it a structural alteration. And in fact, uh, one of the inconsistencies that we identified in our letter was between uh, CCI code asserting that the exterior walls are solid load-bearing masonry and uh, the, their facade consultant asserting that they are of veneer construction. And I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Michelle Dahlhoff, uh, who can speak more to the exterior masonry. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And Thank you. Of course. Next up, we'll be hearing from Michelle Dahlhoff. So Michelle Dahlhoff, I will be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Carroll and the commissioners. My name is Michelle Dahlhoff and I am a New York state registered architect working at the office of WJE in New York, uh, a colleague of Justin Spivey, who is working in the, out of the Philadelphia office. Uh, as previously mentioned, we were engaged uh, by uh, Michael Hiller's office and the center at West Park to provide an independent review of the facade and of the um, reports generated by Facade MD, uh, Severud engineers, and others as part of this application. Uh, over the last year, we have performed several site visits to the building. We have walked the interior, surveyed the exterior, the walls, and most notably last October, we afforded the opportunity to get close up access via a boom lift along the south elevation. We had initially planned to get access along the south and west street elevations from a boom. However, uh, our duration on site was shortened due to DOT um, issues previously mentioned by um, Gail Brewer. Uh, during this close up access to the south elevation, we were able to get um, at 
to all areas above the sidewalk shed along the south exposure of the building uh, using non-destructive methods, uh, sounding hammer, we were able to uh, touch and sound the existing stone masonry elements. Uh, and within our report submitted last week, you can see detailed close-up photos and summaries of these conditions. But as part of this uh, access and investigation, we did notice note areas of deferred stone masonry repairs, uh, although not uncharacteristic of a building of similar material, age, and certainly weather exposure in um, our Northeast climate. Uh, we saw areas of uh, exfoliating stone, um, prior patch repairs that had deteriorated uh, that at times can look um, dramatic when they are left in a, a state of um, deferred maintenance, uh, although I believe that they were uh, they are isolated to certain areas of the facade and not as widespread as has been represented in several of the uh, supporting application um, reports. Uh, I think this is an important thing to distinguish that although there can be uh, photographs showing extensive stone loss and exfoliation, uh, this from our observations is not characteristic of the units throughout the facade and um, very much isolated to areas that can be um, repaired and upgraded for continued use of the building and of a safe facade. Uh, additionally, uh, as noted by Justin, we have reviewed the more recent reports prepared by the applicant, um, specifically uh, Facade MD's report discussing the probes that were performed and the anchorage of the existing uh, stone cladding. Uh, within this report, the cladding is um, referred to and characterized as a veneer, and there are suggestions made to uh, retrofitting or repairing the facade in order to incorporate new veneer ties throughout the facade. Uh, these terms and these repair methodologies are more frequently seen in modern day uh, cavity wall assemblies uh, based on our observations of existing probes, existing units, um, jam conditions of the existing stone. The depth of existing stone units uh, varies significantly. Um, there's uh, units of four, five, six, seven, eight inches deep uh, that are tied together with the backup masonry uh, to, to create a, an engaged and knitted mass masonry system, um, thus not requiring the types of ties and veneer anchorage for uh, lateral movement that you see in some modern systems. Um, that being said, there are notable inconsistencies throughout some of these facade claims, both in the extent of necessary brownstone replacement, full unit replacement, uh, repairs, and uh, supporting of the system. Um, I believe that is everything. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, and Gregor. Before we go on, I do want to just note that we did allow the pre three prior speakers uh, extended time because of the technical nature of their testimony. Um, but going forward, again, we do ask others to respect and stay within the three minutes. Uh, but that testimony was important, and that's why we extended that additional time. Okay, Gregory. Okay. Thank you so much. And next up, we will be hearing from Derek McQueen. Derek McQueen, if you are with us, please raise your hand. Okay, so I'll be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your time. I'm the Reverend Dr. Derek McQueen, um, and I am a Presbyterian pastor in the Presbytery of New York City. And I will tell you that I speak from my conscience and dissent and um, I'm asking for the denial of the hardship um, designation of West Park's Presbyterian Church from the Presbytery of New York City. It's a difficult position for me, as you can imagine, 
where I find myself as a pastor of a church in a landmark district under the leadership of the Presbytery. However, I am fully aware of all of our policies and procedures of the denomination, and it is my right to speak in a minority voice as well. And I've also served as, as leadership within our Presbytery and also served um, for two years as a, a National Historic Preservation Fellow. So I have a little bit of information and idea about the power of landmarking. I understand and I would like to address um, one of the ideas about the purpose of, of the building being able to be maintained. It should be noted that um, I'm on the board of West of the West Park Center as well, the center at West Park, as well as um, our two members of the, of the church at West Park Presbyterian Church who have okayed and who have signed on for the Ghanaian congregation to be in that, in that worship space, to have their worship every single Sunday to services with Bible studies and um, events going on for their young people. So it is a, not just a worshiping congregation, it is a thriving congregation, um, and it is an opportunity to provide uh, culture and intercultural and interdenominational worship and the connectional church and live into the, our denominational um, our denominational's um, way of being. We call ourselves the, the connectional church. I would also like to speak to the fact that um, the idea of this particular church. Churches in the Presbyterian denomination in this particular time period were built on the corners so that they would be open and accessible to all persons. The church itself is an, built as an upside down ship to hold all the troubles and hold all the, all the passions of the people to come together as community. That building is still serving that purpose. It's doing social justice work. The arts that are there are not just fancy artistic works that, uh, that are being done. They're arts that are really expressing the issues of the day, the social justice issues. And it is serving the purpose that mainline denominations um, um, although they are faltering now in their membership, they're faltering mostly because of some of these issues of not expanding and opening ideas to our ministry. West Park Presbyterian Church did that um, when it decided that it wanted to move forward in this position. And I believe also, I'll just finally say that this idea of um, the building falling into neglect, um, the Presbytery has a lot of churches. And this, pres and this precedent of, of having a hardship and declaring our churches in hardship is, um, is a dangerous one. It's a dangerous one not to be looked at, not to be assessed, and not to be seen as something that could actually be replicated throughout a few of the other churches and many of the other churches in our Presbyterian church, and mainly the churches of color. And I just, that is all I would like to share with you. And I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your hard work and your consideration. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we have Mark Ruffalo signed up. So Mark Ruffalo, if you're with us, please raise your hand. Okay, and I'll be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Yes, hi, Mark Ruffalo here. Um, just quickly, I uh, I want to pause my time because um, of, a, of a, a video that an artist made that can't be here to testify. So quickly, it's it's very quick. So peace. I'm common, and I stand here in opposition of the tearing down of the Presbyterian West Park Church. The Presbyterian West Park Church has been a civil rights landmark. It has served our communities in so many ways, brought people together, brought people together in love and unity and creativity. Um, and I really hope that we honor this place, that we recognize the value of it and make sure that it stands because I plan to perform there. So many artists plan to perform there and we can do so many good things to bring people together and unify our communities in ways that's greater than we even fathom. So I ask that you all make sure that we keep the Presbyterian West Park Church standing in our togetherness and in our love. God bless. So I think that's germane to um, some of the questions here about raising the money, about uh, is it possible for this venue to do one of its intended purposes, which was to praise, have spiritual praise and have congregations there and also to raise money for the church through the arts both of these things are possible now this is 
it's kind of outrageous to be sitting here and seeing there's, there's two there's two parties here that deserve to be heard from equally. And I was there the day when Mark Silberman took the LPC commissioners and segregated them as a agent to the buyer, to the applicant, and would not let the other side who has a equal amount of shareholder right in this discussion because they are a leaseholder. He, standing there as a, someone who knew nothing about this, I would have said that he was an agent of the applicant. And that was outrageous. Then I find out that Kramer Levin is actually um, representing the church as well as a seller. Now that's a conflict of interest, but I was told that these two, that the two teams are being kept separate from one another. But I saw a series of emails from, from, the, um, from Preservation West that showed them working in collusion with each other on this issue. So now we're sitting here and we're listening to an engineer that was hired by them. We're listening to people who do uh, re restoration work that was hired by them, but we're only giving moments of time, even five minutes if you're, if you're saying that. That's nothing compared to the time that Mark Silverman was spending with the LPC members and this applicant's engineers and facade repair people. It's not fair. And you know what this is? This is about money. This is about who has the money and who doesn't. It's about the people versus the corporations in this city and what is happening to the culture, to the history, to what's valuable about this city. Because we, the people, don't have the resources that Ken Horn and his $4 billion company have. And it's an outrage, it's absolutely outrageous that we're sitting here giving only three minutes of time when this is a, these are two parties that, are, that have equal amounts of care about this issue. And they should be given equal amounts of time. And this, this whole process should be opened up in an entirely different way. That's all I have to say. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you being here. But there is something terribly unfair happening. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up is Jason Zakai. So Jason Zakai, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Jason Zakai, are you with us? I'm with you. Can you see me and hear me? Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Jason Zakai. I'm an attorney from Hiller PC. Uh, we represent the center at West Park and its opposition to the hard hardship application. So this application should be denied for multiple reasons, although I'll only have time to discuss just a few of those in my uh, remarks today. One reason is that the landmark building continues to be functional for church use today. It is used for, among other things, weekly Bible study and Sunday services, as well as many community programs. A second reason for denial is that the applicant cannot meet the re requirement of establishing an immediate plan to demolish the landmark building and construct a new building. I'd like to bring to the commissioner's attention a law review article in the Columbia Journal of Envi Environmental Law, which discusses that in 1978, this commission denied a hardship application uh, for Radio City Music Hall precisely on that basis, because the applicant there did not have immediate plans to demolish the building. Here, as with Radio City, the applicant has not provided the commission with the immediate plan to demolish the landmark building because one, there is an existing five-year lease under which the center at West Park is an active tenant. 
And two, the applicant needs the permission of the Supreme Court of New York or the Attorney General, which it has not yet either sought or received. So in both this case and Radio City, there are contingencies that prevent the applicant from fulfilling the legal requirement to present an immediate plan to demolish the landmark upon approval of the commission. A third reason is that if there is any hardship at all, and there really isn't, such hardship could only be described as self-imposed. And we refer the commission to its decision in matter of Stahl York Avenue from 2014, where the applicant's self-imposed hardship contributed to this commission's decision to deny the hardship application. Here, the commission has asked the, the applicant, what efforts has it made to sell a lease the church, including to other congregations? The applicant admits that several years ago, the Muslim Religious and Cultural Center expressed a desire to purchase the landmark building, but the church was not interested. Last year, the center at West Park made an offer to purchase a landmark building, but the, as the applicant admits, it did not even consider the offer. The applicant has also failed to maintain the landmark building as it is required to do. As the engineering firm WAG, WJE excuse me, has explained in its expert report, the landmark building is subject to the DOB's FISP, uh, Facade Ins Inspection Safety Program. These requirements include close-up exam examination and reporting every five years. However, there have been no such reports by the applicant for over 16 years. Uh, had the applicant made more regularly inspected and, and uh, inspections and made, maintained the facade in accordance with DOB code requirements, it would have been in far better condition. In addition, the applicant does not adequately address the commission's questions about its efforts to obtain loans or grants from the National Presbyterian Church USA, which has about $760 million in cash assets. The applicant uh, Jason, does not I'm terribly sorry. If you could please uh, summarize your statement, you're over time. Sure, I'll just finish up. The applicant has not stated whether it's recently applied for additional loans or grants from the Presbyterian USA. And so for these reasons and the additional reasons in our written submissions to the commission, uh, the hardship application should be denied. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Pat O'Connell. And just a reminder, if you would like to speak with us, please click the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen. So I know that you are with us and would like to speak. So Pat O'Connell, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Yes, hi, thank you very much. I'm Pat O'Connell. Uh, for six years, I served as a secretary for the Central West Park. <clears throat> so I'm intimately involved with the fundraising efforts and the operation of the center. Um, so I, I'm, I'm shocked at a lot of what I've heard today as uh, supposition, acquisition from people who don't actually know the facts. So my concern is one of safety. And what my concern is, and, and for the record, I'm supporting the hardship application. My concern is that nobody is going to have the money to do the work, whether it's 8 million or whether it's 60 million. And the state of the building, as I live in the neighborhood, continues to deteriorate. So I think it's up to the LPC. I'm looking to the city now, not to West Park, not to the center, not to Gail Brewer, but to the city uh, to see what you can do to make sure uh, that your evaluation is accurate so that the costs of safety, uh, restoration, if it has to be done to the landmark statutes, um, who's gonna provide that money? And so that's all I wanna say. And again, thank you for your attention. And I I'd ask people to just think about the facts and not the accusations and suppositions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Marsha Flowers. So Marsha Flowers, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Marcia Flowers, are you with us? Hello, hello. Okay, here I am. Yeah, I have I've been a member of West Park Presbyterian Church for 30 years. The arguments for granting hardship waiver to West Park, you have heard many times. They have not changed no matter how often we are asked to submit them. Here they are again. 20 years, West Park has tried to find a solution for a deteriorating building. 
Gail Brewer, who said so today, who is perhaps the most effective legislator in the city in her 2010 press release after landmarking stated, with this building as a landmark, I will work to raise the necessary funds to restore the building. Assured commissioners confidently landmarked West Park over the objections of the congregation and its leadership. The building was landmarked. No funds have materialized. For the past 13 years, the congregation has spent time and money trying to keep the building safe and usable. As the owners of the building, we are responsible for its safety. These efforts have cost us our membership, our pastoral support, have taken away from what we could have done as a church for all the mission work that West Park has historically been noted for. Our focus has had to be on keeping the building up and has left us with debt. We made a very hard decision to sell the building, which has further encumbered us with shredded relationships, many of which you have heard here today, and subjected us to bullying, false accusations of neglect and greed, name calling, and most of all, a delayed resolution to this situation. This property can once more serve the community as it has for the past 130 years. But by releasing the value that is now entombed in this deteriorating structure, funds from the sale of this building have been committed to restoring the congregation's mission and to supporting much needed social justice works throughout the New York City Presbytery. A new structure on the side of 86th and Amsterdam would contain space for a restored church and space to house activities that the community will participate in. Sometime this afternoon, I have felt like we're not talking about the same building. But most of all, I have to ask, after 20 years, after 13 years of landmarking, where is the money? It has just not been forthcoming. And I don't know why we would have confidence today to say that it will come if it hasn't come in the past 13 years. Marcia, the, I'm terribly sorry. If you could please wrap up your testimony. Okay, I certainly will. I thank, I thank those who have come here to acknowledge our struggle and to support us in this application. Members of the Presbytery, our congregation, other churches in the community. And thank you for to the Landmarks Commission for its patience and its timely consideration. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up on our list is Dion Thompson. Dion Thompson, if you are with us, please raise your hand. Okay, and I will promote you to panelist right now. Okay, so if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, Dion Thompson, are you with us? Hmm. Do you not see him? Yes. Hello, Dion Thompson. All right. We may have to move on if we cannot get. You Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that uh, computer delay there. Uh, yeah, oh, no good problem. afternoon, and uh, thank you for your time and concern. Um, uh, my name is Dion Thompson. I am um, an elder of the West Park Presbyterian Congregation of the Church in Question, um, and also have been affiliated with the church well over uh, 10 years Um um, I just wanted to say that uh, it's, it's, it's been a, a more than a pleasure to, to be a part of the 
the uh, the congregation and um, that uh, it's it's not the place or the space. It's the people that have always made the 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 the, the structure, the building, the 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 uh, you know. I, I'm I'm not only proud of what we stand for, but who we stand with. I mean, we we there there's been social changes. If the walls could talk, I mean. Um, there's always been a plethora of arts and and uh, uh, um, uh, innovations, but but the thing is, it's the people, it's the energy, it's the uh, uh, the community, it's the you know um, a, a lot of people always been talking up recently about oh you know yeah let's let's uh, uh, put in to save the uh, church, but no one's actually put up. There's a lot of talk, and uh, you know it's it's been a struggle. There is a lot of uh, safety concerns. There's been a, a scaffolding for for over uh, you know couple decades one had had to be torn down because it went out of uh, uh, uh the uh the new new um uh, uh, new, new compliance and uh, regulations, but also to say that uh, the the former one um, uh, had actually uh, broken out during the, one of the storms and and luckily didn't hit any cars or people. I mean, there's been a lot of accidents that I think uh, uh, have been you know near misses, and and God forbid something does happen. There there are a lot of safety issues. There's been a lot of concerns with the with the uh, with the floods, with the leaks that you know we're putting out for for, for with the mold. With the, I mean, so many concerns and 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 people want to look at oh yeah yeah well it's the arts well arts will always exist. So we love the arts. I, and matter of fact. I, I've been um, uh, um, uh, serving as a form of ministry uh, uh, with an open mic in the chapel for over a decade. And with that, it's bringing in a community. Uh, unlike a lot of the other events, so there, it's open to everyone. There's no charge. We, you know, we offer food, we offer place, we offer uh, 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 the, the energy, the power, the action, the, the ability for people to, 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 to know and grow on, on what we, you know, what we have and who we are. Um, it's only it's only just a a, 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 a a taste of the magnitude that that everyone has within them, and and you know I, I'm totally supportive of the 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 center and the uh, their arts program. I mean they're originally designed uh, in in conjunction with the uh, with with the church to. Uh, to fundraise, but they they never did any real capital fundraising to speak of. Um, um, uh, mainly, you know, focused on their own itinerary of getting five hundred one and 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 promoting their their stuff. And they're they're supposed to be stewards of the building. I mean, uh, and now now that we we've actually uh, 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 Dion, I'm terribly sorry. If you could please wrap up your testimony, you're over time. Time. Okay, I, I'm just saying that I am in support of your your favor to uh, to uh, the landmark, and and it does come with a heavy heart because because uh, the the building is special, but it's the people that are more special. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Jamel Martin from Municipal Art Society. So Jamel, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jamel Martin, and I'm a Minipace Fellow for Land Use Law at the Municipal Arts Society. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, MAS is extremely concerned with the citywide precedent that this hardship application could set for Landmarks Law and other houses of worship throughout New York City. And MAS strongly encourages LPC to reject the hardship application for West Park Presbyterian Church. There are numerous options as we heard today available to preserve this building. And a claim for reasonable return is not applicable for this application. Uh, West Park Administrative Commission is requesting the hardship application due to the property's inability to generate a reasonable return. And charities, nonprofit organizations, unlike commercial property owners, generally are not eligible for hardship exemptions or claim for reasonable property returns. Instead, nonprofits must meet the charitable purpose test and hardship may be granted if the landmark designation interferes with that charitable mission. Uh, the applicant updated his application with the cost of a full restoration rehabilitation of the landmark structure. And MAS believes that a better approach would be to implement a phased restoration plan over several years, which could help preserve the property structure and continues to carry out its charitable mission by serving nonprofit organizations at the center of West Park and working with uh, parishioners like the Lighthouse Congregation that uses uh, the structure. 
While MAS recognizes the financial difficulties of the door dealing congregation to maintain the landmark and to address the building's many violations, this application ignores extensive New York State case law as the church is not a commercial entity, and so nonprofit organizations are not entitled to demolish a landmark for the highest return of the property per se. And West Park Presbyterian Church, excuse me, is situated in one of the best locations in the city to to find alternative uses that could lift the financial burden and command a higher return for adaptive reuse. Uh, West, Park West Park Presbyterian Church embodies a rich cultural and architectural heritage of the Upper West Side, and MAS uh, supports preserving this building for future generations to treasure. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of MAS this afternoon. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, on our list is Colleen Hemeyer. So Colleen Hemeyer, if you could please raise your hand so I know you're with us. Thank you so much. I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I am Colleen Hemeyer, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. We are dismayed that the rich history of West Park Presbyterian now, now includes this application for demolition on the basis of hardship. We were supportive of the Commission's designation of this important church in 2011. The Conservancy has made numerous attempts to assist in the preservation of this building from multiple referrals, reports, and repair grants to drafting a National Register nomination to facilitate state restoration funding for which owner consent was withheld. Watching the building to continue to deteriorate has been painful and frustrating. We would like to take this opportunity to remind the commissioners that the landmarks law defines hardship as a situation where designation prevents a property owner from realizing a reasonable return on a building or a situation in which an owner can no longer use the building for their purposes. But this church is currently being used for religious and community purposes. A property not achieving its highest and best use is not hardship. Not being able to do a pristine restoration project all at one time is not hardship. Consciously allowing a building to deteriorate is not hardship. It is demolition by neglect. The church's current state is a result of mismanagement, spurned offers of assistance, and rejected opportunities. We have carefully reviewed the applicant's most recent response to the commission's questions and found a narrative wherein perfect is the enemy of good. We find the applicant's arguments are not realistic and we disagree on many points. Most importantly, we disagree with the assertion that the building must be completely restored at one time. Large restoration projects are routinely ex executed in phases. We also question if all of the work mentioned in the applicant's response is necessary when much of it seems cosmetic or even excessive. Broadly, our concerns are as follows. The applicant's response lists many potential sale and leasing deals for the church that fell through, but it does not prove that the building's landmark status was the cause when other outside forces may have, may have been at play. Similarly, the applicant does not prove that the congregation dwindled in size due to physical issues at the building. Composite patching and cast stone replacement are viable options for the restoration of the church's facade. The commissioner should be provided with the NDE reports. The outer walls of the church are thick and not showing evidence that the masonry anchors are causing problems. The stained glass windows could be restored in phases. We have detailed rebuttals to the applicant's claim in our written testimony, which we hope you will take the time to read. In summation, we feel that this report is exaggerated to prove the applicant's case, while our long history with religious institutions shows us that phase work at a lesser total cost is doable. Here, the building's current condition is self-imposed by the applicant. The West Park Presbyterian Church should not be granted hardship. Thank you for the opportunity to share the Conservancy's views. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. As with HDC's previous testimony regarding the West Park Presbyterian Church hardship in 2021, we remain opposed to this application. One of the two arguments the applicant makes continues to be focused on the ability to make a reasonable return on investment. Both the hardship provision and the case law support the fact that the reasonable return test does not apply to charities, but, ra but rather to the ability of the charity to carry out its mission. The updated materials provided by the applicant do not provide any additional justification for using the reasonable return argument and, in fact, seem to mostly consist of additional studies on neighborhood context and condition assessments. The applicant's proposal to demolish a nonprofit owned landmark to build luxury condos continues not to meet the charitable purpose test. And as we've stated previously, nothing in the materials references established case law, including the state's highest court, the New York State Court of Appeals, which has opined that a request to demolish a landmark will be denied when the applicant is trying to claim best use of its property, and the applicant does not, instead, meet the charitable purpose test. This is settled law in the state of New York. HGC also continues to have serious concerns about the applicant's premise that the building cannot serve the current char charitable purpose of the congregation. We know that the building is in active use by multiple parties, from the tenant, the center at West Park, and Lighthouse, a separate congregation. If all of these parties are using it and others have expressed interest in using the space and indeed possibly purchasing the building, then how can it not be serving its purpose? The applicant has not fulfilled its claim that it needs to replace the church immediately to fulfill its charitable mission. While it is clear that this building needs work, the applicant has not demonstrated that analysis of the condition of the building has been fully explored, nor that the entire structure needs to be rehabilitated all at once to become a more useful site. The applicant's concern that any change in dominant use or occupancy of the building would require the issuance of a certificate of occupancy is not valid and would be borne by a new owner if the use changed and would not be necessary if it remained a religious site. If a hardship is granted, the precedent here could be truly destructive regarding religious institutions across the city, some of whom would use the precedent to seek a reasonable return for their landmark properties and demolish irreplaceable buildings for the highest and best use. HTC strongly supports the need for more incentives and technical assistance for congregations as some of them continue to dwindle in size and resources. Some possibilities include increasing the receiving area for air rights for religious sites and incentives to help adaptively reuse these spaces, but that is not the issue before us today. The only issue is if the applicant has met the charitable purpose hardship provision and the answer remains no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up on our list is Warren McNeil. Warren McNeil, if you're with us, please raise your hand. Oh, okay, I see. So Warren McNeil, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, Warren McNeil, are you with us? I believe Warren McNeil is yes, already Yes, I am with you, but I spoke earlier. I have no idea why I'm up again. Oh, I'm terribly sorry about that. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yes, next up will be Barrett Colmer Colmarirov. So, Barrett, if you are with us, please raise your hand now. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Hello. Um, good afternoon, uh, commissioners. My name is Barak Kolmaimirov, and I am. Um, uh, I have been a session member of West Park Presbyterian Church since um, 2015. Uh, my active church experience has taken place in organizing and promoting various church arts programs, such as uh, <clears throat> organizing and curating visual art exhibitions, music events, and West Park International Music Festival in 2016, 2018, 2019, 2021, and 2022. 
I love church activities and <clears throat> also I love um, our beautiful building, but I'm afraid that the very old and weak structure of the church building may um, one day collapse. I am aware uh, that a recent uh, building construction investigation report say uh, that the roof beam has come off, come off the wall for uh, four, six inches on the both sides and is in uh, a dangerous state. This means that the roof can collapse at any moment and kills all the people inside the building. Uh, I hope uh, we understand that uh, the building needs to be rebuilt and make um, the whole new com community of the church area very soon. And I have a brand new building and a good facilities uh, to restore church life in uh, West Park Presbyterian Church. It seems to me that all the people who are um, fighting for the um, preservation of our historical building do not understand that it is impossible to find a, such a huge amount for the repairing on the building and uh, reconstruction. Um, to, to, to change the entire a lot hearing structure of the building means rebuild uh, the entire building. So uh, wouldn't be better to build a completely new building and start a new religious and cultural life in West Park Presbyterian Church. Please give us the chance um, for us to get a new space in the new building. Thank you very much to Roger Leaf and Alchemy team for helping us. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we're gonna call in Stephen Phelps. Okay, I think I'm here. Hang on just a second. Thank you, commissioners, for your attention. My name is Reverend Stephen Phelps. I live on West 81st Street, a few blocks from West Park Presbyterian Church. I'm a retired Presbyterian minister and the former interim senior minister of the Riverside Church in New York City. Back in 1994, I was a candidate to become the next pastor at West Park Church, and I was excited about the possibilities on the Upper West Side. I toured the facility. I saw giant holes in the sanctuary ceiling and signs of terrible water damage everywhere. Back home, my mentor advised me to withdraw my candidacy from West Park Church. That church will damage your career, Steve, he said. The big endowment is almost gone and the building is starting to fall apart. Now that was 30 years ago, I pulled out. The late Reverend Bob Brashear, my dear friend, took on the giant task of building a congregation at West Park. But the people of the Upper West Side, as in cities everywhere across the West, have mostly lost interest in organized religion. Now, that's not a criticism. That's just a fact. In the last 20 years, median Sunday attendance at U.S. churches has dropped from 135 people to 65 people. Thousands of churches are closing every year. It is not the fault of the pastors that this happens. It's not the fault of the people. It's an unstoppable cultural transformation of world historical dimensions, and it has consequences. Small congregations have little money and big buildings falling down all around them. Far from abandoning their building, West Park has borrowed tens of thousands of dollars, some personal dollars in, all, in just recent years for repairs and insurance. 
you know, even my former church, the Riverside Church, could not worship in that great cathedral of town except for rent payments coming in at several million dollars per year. West Park has zero potential for big income from this building like that. None of the opponents of this hardship application have any ideas about where the big money will come from. That church at 86th and Amsterdam is going to fall down. It is a danger to everyone. The 2010 landmarking of West Park Church destroyed that congregation's ability to freely exercise their religion. I know, as a friend and colleague, I walked with Reverend Bob Bouchier through the slow motion disaster created by landmark status. They used to be almost 300 when I nearly applied. Now they're 10 or 20 or something like that. I heard actor Wendell Pierce on the news claiming that this appeal for a hardship waiver is just rich men manipulating city regs for profit. He couldn't be more wrong. This hardship waiver is sought by a small congregation in order to exercise their First Amendment right to worship freely. They are not rich. They have no tens of millions to restore the building. No manipulation here. The church is up against the wall. The wall is collapsing. If elected leaders and commissioners care about the quality of the neighborhoods of the Upper West Side, this once glorious but dangerously damaged sandstone building must come down. You can't get blood out of sandstone. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, next, we're going to call uh, Sean Corsandi. He will be followed by Megan Fitzpatrick. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Sean Corsandi on behalf of Landmark West. I will share some of our comments, and my colleague Megan Fitzpatrick will continue them in her turn. A full statement has been submitted for record. Before I begin, I would like to briefly lament the fact that this is held on Zoom. For all the failings of the municipal building's ninth floor hearing room, from its uncanny ability to simultaneously overheat while freezing the public, to broken chairs and inaudible discussion, it allows the presence of community that can be felt when assembled en masse. It was present on Saturday at West Park and has been present in the stream of emails and phone calls from incredulous residents who repeatedly ask me, quote, what does it mean to be a landmark if a developer can tear it down? It's a question many of us have been asking ourselves. And as we heard from Council Member Brewer, this applicant has not demonstrated their hardship. The question of capable, re reasonable return, they've raised 86.7% of the estimated value of this church in less than a year. It's still being used as a church, and as noted through the lease, there's nothing immediate about this application. To be abundantly clear, Landmark West is vehemently opposed to the exploitation of the Landmarks Law and the underlying premise of this hardship application. In reality, we're here today because a dozen congregants have lost their faith in their building. They hope to trade in 134 years of legacy and tax-free existence to, so a developer can build yet more market-rate luxury residences in America's second densest residential neighborhood. While the prior testimony has previously proudly mentioned that some of these funds will be used to serve soup to those in need in outer boroughs, it will literally leave this community with a void. Nonprofits who enjoy decades of benefits at the cost of communities should not be rewarded for their refusal to follow the law. Again, we find it necessary to restate that when a property is designated as an individual landmark, specific legal obligations arise for both the owner of the property and the LPC. These obligations are not mysterious nor hidden. They're established in Chapter 3 of the Administrative Code, in which the LPC is tasked with the preservation, protection, and maintenance of designated properties as its legislative mandate. Eliminating this landmark runs counter to your mandate. The public sits here with secondhand embarrassment for you, the Commission, having to address an applicant who simultaneously hasn't done its own job yet publicly insists also that you are doing yours wrong. And we're wrong in designating their building in the first place. It's insulting and it's not right. This application second guesses your commission's decision-making and asks you to reconsider the grounds on which you're established upon, effectively to turn a blind eye to what's right for the cultural landscape and the city in favor of for-profit development. But this application goes even further. It questions the judgment of the DOT and the DOB, both tasked with public safety, neither of whom has initiated cease and desist demands or orders to vacate because the landmark applicant refuses to maintain it anywhere nearly to maintain it. 
the condition is nowhere near as precarious as they would have us believe. As noted, we are here because a dozen remaining congregants have lost their faith in a building. We continually remind the community to have faith in the process and insist that the dozen of you have not lost faith in landmarks, that you value landmarks, and that you will do the right thing so the community doesn't lose faith in landmarks either. In the words of John Stewart, quote, if you don't stick to your values when they're being tested, they're not values, they're hobbies. We must take this affront seriously. Deny the request of these dozen congregants to bury their lack of faith in rubble, stand for landmarks. Deny the hardship, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Megan Fitzpatrick. Megan Fitzpatrick. Okay, Megan Fitzpatrick, if you could unmute yourself, please. Hello, commissioners, Megan Fitzpatrick speaking on behalf of Landmark West. We stand here almost a year to the day later discussing West Park once again with very little change in our situation or our stance. Landmark West urges the Landmarks Preservation Commission to stand with Landmarks and reject the hardship request to demolish the individually landmarked West Park Presbyterian Church. Religious properties have inherent value, representing significant periods of the city's history, from architecture to their social and cultural impact on society. The city recognizes this church as one of the best examples of a Romanesque revival style religious building and how it served more than just its congregation. Being the site of the city's first same-sex union, the cradle for God's love we deliver and the proving ground for Joe Papp's Shakespeare Festival. Today it continues to serve diverse groups and foster the arts. Repeated closures of places of worship, something that is all too common in this city, are contributing to a loss in our cultural landscape. If this hardship is granted, it sets a dangerous precedent, sealing the fate of historic religious properties with failing congregations across New York City, effectively showing them if they shirk their responsibilities as stewards and secure a shovel-ready developer that any religious landmark is fungible. Denying the applicant's proposal will make it clear that demolition by neglect will not be permitted. A significant weakness in the applicant's argument for demolition is the unlikely possibility for the church to receive a reasonable return. Unlike developers, nonprofits, especially religious charities, do not have the right to seek profit. Secondly, the applicant proposes that the building as it stands is not appropriate for its intended use. This is clearly not true because in addition to its many roles as a community nexus, the structure is currently serving as a sanctuary for the Lighthouse Chapel, a separate religious congregation. If the building is deemed so hazardous, why are there two congregations and an arts and theatre group currently occupying the space? This community has proven that there is still life for this building. There are many options between outright neglect of a community asset and more luxury apartments. To see this building that has been so embedded in the community be turned into luxury apartments for developer profits stands against everything the city proposes to represent in 2023. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee vehemently opposes rewarding demolition by neglect and a developer-imposed hardship. Do not help set a precedent that will doom many of our beloved landmarks to mere dust. Instead, reaffirm that the community has rights, landmarks have meaning, and owners have obligations to protect the landmarks under their care. Reject this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Josette Amato. And I want to again remind everybody, um, please do raise your virtual hand if you would like to speak, even if you've signed up. Um, Josette Amato will be followed by um, Nathan um, Gabert. Gebert. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Josette Amato, West End Preservation Society. We thank you for the opportunity to comment on this historic property once again. The developers, through the congregation, make a compelling argument for why this relic should come down. No mention in any of the data or spreadsheets of the gloriousness of the architecture or the heritage of more than a century standing guard on a corner in New York City as the world changed around it. 
we are at a disadvantage here. Had we the money, perhaps we could have hired lawyers or engineers who might have told a more sympathetic story regarding the restoration of this wonderful structure. The heart of the matter always does come down to money, though, doesn't it? Who has it? Who's willing to use it? And for what purpose? The applicants have some of those people on call waiting to exact a profit. If this building can no longer serve as a spiritual center, as we are being led to believe, can it not be of use to the community in any other way? Imagination and money, that's what we need. And once more, we are bereft. We want to be grateful that we have agents of the city to oversee this process, agents to stand in the way of destruction, not enable it. We need to come up with a solid plan to help the congregants off this path so that everyone walks away with something. A restored church can remain and the congregation gets to move on from what we are hearing, the burden of this building. If that sounds like a big ask, this is the Landmarks Preservation Commission. It should not be the Landmarks as long as it doesn't cost too much to keep. We turn to you to save this piece of history because it should be saved. It needs to be saved. And you are the only people with the power to save it. Thank you for your time. Hey, thank you. Um, next, Nathan um, Giebert. Who, and Nathan will be followed by Miriam Shelton. Please do raise your virtual hand. Hey, Nathan Hubert, we just need you to unmute yourself and turn on your video if you choose and state your name. For the <laughs> Still not used to this. My name's Nathan Gebert. Um, and um, I, I speak for myself as a resident of the Upper West Side. Uh, I am, of course, grateful uh, to the commissioners for your important uh, public service. I was impressed by the strong presentations on the merits of the application, and I support it. I'd like to make two points. First, New York has a, a housing crisis. My strong belief, well supported by everything from market economics to common sense, as well as my own experience working in a modest role with affordable housing, is that building housing is the best solution to the crisis. Even building so-called luxury housing relieves pressure on all other types of housing. This is one reason I support the application from the West Park Church. Just in case you think me a hypocritical NIMBY, West, West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing made a redevelopment of the old parking garages on 108th Street. And that had a significant negative uh, impact on my apartment. I knew we would endure noisy years long period of construction, a few dozen feet from my apartment. And once completed, we would be deprived of all direct sunlight in winter. I nonetheless enthusiastically testified publicly in support of the project multiple times because it created badly needed housing. The other reason I support the hardship application concerns the intersection of the spiritual and the political. I am not a congregant of West Park Presbyterian, but I am a member of the Congregation of St. Savior at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and, full disclosure, a veteran of that landmark application. Both faith and church participation are important to me. Even if this were not so, I have a passionate conviction that spiritual communities must be given wide latitude to make decisions about the stewardship of their resources. Only they can know how best to fulfill their mission. Depriving of them, them of that right is actually a grave injury the to the traditions of tolerance and diversity for which New York has been justly and proudly known for centuries. An adverse decision would erode my sense of pride in that tradition and actually make me question our city's commitment to its purported values. While not strictly analogous, I remember feeling profound disappointment when the opponents of the downtown Islamic center used every political and administrative tool they could 
to prevent its opening. In this case, um, while I believe it is unintentional, uh, what we are seeing here uh, amounts to a kind of stealth taking and a violation of fundamental rights. So I ask in all humility- three minutes, could you please wrap I, up? One last sentence. So I ask in all humility that you weigh carefully how your decision may bring support or harm to a realm once ineffable, at once ineffable and also essential like no other. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Miriam Shelton. And followed by that, um, Russ Jennings, if you'd like to speak, please raise your virtual hand and I will call on you next. Do I have the floor? You do, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Okay, my name is Miriam Shelton. I'm a member of the Presbytery of New York City, though not of West Park Presbyterian Church itself. I live on the Upper West Side and I have visited uh, West Park Presbyterian Church on many occasions since I moved to New York in the 1990s. I support the hardship application. My argument concerns mainly the second question of whether the building can support the intended use of West Park Presbyterian Church. West Park is a church, specifically a progressive church that for a long time has pushed the bounds of church ministry. You know this, everybody knows this. It has been cited today as a reason not uh, to deny the hardship application. The center is not a church. so. The fact that they claim that they their work could be done effectively without any change to the building is irrelevant. Dr. McQueen claims that it's good enough, but Dr. Queen, very uh, progressive uh, preacher that he is, his mo most of his activity is done outside of his church building, not in in it. Uh, there. A church webpage doesn't claim any kind of ministry similar to what West Park wants to do. The point isn't whether somebody could walk inside that building and pray. Of course they can. The point isn't whether a homeless Ghanaian congregation might be relieved that because the building is in such bad shape, they get to have a sanctuary at low rent. That's irrelevant to the question of hardship. The question for the Landmark Commission is whether the religious and charitable mission of West Park Presbyterian Church is permissible in this space, given the, the cost of maintaining its landmarks status and preserving the building itself. Um, I'd like to um, say that the opposition treats West Park the Presbytery of New York City and the Presbyterian Church USA as though they were wealthy entities. Excuse me for saying this, but I believe that one would have to be blind, deaf, and willfully ignorant to believe any of those three entities is wealthy at this point in history, as other people have said. Uh, the Presbyterian Church across the country has been declining, people have been laid off, the Presbytery has uh, a bare bones staff that can't do its own work. Uh, these are not wealthy entities that could just step in and pour in $50 million uh, to save one landmark building, not for its mission, but for its landmark status. Uh, so uh, I'd like to end by saying that West Park has also always taken the side of the poor, the, the homeless, the forgotten, the the ones that have been trampled down, and it it, it or it's the wealth of what West Park Presbytery is that should uh, des deserves to have a building adequate to it, um, and not have to uh, uh, dodge uh, pieces of plaster and uh, all falling down on them. I uh, finally. I People have okay, you've said, gone over your three minutes, so please do wrap up. Okay. Uh, people have said that we should fear a precedent, setting a precedent. I want to say the Landmark Commission should not fear setting a precedent when there really is a hardship. 
And this church does indeed have a hardship maintaining its landmark status. Please accept its application. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Russ Jennings, I'm just going to allow you to speak. Did you want to testify um, as you've signed up? Okay, I don't think he is here. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to Simeon Bankoff, who will be followed by Paige Cowley. Hey, Lisa, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Excellent. Okay. Yeah, okay. my camera seems something weird. Okay. Uh, let me, sorry, just get my testimony in front of me. Shoot. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Simeon Bankoff, a professional preservationist acting as a consultant for the center for the center at West Park. I urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to soundly reject this hardship application. The commissioners are well aware of all the facts based arguments why this proposal must be denied, which in the interest of time, I shall not repeat. Instead, let me use this time to stress one specific element of the proposal. As a not-for-profit institution, the current owners of the building, the New York Presbytery, operate under privileged conditions which the prospective owners, Alchemy Properties, do not. As a condition of that privilege, the Presbytery abides by a different set of standards and rules that Alchemy does not. The Presbytery must show their charitable purpose cannot be fulfilled within the landmark structure, as mentioned by the earlier speaker. The building is currently used as a worship center, which is aligned with the Presbytery's charitable purpose. The Presbytery's purpose is not to wring value out of its properties. Using the standard of reasonable return based on the stall decision is to allow this hard to allow this hardship is inappropriate and improper. It must not be allowed, and this theoretical framework must be strongly rejected. If permitted, this hardship will set a damaging precedent for not-for-profit institutions being permitted to monetize their landmark holdings. New York City has already seen all manner of inappropriate institutional expansions, which have demolished or altered protected historic buildings beyond recognition. But at least those examples were the fig leaf of the inability to fulfill a charitable purpose. This is a crash, crass, cash grab, and if allowed, will paint a path for others to follow. Imagine all the cash-strapped churches, schools, and museums with landmark buildings in desirable locations throughout the city. Do you think they're not paying attention to this? You know our friends in the real estate industry are. If the Landmarks Preservation Commission permits the demolition of West Tr the West Park Church building for monetary gain, how will the agency de deny the next application based on the same premise or the one after that? Please prevent the this destruction and save not only West Park, all the landmarks which might otherwise fall because of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I don't actually see Paige Kelly here. So next I'm going to call um, Village Preservation, Shannon Smiley. Uh, good day, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Shannon Smiley, and I represent Village Preservation. Village Preservation remains opposed to this application as stated in our previous testimony on June 14th, 2022. Based on the information made available at this time, the application continues to fall short of proving the case that, one, the building cannot serve its intended charitable purpose, and there is no viable alternative to demolition. We previously asserted that even if complete restoration and adaptive reuse is found to be financially infeasible here, options involving preservation of the most significant parts of the building with the minimum amount of new construction necessary to fund it can and should be thoroughly explored. The updated materials provided by the applicant have not served to convince us otherwise. Among the proposal's shortcomings, it is impossible to come to a clear decision about the true costs and feasibility of the project without an unbiased outside analysis of the property condition, stabilization, and restoration cost, as well as possibilities for development and other forms of revenue generation. As previously requested by ourselves and other preservation groups and community members, 
We ask that no decision be made until a thorough and complete third party engineering report and appraisal is conducted and shared with the public. All documentation provided thus far indicates that while extensive repairs are needed throughout this building, it remains structurally sound. Surely the rehabilitation work could be accomplished in phases while portions of the building remain open throughout the duration of the work without adequate and unbiased exploration of other options and of the conditions of the church. We do not believe that this application meets the required findings for a hardship that would warrant complete demolition. Village preservation remains gravely concerned about what the precedent setting decision to grant hardship at this building would mean for other individual landmarks and especially religious institutions throughout our city. We ask that the hardship application be denied while our alternatives continue to be explored. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Deborah Y. Um, if you would like to speak, uh, could you please raise your virtual hand? Deborah Y. Okay, uh, I don't think you're here. So we will move on to um, Keith Hudson. If you would like to speak, can you please raise your virtual hand? Keith Hudson. Please raise, raise your virtual hand. Okay, great. Okay, Keith Hudson. Just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Hey, Keith Hudson, I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Yes, good afternoon. Okay, um, I think you're having, might be having some Wi-Fi issues. Hey, man, Keith Hudson, and I'm a Presbyterian. I did. Okay, um, Keith Hudson, I think you're having some technical problems. Um, so I'm going to move you back out. I will call you um, in the next round. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, now we can hear you. Please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Yes, thank you. My name is Keith Hudson and I'm a member of the Presbyterian Church of St. Albans. I am standing today in favor of the hardship application that has been proposed by the West Park Presbyterian Church. I believe that the, there has been no doubt that they have proven the hardship condition and that they can no longer continue to maintain the building in a safe manner for the church to continue to worship there and for the arts program that currently takes place there within the building. The new building, as was clearly indicated in the presentation, will continue to serve the purpose of the church and also the arts program. The fact of the matter is that this building is on a trajectory that it will simply implode and possibly cause serious harm and danger to the occupants and the people that live within this community. So this afternoon, I ask the commissioners to please approve the hardship application that is before them for the West Park Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, uh, Susan Simon, who will be followed by John Graham. Hey, Susan Simon, please um, unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose.
Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm not sure what happened to the video, but that's okay. We can see you. Please state your name for the record. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Simon, and I am the founder of the Central Park West Neighbors Association, made up of members of our community who stand to protect the historic district and landmarks we cherish, and to reject predatory methods to overdevelop our neighborhoods with luxury housing, which raises both the rent and the property taxes of our neighborhoods. We were instrumental in stopping a wholly inappropriate use and design for the landmark Carrere and Hastings First Church of Christ Scientists on Central Park West and 96th Street to be turned into luxury condos. Part of the projected design was to punch nearly 40 holes into the exterior sanctuary solid granite mass. So much for the protection of an important landmark. Our group persisted and the variances were never granted. Instead, the developer cut his losses by selling it to the Children's Museum for 45 million for a world-class public space in this landmark. The original applicants were not transparent. There were other interested parties to buy the church and other uses for the church who would not even consider destroying this landmark through decimation of its most significant historic details. In the course of the application process, we heard it all, including first church to be demolished. Much the same as we have heard here, it's deja vu all over again. We said then it can be saved, and we say it again for this beautiful faded beauty that is West Park. West Park is a very important part of the cultural and social heartbeat of this community. To de-landmark this church would be a travesty and would be an assault on the landmark law. The developers have one job and one job only. Wrestle the church from its landmark designation to demolish it and build more expensive expensive luxury condos from which they derive maximum profit. It has nothing to do with the landmarks law, nothing to do with the social and artistic benefits of this landmark to the community, nothing to do with the true condition of the building. We all get that. But if this commission concedes, then there is no landmark safe from these predatory methods. West Park is a faded beauty, which has been sorely neglected. It may not be the fault of the leadership, but it might be that they haven't the ability to bring the proper attention to this church, to bring the proper resources necessary to stop it from this neglect. There is no reason to delist West Park Church. Landmarks must refuse to play along, to chip away with an ax at the landmarks law our historic districts and our historic legacy. We found a much better outcome for the first church of Christ scientists that will protect it for the next hundred years and make it even more vibrant for New Yorkers. We can bring the needed parties together to restore and revitalize this very worthy landmark. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is John Graham. And John Graham will be followed by Susan Sullivan. Hey, John, are you here? Yes. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the Victorian Society, John Graham for the Victorian Society in New York. The Victorian Society has reviewed the additional materials submitted by the applicant. We find it does not change our opposition to the proposal to demolish on the grounds of hardship. We note that architects, engineers, and financiers working for the owner who wants to sell the building for demolition have no incentive to be creative about ways to preserve the building. On the contrary, their assessments will maximize the problems and costs and minimize the opportunities. 
Their analysis must be met with extreme skepticism. Here is the Victorian Society's previous testimony, which remains fully relevant. The Victorian Society opposes this application for demolition of the West Park Presbyterian Church on the grounds of hardship as the applicant has not met the criteria required for such a finding. Specifically, a not-for-profit owner must demonstrate, among other things, that the building is no longer adequate, suitable, or appropriate for use in carrying out the owner's purposes. In this case, the building is a church, the owner is a church congregation, and the building was in as all, and always will be suitable for use as a church. The enhancement of the owner's mission that might result from selling the property for purposes of demolition is not a relevant finding. Almost any not-for-profit owner of a landmark building could say its mission would be enhanced if it didn't have to maintain its old, old building and could sell it for demolition. And that's why the finding that the building is no longer suitable is required for not-for-profits. No evidence is provided that the building is unsuited to the owner's purposes, and no evidence is provided that the building requires a full restoration and upgrading at a cost of more than 50 million to remain usable. Financial hardship cannot be used as the reason that the building isn't suitable for carrying out the owner's purposes. Commissioners, these are dangerous times for historic preservation in New York. Forces have been working for years to weaken the Landmarks Law and the Landmarks Commission. If the commission approves this hardship application, we can expect much knocking on doors of not-for-profit owners of landmarks regardless of their condition with offers of monetization in exchange for hardship demolition. Perhaps that the goal, that's the goal of those behind the current application. Or perhaps they are looking for a route to the Supreme Court whose current members are no friends of precedent or of the public good. That's why this is such a dangerous application. We believe it should be denied. And at the same time, we urge the commission to develop a plan to thwart the anti-preservation forces that will doubtless pursue other avenues to achieve their ultimate goals. Thank you, commissioners. Great, thank you. Okay, next, uh, Susan Sullivan, who will be followed by Steve Anderson. Okay, Susan Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Sullivan. I'm president of the West 80s Neighborhood Association and a member of the board at the Center at West Park. So first, let's do a quick fact check. It can't be overstated that Roger Leaf's assertion that there's no other purchase offer on the table is inaccurate. The Center at West Park submitted an offer to purchase that building on June 11th, 2022, which was unilaterally dismissed. It's disturbing, but not unexpected since misrepresentation of facts has become a primary strategy in the Presbytery's application. Second, for the record, the center has invested more than $500,000 in a building where we are just the tenants. This hardship case is based on the Presbytery's presentation of documents that assert West Park is beyond its useful life as a building. That is not true. The center continues to carry out the charitable purpose which existed when the Presbytery first acquired the building back in 1888. The Presbytery has failed to fulfill that criteria, but the center at West Park has continued to carry it forward. We offer below market rate rates to the Lighthouse Chapel, which is primarily an African-American congregation. We provide after-school classes, a medical caravan to the asylum seekers, seekers that have recently arrived in New York. And we provide a free forum for public assembly addressing climate change, political issues, and other items that are important to our neighborhood. On top of all that, we are a thriving art center. So what purpose is to be served by demolishing this building? The Presbytery will receive $30 million windfall and the Upper West Side will lose a building that represents the essence of community service and engagement. So let's get to the money. First, the Presbytery has knowingly and with intent failed to maintain a building that they had an obligation to do so as the owner of a landmark. Yes, that costs money, but that is part of your responsibility as a landmark building owner. The highly exaggerated cost cited by the Presbytery assumes that all restoration will be done in one fell swoop. As we've heard before, that is not how historic restoration is done. Most importantly, it plays into a false narrative that West Park is derelict. WJE, our engineering firm, has 
absolutely rebutted that assertion. West Park is not in such disrepair that a phase restoration is untenable. Most importantly, approving, and this I swear to God is the most important part, approving the Presbytery's application undermines public confidence in our landmark law. The prospect of allowing a developer to destroy a developer, an owner and a developer to destroy this precious landmark and replace it with yet another Upper West Side market rate, high rise luxury building for the wealthy is alarming. Other owners of landmark buildings will follow this path of neglect and you'll see a deluge of hardship applications, which will absolutely moot the efficacy of our landmark law. You can imagine other owners of landmark buildings taking this decision as their lead. If the commission allows this application to go forward, it will turn our landmark preservation law on its head. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Um, next, uh, Steve Anderson, who will be followed by Jennifer Rogers. Thank you. Uh, are you able to uh, hear me now? Yes, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Yes, so my name is Steve Anderson and I live on West 81st Street. I have the opportunity of uh, serving uh, with the Upper West Side Coalition and the Theodore Roosevelt Park Neighborhood Association. But let me be clear, I'm not an expert. I'm not an architect. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an elder. Although in fact, after over 40 years living in our community, I've become a senior citizen. I think many of us really feel that we are preservationists and that in fact, we know all of you who sit and do this work on the commission are also preservationists, for which we respect your efforts and the tough work and a lot of the technical details that go into understanding what should be done. But are you preservationists or demolishers? That's what this comes down to. Do you allow, do you facilitate the smashing down of the walls which will destroy the sanctuary. We need you to be preservationists. That is a sacred sanctuary. And incredible things go on inside those walls, battered as they may be. We need you to recognize by seeing how many of us have shown up to express our views, to express our concern especially those of us who have more skin in the game than money can buy. We are people who care about our community, who care about what our community's values are. And this institution says something about our community for a long time, and that's real preservation. And I ask you, do you want to be the commission that makes yet another historical move to destroy, to facilitate destruction? Or do you want to be the commission that preserves something that is so valuable to so many of us? It is a tough decision. I hope you will do the right thing. And I thank you for this opportunity. Hey, that's great. Thank you. Uh, next is Jennifer Rogers. Hi, this is Jennifer Rogers. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Hi. The record. Yes, you have three minutes. Okay. Um, my name is Jennifer Rogers. I am on the board of the center at West Park. I'm a neighbor. I'm in the playground right now. If you hear people behind me, I'm going to be taking my daughter shortly to rhythmic gymnastics over at the center, which um, we have a program there on the third floor every day with um, you know dozens of kids coming through. They are just one of the many groups that you're not getting to hear from today. So I hope you think of them all as well. I know you guys have a lot of work ahead of you. I really encourage everybody because I felt we got such, even though we gave a little bit of extra time, such short time for the independent engineers that 
spoke about the safety of the building and that this case is really being exaggerated and the tune has changed many times during uh, all of this. So I hope that you guys take the time to dive into the reports that they put together as well. And just for the record, I did want to um, make sure to clarify and follow up a little bit on the center's offer to buy the building. I know that that was asked early on and I, I, I have to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm not sure why the response was that um, Mr. Leaf had didn't uh, say that there was um, an offer out there. I have his email responding to us on Monday, June 13th, 2022. Uh, saying, uh, we are in receipt of your communication below. That communication is CWP West Park Church offer. Uh, we have also sent this to the LPC. Uh, Mr. Leaf says, as I'm sure you are aware, the West Park Presbyterian Church has entered into a purchase and sale agreement for the subject property with another party for a price that is considerably higher than what is indicated in your June 11th letter. However, if this agreement does not close, we will consider any and all legitimate offers for the property at that time. So again, uh, we have made an offer, it's public record. We've had a press release that was out last June that we have pledges securing $3.5 million. And again, that was over a year ago. There's been press on this as well, uh, that we have those pledges, that we have made an offer and nobody entered into any negotiations with us. It does say, however, if they don't have the deal that's basically on the table now, we will consider any and all legitimate offers for the property at that time. And we have a legitimate offer and we would like to be considered. And hopefully you will give them the opportunity to enter into negotiations with us, but that only happens if it's denied. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next we have Helen Thurston. who will be followed by D. Zhu. Unmuted, here's my video. Hi there, hi. So oh, behind me is a picture of the church without the scaffolding. I don't know if you can see it, but see how beautiful it is. I'm Helen Thurston. I've known this church as a child when I waited for the bus, the number 11 bus there. I've known it as a parent when I went, we were looking at different churches in the neighborhood to take our children. I've known it as a performer. I've uh, sung in the church there as, as a member of a chorus. And I've known it as a member uh, raising funny for a not-for-profit, social justice not-for-profit that performed in the church itself. So it's a great, great space. It's exceptionally beautiful. That corner is such an important corner for uh, up the West Side. And um, I raise money for historic preservation. It is 101 that if you want money from New York State, which has money for historic preservation for such a beautiful and exceptional building, that you get yourself registered on the National Register of Historic Places. I've heard testimony that this has not been done. That's amazing to me. It sounds like people had mindset from the get-go when it went to landmarks that they didn't want to preserve the building and they haven't taken the steps that are taken by many, 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 many other institutions to do this kind of thing. So I am against the hardship. I think there are many steps that can be done to take care of it. You've heard the testimony of reputable architects that this building is not in such bad shape. And it is a very significant landmark, beautiful building in the Upper West Side, which has enough uh, new modern and luxury uh, construction going on. So thank you so much. Thank you to all the commissioners. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. And um, this that's the end of my speech. Okay, thank you very much. Next we have Dee Zhu. Mute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Um, hello, my name is Dee Zhu. Thank you, commissioners, for your time and the opportunity to speak. My name is Dee Zhu. I am part of a theater company that is currently inside the building under discussion. And on behalf of all the artists who call this place their creative home, I urge you to reject this hardship application. 
this incomparable spiritual church where I work out of every day for the past five years is home to the Russian Arts Theater and Studio, which has given the Upper West Side community high quality independent theater based on Russian literature at an affordable price since it moved in in 2017. Now people in the neighborhood tell me that this spot is the best thing about 86th Street. I would argue it goes beyond, but anyway. Um, this, this building is a senior, but just because something is elderly does not mean we kill it and replace it with something shiny and new. There were talks from the consulting teams about deteriorated sandstone, cracks in the walls, et cetera. What they don't talk about is all the areas where this building is intact. By the way, the fear tactics about it falling down, roofs collapsing, come from people who have never studied architecture in their lives. With all due respect to those speakers, your religious background does not give you the proper credits to speak about the building structure. It needs work, yes, but not $26 million worth, and it does not need to be done all at once. Every day, I marvel at this building's beauty and reflect on how lucky I am to create theater inside its walls. Um, and also some of the people who expressed their desire to demolish the structure have ironically never been inside its walls, never attended any of the art events taking place, never known the sanctuary that it provides to those wishing for culture and history. We cannot let this building go based on pure pragmatism. Once the building is gone, it will be gone forever. If financial difficulty is the arguing point, the center at West Park has offered to purchase this building and take over its burden. In time, under the leadership of Debbie Hirschman, the center will be able to raise funds to bring this building up to code and make it the pride of the Upper West Side. We must give this option a try before sealing this building's fate. And lastly, as someone who works inside the building every day, I say this, the structure is sound. It needs work, but it is doable. We cannot be so short-sighted West Park is for our children. It is our mutual responsibility to keep this invaluable architecture for future generations to enjoy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Amore Opera. Okay, Amore Opera, brought you in. We just need you to unmute yourself, please. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I am actually the managing director for Amore Opera. Um, and I recently just had our first production there at the Center for West Park. And I have to say, um, you know, as with the previous uh, person who testified, um, uh, my name is Connie, by the way, just sorry. Um, I, I am, um, one of the things that that's really great about the sanctuary is the soundscape that it offers and the opportunity that it offers uh, various different artists. I've had, I've heard previous, um, one of the person who's, who is a reverend who testified previously was talking about how, you know, arts will always basically be there. Well, actually not for our group. We're a particularly big opera company in town that is actually doing the you know, kind of the old classic repertoires, and it requires 25 piece orchestras where we also have an active children chorus. And believe you me, I, it's really impossible to, for it to find, for us to find an affordable place to stage an opera um, with three or four casts at the same time. And this is one of the few places that can offer us. And previously, we were actually at the Riverside Church and I using the Riverside Church and they have decided to double their rent on us. And this is the reason why we are seeking refuge at, um, at the Center for West Park. So to us, this is a godsend. So no, um, for, you know, it's not, it's not true that, oh, churches, um, arts will actually be, you know, kind of always survive. And it's, it's kind of weird to, talk, to hear a reverend that talks about ruining one's career. It's kind of interesting. But um, if my person, from everything I've heard so far, I can obviously, I cannot make architectural judgments, but if, if the Presbyterian um, church cannot raise the funds, and I totally understand how you might actually felt over the years, felt like you've been abandoned when people promise you something, but it didn't happen. Um, but I was wondering if you cannot raise the fund, why don't you let somebody else try? And this goes back to the this situation whereby the Center for West Park has offered um, to purchase the building from underneath you. 
from from you so that you will not have to bear the burden of repairing the building other people can. So I really wish that you would seriously give that a consideration. And also, um, it is someone else also brought up the fact that, oh, you know, the building was going to be renovated into an art center. If you were to take a look at the newer uh, building plan, the space that's allocated for theater is nowhere near the same size that we currently have right now. So no, effectively, it will be removing that space, particularly for a big group like ours. Um, and housing um, is affordable housing, even if basically this is not affordable housing, somebody said, that it is still helping with this housing situation. And I happen to disagree because um, I, I, my mom is a real estate agent and she has over the last few years have received a lot of cash offers from overseas Chinese investors who just merely buy up spaces, uh, afford, you know, living spaces here to hold as investment and not actually housing. So no, um, just because we raised a high rise for a residential area, it doesn't mean that it's actually gonna be filled with people. It could just be filled, like held up as an investment property. So you, no, you've gone over your three minutes. Could you please wrap up? So overall, I, I would wish that um, you guys consider to deny, um, you know, granting the hardship application. I do agree with other people that there has to be another way of doing it. And if the presbytery cannot do it, let somebody else do it. And I believe Debbie can definitely do it. Thank you. And um, thank you uh, for the commissioners for hearing me out. And, and um, yep. Okay, Take thank care. you. All right, thank you. Our next speaker will be Valerie Peter Chong. Uh, Valerie will be followed by Stephen Burns. Uh, Valerie, I will be promoting you to panelist. Uh, please unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Hello there. Um, my name is Valerie Peter Chong. I am the company director of Hamlet Isn't Dead, which is the uh, resident Shakespeare company of the center at West Park. And I stand in opposition to the demolition of um, this landmark. Um, the church has been our home for the past five years. It's been perfect for our work. Um, like Shakespeare's plays, the church is a gorgeous piece of history and art and its ability to be transformed within the present moment as a vibrant community art and worship space reflects our work of making the Bard's Canon accessible in our modern, modern world. So first and foremost, this is a very artistically viable pr partnership for us. Um, and I wanna state that off the bat that it's not just about money and being a small indie theater company, it is about art and this beautiful space. Um, but it also is worth noting that this has been a safe home for us to create art. I am a transgender artist of color. Many of our company members are people of color, share similar identities. Um, and I don't want us to take for granted the ability to find affordable and safe performance space for our community of LGBTQ plus immigrant and BIPOC creatives. And really neither should you if you've been paying any attention to the news right now. Um, it's such a wonderful space for us to be able to create art and do this work. And I am seriously concerned about our ability to continue running as a company should this uh, landmark be demolished. Um, furthermore, revoking landmark status would allow for the space's future to be driven by profit instead of community. Um, and this community has already experienced significant issues of gentrification. And this community has spoken up here uh, to all of you, as well as with over 5,000 signatures for our petition to save West Park. There are so many people who care. Um, and I urge you all to prioritize the public and the public's opinion over private profit. And I don't wanna take up any more of your time. I know we've all been here a really long time and I appreciate your time. And thank you so much for letting me speak.
Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Stephen uh, Burns, uh, followed by David Feinhirsch. Stephen will be promoting you to speaker, uh, after which you will have three minutes to speak, first starting with stating your name for the record. Hello? Yes, we Hello? can hear you. Okay, great. My name is Stephen Burns. Um, I was a commissioner uh, for six years, and in my last year in 2010, uh, I worked you know, very diligently behind the scenes to try to make this church landmarked, and I see its landmarking back in, in that year as one of my most significant achievements. Um, I felt and I still believe that it's possibly the, the finest example of uh, Richardsonian Romanesque architecture in Manhattan, if not the whole city. And just as a work of pure architecture, I think it's it's very important. Um, I guess just looking at a couple of you know comparables uh, over the years, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of which has been looked at before, but uh, there was a church called All Angels Church, uh, which was a beautiful church on West End Avenue and 81st Street, which was an Episcopal church. It was not landmarked, and uh, the church was struggling, and they sold it, and the building was torn down. The uh, uh, pulpit and communion rail was carved by Carl Bitter is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, they, the church moved to their tiny little parish house around the corner. And the next year, they got a new priest. It was one of the first women priests in America. And she was a dynamo. And the church completely turned around. And if only that woman priest had been there the year or two before, they could have filled the rafters at the original All Angels. So leadership and the clergy is a critical factor, and I'm not pointing fingers, but a, a good person can do great things. Uh, those of you might also know, just a few blocks away was St. Paul and St. Andrew's Church, which, which was landmarked, and that was the Methodist church that uh, they uh, filed a hardship for and wanted to demolish. And thankfully, the commission, this was maybe back in the 90s, uh, said no, and uh, it really forced the church to um, seek other sources of income. And while they remain the owners of the church and they have their own services there, there's a very vibrant synagogue that, that meets there um, uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, and I'm sure they get good income from that uh, and other revenue sources of, of income as well. So that was a, a great example of the commission taking a, a strong stand and ultimately it working out. And then lastly, I guess what was also said was the, the, uh, the Christian Zionist Church on 90 6th Street, again, individual landmark, and, um, and you know, they found an adaptive use for it. It's now going to be the Children's Museum. And, you know, these buildings are adaptable, and there's no reason why uh, it can't be uh, 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 renovated. And again, issues of accessibility and facade and, and, and fire code and all this, the churches often do these over many years and many uh, iterations and campaigns. Uh, I, I do agree that I think that uh, the, the city, when I was on the commission, you know, there was an independent person in the building department, and I, you know who he is, and to have him look at it, and, and there are times when he has said- Even, I'm sorry, we're over time, if you could wrap up your statement. Sure, that the that the building has to come down because it's so bad, and, and I think you do need to get that independent uh, person on the outside. So anyway, I think that if it were to be, uh, uh, if you were to pr approve this thing uh, being uh, uh, demolished, it would, it would set a catastrophic precedent uh, going forward in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Feinhirsch. Uh, David will be followed by Nina Musinski. Uh, David Feinhirsch, uh, I will be elevating you to panelists, after which you will have three right. minutes to speak. Please start by uh, stating your name for the record. I know. Yeah, they they could be off. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, confirming that we can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is David Feinhirsch. As a real estate developer in New York City, 
I have particular insight. Sorry, <laughs> the little thing came up. I have particular insight into issues related to real estate, design, construction, and investment. Importantly, we must understand that the underlying value to all real estate in this city is the city itself, its culture, its buildings, its history, and its citizens. The Landmarks Preservation Commission was established to protect these essential virtues and the value of New York City itself. The applicant's petition for hardship is alleged to be based on statute. However, the applicable statutes do not support their claim. In particular, the applicant claims that the cost of renovation makes it impossible both to pursue its charitable purpose and to earn a, quote, reasonable return, unquote. On the first point, assessment of the cost estimates most recently submitted raised considerable skepticism. Even using the itemized cost estimates conducting by the applicant's own consultants, the cost required to repair the building as a religious and nonprofit community space, and importantly, it is both, is closer to $15 million rather than $26 or $50 million alleged by the applicant. The occupancy does not change if a nonprofit organization buys the building. Therefore, the building doesn't need to be brought to 2020 code. Nevertheless, the renovation can be financed either by the congregation or a new owner. To the second point, the applicant bases their calculation of reasonable return, a financial litmus test for hardship on a unique method that deviates from the New York City Administrative Code. Such a deviation is only possible when a sale has not been transacted since 1958. In the stall matter on which the applicant bases its calculation, the property was acquired in 1977. The West Park Church, of course, has had the same owner since it was built. The methodology required by the New York City Administrative Code is more stringent than that used by the applicant, which is exactly the point. When the proper formula is used to calculate reasonable return, the threshold for hardship is not met. Um, additionally, I would say that the FX Collaborative, while a wonderful architecture firm, never completed a financial analysis, only an architectural analysis. There are other alternatives uh, for adding on to the building that do are, are financially feasible. And I have submitted one in my written testimony. Um, please find, uh, please feel free to submit or uh, to read my uh, submitted written testimony for further explanation of my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Nina Musinski. If you could please raise your hand, I can promote you to panelist. Following Nina will be Roberta Gross. Nina, if you could please raise your hand on Zoom, I can promote you to panelist. Okay, um, Nina Musinski. All right. We'll be moving on for now to our next speaker, Roberta Gross. Roberta Gross, uh, yes, thank you for raising your hand. And Roberta will be followed by uh, Ted Berger. Ted Berger, please raise your hand so we can promote you when it's time. Uh, Roberta will be promoting you to panelists. You will have three minutes to speak. Please start by, start by stating your name for the record. If you could unmute, please. Roberta Gross, please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. My name is Roberta Brandes Gratz. I am a journalist, author, and former member of the Landmarks Commission for seven years. For 20 years, I led the restoration of the 1887 Landmark Eldridge Street Synagogue, a magnificent building on the Lower East Side. We were in the mid-1980s. Water was pouring through the roof. Pigeons were flying inside. There was a congregation of 10 people. Stained glass windows were in shatters. Everyone was afraid to even come visit the building for fear of crime in the neighborhood. I wish Eldridge had been in as good shape as West Park is in today and in as formidable location. 
almost no one understood why we cared about a falling down synagogue in Chinatown. It took $20 million, 20,000 donors, and today it is a thriving and beautiful museum. Its architecture and physical presence continues to enrich the community as a vivid and genuine reminder of an elegant and significant moment of New York's immigrant past. West Park will be a piece of cake in comparison. Only without a death threat hanging over it will donations come and they will come easily. It sits on a visible and highly accessible corner of a thriving intersection in a huge, well-heeled community ready to raise the money. Engineers have laid out a doable restoration that can be accomplished over time. A great diversity of cultural activities already using the building will thrive. Do not be cajoled and fooled into losing what the commission has a mere 13 years ago acknowledged as an extraordinary important Romanesque revival landmark and one of the most significant buildings on the West Side. West Park promises the best kind of return on its community's investment, not measurable in dollars, but in continuity of an architectural legacy to be preserved for and appreciated and used by generations to come. The fate of this incomparable 1884 Romanesque revival church rests in your hands. Don't let, don't let it be lost. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Ted Berger. Uh, Ted will be followed by Gregory Kersoff. Ted Berger, I will be promoting you to panelist, uh, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Um, I'm Ted Berger, Executive Director Emeritus of the New York Foundation for the Arts and a board member of the Center for West Park. I did send the email on behalf of the uh, Center board uh, to Roger Leaf on June 11th. Uh, the, the Presbytery never really paid serious attention to our offer, even though it included uh, our commitment to having the church remain in the building. Um, I would like the rest of my time uh, turned over to Kenneth Lonergan. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we are calling names in the order that they are registered. Um, the well, next well then, then if that's not possible, I will continue. Carry on. Okay, then I'm going to continue. Um, the Presbytery's application must be denied. How does it meet the Commission's hardship criteria? When the Center and Church Partnership began, a priority was to create a separate nonprofit secular 501c3 for private and public fundraising. But the Presbytery primarily has sought developers for a solution. As you have heard, the church session wouldn't even sign off on the center's request to apply for uh, uh, to the national uh, heritage towards restoration. The center is clearly demonstrating that alternative financial resources are available towards purchase, restoration, and operations. This opportunity is being ignored by the presbytery. Neighboring buildings, residents, and others have generously already made significant pledges. Greater possibilities exist. Once site control is determined, major public capital funds at the city, state, and federal level are available. Rather than dipping only into the deep pockets of a developer for instant funds, our public-private alternative, which admittedly takes more time, fits the broader community use and commitment to this building. Approval of hardship 
only allows demolition rather than creating a pathway to explore alternative, creative, collaborative economic solutions. The presbytery doesn't seem to value the partnership the center seeks, building community ownership and involvement. I urge you to allow time to find alternative solutions to preserving and restoring the building. Listen to what our community is telling you. Listen to what your gut is telling you. There are other options. This building has significance on both on the outside and on the inside. It's more than an architectural landmark. Its walls resonate with history, spirituality, and creativity. The hopes and dreams and actions of thousands and thousands of people. This is an active, affordable incubator space. Where I'm all sorry, of, we're over time. If you could please wrap up your statement. This is a living landmark. Let it live. Say no to the condo. Yes, this building needs work. Hell, we all do. Give us time. Give this building a chance. Give the community a chance. You are the landmark preservation commission. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Gregory Kershaw, followed by Alec Roman. If uh, you could please uh, raise your hand so I can bring you into the speaker room. Gregory Kershaw, please raise your hand if you're online. Okay, moving to Alec Roman. Alec Roman, please raise your hand so we can promote you to panelists. Alec Roman will be followed by Debbie Hirschman. Alec Roman, you will have three minutes to speak. Uh, please unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Oh, there we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, perfect. So I, I, I'm a resident of the Upper West Side and I urge you to reject the application to de landmark and demolish the West Park Presbyterian Church. The case before you fails to satisfy the criteria for hardship. The application of the reasonable return calculation here is inappropriate and incorrect. Furthermore, the center is leased to a nonprofit and therefore its owner does not have the legal right to demolish it. Now, I personally was very disappointed to learn of this attempt carried out in secret for years to demolish the historic building and replace it with high-end condominiums. The Presbytery has received a fully committed cash offer to purchase the West Park Church as is that accomplishes all of the following. Preserves this great historic building for all to enjoy provides a multi-million dollar cash payout to the Presbytery, which it can share with this congregation in any way it sees fit, relieves the congregation and the Presbytery of any risk or obligation to repair and maintain the structure, guarantees the congregation permanent use of the historic structure for continued worship, and offers the Presbytery rights to the excess proceeds should the church or land ever be sold. That offer was dismissed. Someone pointed this out earlier, uh, but you know, I had this talking point first. The Presbytery simply responded that they already had a higher offer. And that to me is the key issue in this case. Notice that a few people have framed this issue as the congregation has shrunk and they are poor and just can't afford to maintain it. But that is just simply a misframing of the issue. If the current owner cannot or prefers not to maintain the building, then they have a bona fide offer to sell it as is for millions of dollars like anyone would normally do with a property they use less than they used to and no longer want to pay for, you sell it. There is no hardship here in any true sense of the word. Of course, a developer who would demolish a building and build luxury condos with zero affordable units will always be able to pay a higher price for any prime location. And many individual landmark buildings sit on prime locations. But the only advantage of the offer from Alchemy and the Presbytery that, that or alchemy that the presbytery is currently pursuing is that it maximized the proceeds to the owner. All the other issues that have been brought up here are better addressed by an alternative, such as the formal offer that I just referred to. This debate just boils. This debate ultimately boils down to the question of whether a, whether de-landmarking should be a tool available to owners of historic 
culturally significant buildings who are no longer willing or able to maintain them and who are focused instead on maximizing their sale proceeds. When it comes to looking for alternatives to, to, uh, to delandmarking, how hard can someone reasonably expect to be, be how hard can someone reasonably be expected to try to do something if they believe that failing to do that thing will result in a windfall payment of $30 million? If the owner of this historic building is rewarded for their approach over the last two years, others are sure to take notice and follow suit. The allure of cash payouts from luxury condo developers is too great for many to resist. I am filled with genuine fear for the neighborhood and city if what makes both special is allowed to be demolished and replaced with cookie cutter investment properties. An important piece of our neighborhood's history would be lost. The vibrancy of the cultural center and theater productions would be silenced forever. My sincere hope is that all those things are what landmarking is designed to protect and, and preserve. Please vote against the landmarking and the demolition. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Debbie Hirschman. Uh, Debbie Hirschman will be followed by Valerie David. Uh, Debbie Hirschman, I will be promoting you to panelist, um, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself and you all have three minutes to speak, beginning with stating your name for the record. Debbie Hirschman, and thank you all for your patience and being here these many hours and years. And thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Literally 33 years ago, I was told by Leonard Stern of Hearts Mountain and the Stern School of Business that no one had ever built a JCC in Manhattan and it wasn't gonna happen when he walked through the building 11 years later from non-existence to a $95 million building, he said to me, okay, I was wrong. The building was built on a set of values in 1990. It was going to be a home of inclusivity and diversity, gay, straight, interfaith, orthodox reform, non-Jews, the neighborhood at large were going to become a community and have what we said was comparable to Central Park during bad weather because community anchors a city. 11 years later from non-existence, that building opened and it opened because it was built on values and the next generation that stood on the shoulders of Larry Tisch, Leonard Stern, the Rose family and others. Now, 33 years later, I'm sitting and we at the center at West Park and all of us are sitting on the shoulders of Joseph Papp, of In God's Love We Deliver, of the church that brought us here, now Lighthouse Chapel, and the artists you saw today that reflect the most important value that we're all trying to ensure, which is equal access, be it to justice or arts and culture. We have to be the force that goes into public schools today that have no arts and culture because it can't be afforded and enable them to have it because that will be one of the conditions for the artists who work in the space. I hear people say that there isn't the money. Well, I'm gonna read you first this and then the following. I am an attorney who has several clients with charitable foundations. One such client who has the means to make a sizable contribution towards the restoration of the West Park Presbyterian Church has already expressed interest in helping with that effort. I am sure that others will also be willing. I am writing to let you know that the quoted $50 million cost of the restoration is not out of reach and there are people with the means and desire to save the church. Please fr feel free to contact me. That was on Monday. You also have that testament. I have a meeting with this lawyer at their law firm and have already been in touch for Thursday afternoon. Now our job is to make this a win-win. The Presbytery deserves funds to be paid so they can continue to serve this city in the ways that they wish, both in terms of creating the social 
responsibly actions that they talk about that we have continued. Now, remember, when people ask- I'm so sorry, we're over time. If you could please wrap up your statement. One more second as you gave other people, okay? When, When this all began, it was during COVID. Let's all remember that not raising more money during COVID or not having these monies, you all saw, and we have the commitments from the following people to do fundraisers. Common, who you saw earlier, who's a great rapper. From Amy Schumer, as well as Bridget Everett, who also have committed to doing fundraisers. To Mark Ruffalo and others, and Wendell Pierce, whom you all heard, and you'll hear from Wendell later, have the ability to raise these funds. There is not a question about that. And now we have to be given the opportunity to make West West Park the the church whole and to maintain the legacy that has to remain the model for all of us. Thank you so much. And and to end, just so you know, when the JCC bought the property for $5 million, because no one else was buying property then, related came to us three years later, before we ever started shoveling dirt and offered $15 million. We did not take it because we knew and we told the city, more people will stay in this city if there are community spaces than will, than if- I'm so sorry, we have to move on. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, our next speaker is Valerie David, followed by Susanna Green. Uh, Please uh, raise your hand so we can promote you to a speaker. Valerie David, I'll be promoting you to speaker. You will have three minutes to speak. Uh, Please start by unmuting yourself and stating your name for the record. Yeah, and just I want to jump in and just also say that one of the reasons we are being strict about the standard time limit is because we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to speak before commissioners need to leave for the day. So we are uh, trying to ensure that we get through everybody. So please uh, respect yes. your time and uh, try to stay with them. I'll, I'll okay. be brief, I promise. Hi, my name is Valerie David. I'm an and playwright that lives on the Upper West Side. And I oppose the West Park hardship and I oppose the demolition. We... I am a proud New Yorker. I've been here more, most of my life, and I'm very disturbed to see what's happening to New York and the arts. We lost Theater 80 on, in the East Village that had been here since the 60s to an auction. We're losing the Crane Theater after 25 years in the East Village. I'm very sad to see all these high rise built. I live in the 90s, and there's no retail in the bottom of these buildings. The only thing we have is a city bank and there's like five new buildings that came up. I performed at West Park and I've seen productions in all of their rooms. The Upper West Side has become a retail desert as well as this becoming a desert of the arts. New York won't thrive without its artists. And when you de- demolish West Park, you demolish the arts. We saw that the Tonys had ratings out the roof on Sunday. Uh, people want the arts. We need the arts. We saw that um, Broadway did super well. We need Park Centers as a center to cultivate new works so they have a chance to live and breathe and go on to off-Broadway and Broadway. I've been in New York for so long and I stopped counting on my fingers and toes how many centers of art have closed, whether they're theaters or whether they're rehearsal studios. And people talked about the unaffordability and the raising of rent for, for resident companies. And I, I also, the house of worship should still be maintained, but I really am sad to see New York be having, you know, a, more targets and more five belows. We're like any other city now. What makes New York is its vibrant arts culture. And if West Park is destroyed, you're destroying the arts and a beautiful history that dates back to the 1800s. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Susanna Green. Please raise your hand. Uh, Susanna Green will be followed by Peter Coral. 
Susanna Green, I will be promoting you to speaker. You will have three minutes to speak. Please start by unmuting yourself and stating your name for the record. Um, hi, I'm Susanna Green. I was born on the Upper West Side. I still live on West 87th Street near the church. And I'm everything the previous speaker just um, said, I fully agree with. I'm opposed to the West Park hardship and I oppose the demolition of the church. I'm, I, I don't want to see another useless luxury condo built in this neighborhood. Um, we have too many already and there's like no, it, it doesn't help the general public at all. It only serves very few. And I'm tired of seeing that. I was very touched by, I think it was Derek McQueen um, who spoke earlier today saying that historically Presbyterian churches have been built on the corners of city blocks to allow access for all people, especially the poor. And I think we have to think more about that and cater less to wealthy developers and think more about the people in our community. And I think this church represents compassion and I think we just have to, excuse me, I'm really scared of public speaking. So this is a big deal for me. Um, but I am I just feel like we have to think with our hearts rather than our wallets and that this is what it's mostly about. And I'm eager to see how this church can become an art center and I want to see it thrive. And I really don't want to see it demolished. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Peter Coral. Uh, Peter Coral will be followed by Lisa Harrison. Uh, Peter Coral, I'll be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to unmute yourself uh, and state your name for the record. You all have three minutes to speak. Peter Coral, if you could please accept the invitation to be promoted to panelists. All right, Peter Coral. Okay. Um, all right, we're, we're going to move now to Lisa Harrison. Lisa Harrison will be followed by Laura Jervis. Lisa, if you could please start by stating your name for the record and you will have three minutes. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Lisa Harrison. I live on the Upper West Side and I often walk by the West Park um, Presbyterian Church. And every time I have to stop and look and just appreciate how beautiful and unique this building is. It is indeed and should remain a landmark. It would be a disgrace to replace it with a 19 story glass tower full of multi million dollar luxury condos, which is the last thing this neighborhood needs. In contrast to that scenario, there is a prospective buyer uh, center at West Park who wants to preserve the building and make it the center of creativity, culture, social justice recreation, you know, this is something that the neighborhood would love. It would contribute something valuable to our community. And, you know, we've now heard that there are even other potential buyers and an independent engineering inspection, very different from the one that was provided by the applicant. So why haven't these alternatives been considered? You know, 
so we we now have two very different scenarios. We can follow the all too common pattern of prioritizing profit, revoke the landmark status of an architectural treasure and put up a monstrosity slapped together for as cheaply as possible to sell for as much as possible and leave us with a giant needle that no one even wants to look at. Or we could preserve a beautiful old building and use it for something that people living here will love and enjoy for many years to come. I urge you to consider the other buyers, especially uh, Center for West Park, and seriously look into the independent inspection report and not limit your consideration only to the statement of the applicant, which clearly has not proven its contention of hardship. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Laura Jervis. Uh, Laura Jervis will be followed by uh, Mikhail Kaplan. Laura Jervis, I'll be promoting you to panelists now, uh, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Laura Jervis, if you could please raise your hand, I can promote you to panelist. Uh, if you could please unmute yourself and you're welcome to bring on your camera if you would like. Thank you. My name is Laura Jervis. I speak in favor of West Park's application. Prior to my testimony, I wish to correct an erroneous statement that has been given by many people uh, during this time. The Presbytery of New York City does not own West Park or any of its churches. It was stated by the, our stated clerk and others. Furthermore, the Presbyterian Church USA does not own any churches in the country. To continue, from 1975 through 1989, I was a parish associate minister at West Park Church. Currently, I serve a church on West 73rd Street, but I remain a champion of West Park Church. It has been alleged that over the years, the church officers have willfully mismanaged and degraded the church in order to reuse the property. This is spurious and highly offensive to those who have known the vibrant ministry of West Park for the past 50 years. Let me set the record straight. In the 1970s, West Park had a healthy, if modest, endowment. The trustees of the church were prudent and drew down between three and 5% of the interest on the endowment each year. It was in the late 70s that the physical issues of the buildings became acute. I was there when the ceiling of the fellowship hall fell to the floor just minutes after a group of older adults were present. You have heard from others the many violations that exist currently at the church. In fact, it chills me to think that there are children who are on the third floor of the church, even as we speak. The church is a dangerous place. One of the major issues in the church now is the fact that moisture seepage comes into the sanctuary part of the church. We have had people who have had to leave West Park because of the difficult air quality issues in the church. Neighbors will recall a heavy storm 
that resulted in a river of red mud along 86th Street in Amsterdam. The, said, the sandstone was shedding itself. Attempts to mitigate these issues was and is beyond the financial ability of the church. All of this and more meant depleting the endowment, selling two manses, shrinking the church. The church at West Park has actually worked very, very hard over these years to make the building sustainable. The claim that the church leaders were allowing the decay of the building was never true. Knowing the fag fragility of the structure, the church organized a plan in 2002. As you all know, that was overturned in 2010 when the church was landmarked. I'm so sorry, we're, all, we're out of time. If you could please wrap up your statement. Promises of financial aid were made from the community, from the elected officials, from CUNY Board 7, and never realized. What kind of understanding could we have that this could still be true? Among you are commissioners who were present and voted in favor of landmarking in 2010. I hope you've been in the building. I hope you walk, you've walked by it and seen that the financial promises were in vain. In 2010, you took the building from the church. Please Sorry, do would you please complete your statement so we can give everyone a chance to speak? I'm finished, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Mikhail Roman. Mikhail Roman will be followed by Jim Kelly Markham. Mikhail, I'll be promoting you to speaker, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, um, I'm Michal uh, Kaplan Roman. Uh, I'm a resident of the Upper West Side. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. After listening to the application in the community board meetings, as well as the Landmark Commission public meeting last year, it is clear to me, clear to me that they have not proven the requirements for hardship. The building is not falling down. In fact, it is currently insurable by the center at West Park. It is currently being used for its original purpose, worship, and has also been repurposed as a thriving community art center. Additionally, the cost to repair the building is significantly inflated by the developer. There is an independent study that demonstrates that the costs are significantly less to bring the building to code. There is an offer to buy the building, repair it, and maintain it as a landmark that the Presbytery has ignored. The Presbytery claims that they have no other option but to sell this land to a developer with the contingency that the landmark status be revoked due to hardship. The congregation argues that without the money from the developer, they will not be able to continue their charitable works. To be blunt, it is just not true that this is the only option. Yes, the land is worth more money if there is not a landmark church on it, but the church has a viable offer to buy the building for millions of dollars from a group that cares about preserving it. Many owners of landmark buildings in New York would like to be able to remove the status and sell to the developer for tens of millions of dollars, but that is counter to the purpose of landmarking. Yes, the land is worth less if there is a landmark building on it, but it is worth something. And in this case, a group has made an offer for a multi-million dollar buyout that would preserve the building and give the presbytery funds to continue the work of their congregation. Once the building is no longer owned by a religious entity, public funds can be raised to restore the building. I know that they've talked a lot about how um, that hasn't been able to happen over the past 10 years, but that is largely due to the fact that it is currently owned by a church uh, and so cannot receive certain public funds and um, that the, the church has ignored many offers to buy the building. Gail Brewer has done this before and raised money in the past and she can do it again. Um, Debbie has also raised significant money in the past and can do it again. They, the Presbytery wanted to sell to a developer in 2010 and was unable to because your committee rightly landmarked the church. Over the last 12 years, they have ignored offers to purchase the church by nonprofit organizations. 
a building of this importance should not be demolished if there's any other option. And in this case, there are options that benefit all. The applicant has not demonstrated the requirements for hardship. Please let us save this architectural and cultural landmark. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Jim Kelly Markham, uh, followed by uh, Nick Brown. All right, Jim, uh, Jim Kelly Markham, I'll be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to unmute yourself, uh, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello. 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 My name is Jim. My name is Jim Kelly Markham, um, and I'm a retired architect. And I've been involved in historic preservation for over 40 years. I moved recently from San Diego. Sorry, I think we have a bit of an issue of uh, of echo or interference. How can I how can I correct that? If if you have um, YouTube or running at the same time or two devices logged into Zoom. Excuse me. Can you turn one of those off. I don't have don't YouTube have on. Do you have two devices on Zoom? No, I no, don't. Okay. Well, maybe the echo is not bad enough to. Okay. Well, I do see that this account is logged in twice. Um, if you want to try logging out of one of your accounts, we could bring you back on uh, after the next speaker. Okay, okay, let me try again. Okay. All right, so uh, our next uh, speaker now will be Nick Brown. Nick Brown will be followed by Michael Devonshire. Okay, Nick Brown, I'll be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to um, unmute yourself, state the, your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Nick Brown. Um, I am a director, a theater director, and the new program director here at the Center at West Park. And I just want to start uh, by thanking the LPC for holding this hearing and for everyone who is speaking up to preserve this historic landmark. Um, that being said, I have a message from Wendell Pierce that I want to share with you all now. The Center at West Park maintain that sacred space on the landmark. Preservation list. Please meet with us. Please support us in maintaining its landmark designation. This is my full throated support for this. There's no reason that after a decade on landmark preservation list that it should be taken off to benefit uh, a profitable deal for a developer. There are other places where he can make his profit without destroying a sacred space. My name is Wendell Pierce. I live on the Upper West Side. And I hope you, Mr. Mayor, support us. Thank you. Uh, and my name is Nick Brown, and I am here to strongly encourage the LPC to oppose the hardship application. This is a very active, I'm in it now, this is a very active artistic space and place of worship and one that is integral to the fabric of New York City. This space offers a platform both for international and local art artists and congregants to participate in multicultural and intergenerational exchange. I recently directed a play called Is My Microphone On about the climate crisis from the point of view of teenagers, and I directed this as a participant in the center's resident artist program. The program elevates emerging artists by providing funding, time, and space uh, to vital boundary-pushing work rooted in social justice with New York audiences. This residency is one of dozens of projects that the center provides that are uniquely committed to engaging audiences in conversations about activism and enriching the community through work that is rooted in social, social justice. The center is also home to a renowned puppetry festival, the Russian Arts Theater and Studio, the Seeing Place Theater, Manhattan Rhythmic, Noche Flamenco, 
and the Lighthouse Chapel Church, and will soon be home to a Muslim women's group who do not have space to pray at Fridays at noon in the Upper West Side. Losing this building would mean displacing all of these artists, worshipers, and losing vital programming. New York City is vibrant, magnetic, and the epicenter of arts and culture because of diverse artists who have operated on the fringes and help us invest, help us investigate our shared humanity. When we lose these spaces, we lose a part of the soul of our city and we lose a part of ourselves because we lose access to these artists important cultural conversations and the vital work they create. I urge you to consider the impact that losing this space will have on all of New York and know that there are hundreds of people who are committed to raising the funds to renovate this building. As expressed by many, the center at West Park under the new leadership of Debbie Hirschman is prepared to raise the funds to purchase the building and renovate this building. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and taking into consideration every avenue possible that would preserve this sacred space. Reject this application and let's find a way forward that puts the community first and serves us all. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, it looks like our previous speaker, Jim Kelly Markham has rejoined. Jim Kelly Markham will be followed uh, by Michael Devonshire. How's that? Can you hear me? Perfect. Wonderful. Yes, my name is Jim Kelly Markham. I'm a retired architect. I've recently moved from San Diego. Um, I practiced uh, historic preservation architecture. My wife, Kathleen, also was a land use planner and historic preservation planner. Over the years, we've heard a number of stories as to why buildings need to be demolished. Um, the stories are, are similar. But it's interesting that the BS that we got in San Diego smells an awful lot like the BS I'm getting from the developers and this project. In the end, this really isn't a, uh, a project that can go forward. The applicant has not made the required findings to delist this project. Um, in particular, saying that it can't be used as a, as a uh, resource the way it is uh, designed to be is not true. To say that they can immediately tear down the building is not true. There's a five-year lease. And the whole business about a return on investment, since when does a church need a return on investment? I urge you to not deny this hardship application. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Michael Devonshire. Michael Devonshire will be um, followed by Marion Warden. Michael Devonshire, I'll be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to uh, unmute yourself and state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, if you could please unmute yourself. I'm speaking for myself today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I've been in the I've been privileged to serve in the field of historic preservation for 44 years. I have worked on more than three dozen churches in New York City and um, around the U.S. Um, five of them were Leopold Eidlitz churches. In fact, I've worked on many that were in much better condition than um, West Park and many that were in worse condition in West Park. And I can assure you that none of them ever requested that the churches be demolished instead of restored. I am speaking in opposition today because um, the applicant has used the cost of renovation as a basis for uh, their hardship application. And in fact, um, I've had an opportunity not only to see the church, but I've had an opportunity to review all of the reports that have been written. And three of the reports um, essentially posed a doom and gloom scenario that is not standard procedure. 
the standard procedure for approaching a restoration project is to do a condition assessment that is based upon a complete investigation of the building. And as you'll recall, when commissioners were given a chance to question um, a couple of the applicants' consultants, we never received a satisfactory answer about how many probes, how many stones were tested on the building, uh, except that there was a, a very small percentage of the stones that had been tested. It's like going to the dentist to get your teeth clean, finding a small cavity on one of your teeth and having the dentist tell you that he's got to rip all your teeth out. It's just not reasonable. In any case, what I would say is the LZA report, which actually mentions the possibility of different levels of intervention, which is standard procedure, rather than replacement of all the stones, because there may be some delamination, is, is something that has to be further investigated. Also, one of the things that we need to be wary of is, is essentially assuming that the entire restoration project has to be done at one time. I have never in my career been able to work with a church that had enough finances to do an entire project at once. It's always phased. So there is misinformation about the entire scope of work that's been, been forwarded here, and there's misinformation about how it needs to be done. And I, I urge my the Landmarks Commissioners to reject this because this will send us into a La Brea tar pit of historic preservation from which we will never recover. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, apologies. Our next speaker is uh, Marian Warden. If you could please raise your hand. Marian Warden will be followed by Lionel Hamanaka. A uh, reminder to please select the raise hand button um, so we can call on you. Um, I'll now be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself uh, and state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, my name is Marion Warden and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the board of the center at West Park. The first time I walked into West Park Church in 2010, right after the landmarking, it was indeed in bad shape. Uh, it had been unoccupied for three years and had been um, left because they thought they were going to tear it down at that point. In the intervening 13 years, I and a group of other concerned citizens from the community have worked tirelessly on the basis of a two-pronged mission, that the building was worth saving and could be saved and should be saved, and we were going to be sure that it would. And secondly, that it, we were going to bring life back into that building through the vehicle of arts and culture and community engagement, both of which we are continuing to work on, as you have heard from so many today. I had some testimony prepared, but it's kind of repetitive from what all my colleagues have said. The people who use this building, who know what it means to artists to have affordable space to develop their programs. People who know that sacred space is sacred because of what happens in it, but also treasures the history and legacy of the building. I am also impressed by what has gone on before our time, how much has happened in the church and how valued it is by so many people, especially I have here the testimony that was given by our colleague um, and friend, Arlene Simon, 
who testified at the first hearing in 29, uh, 2009 that, that resulted in the landmarking. And she has submitted this saying that this is still valid. And I'll excerpt it. Experts marvel at the exemplary use of materials in the building's exceptionally high level of integrity. Support for designating West Park comes from, that was, this was the decision to designate. Leaders of religious institutions who know firsthand the challenges and rewards of caring for a historic building. Support also comes from residents of neighborhoods, not just on the Upper West Side, but throughout the city who know the irreparable damage that losing a historic religious building can inflict on a community. Upper West Siders recognize West Park as one of our neighbors' most valuable assets, a beacon, an anchor, a public monument to faith, tolerance, beauty, and community are words regularly used to describe West Park. Because of its prominent location on the corner of West 86th Street in Amsterdam, it has a sculptural presence, unlike most New York City buildings. West Park is visible in the round. The I'm sorry, we we'll past time, if you could please wrap up your statement. Ex including the chapel and the sanctuary expansion of 1890, these parts must be designated whole. I support what Arlene says, and I abhor the idea of desecrating this building. Please deny this application. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next registered speaker is Lionel Hamanaka. If you could please raise your hand so we can promote you to panelists. Lionel Hamanaka will be followed by Noah Lightling. Lionel Hamanaka, could you please raise your hand so we can promote you? Thank you. Once promoted, you will have um, three minutes to speak. We ask for you to uh, unmute yourself and then state your name for the record. If, if you could please unmute yourself. Uh... Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. My name is Leonel Hamanaka. I'm a lifelong resident of the Upper West Side. West Park Presbyterian Church's congregation started in 1852 before the Civil War. Pastor Anson Phillips Atterbury of the Phelps Dodge family commissioned the famous Leopold Eidlitz, who also did Temple Emmanuel, to build a Romanesque church. Over the years, West Park Presbyterian was the original site for God's love we delivered during the AIDS crisis and innumerable cultural groups. Anson Phelps Atterbury embodied the activist tradition in the struggle against racism in civil rights, nuclear disarmament, gay rights, and criticizing the Vietnam conflict. Great singers from the Metropolitan Opera sang there and met musicians from Lincoln Center played there. The Upper West Side has a multitude of high income luxury buildings built over the last few decades, but you can count on the fingers of one hand low cost cultural venues. Where will performing and visual artists find a home? They need low cost venues to develop in. The Upper West Side of Manhattan is called the cultural capital of the United States. Demolishing West Park Presbyterian, a historic structure that rents at reasonable rates would help demolish the history of New York City and cut out a piece of the heart of our neighborhood, denying us a rare space devoted to artistic expression, so important given today's turmoil and the isolation of the pandemic. Will you, New York City become a desert of glass and steel? for the wealthiest people in the world. A city without history with no past would be a shallow reprimand to New York and the United States. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Noah Lightling. Uh, Noah Lightling will be followed by Kenneth Ruggiero. 
You know, a live thing, I'll be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to unmute yourself uh, and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Hi there. This is Noah Likeling. I live at 87th in Amsterdam. Thank you, Commissioner Carroll and LPC commissioners for the opportunity to speak to you today. I would say hang in. It's almost over, right? You guys have been super patient with us as and everybody that's been in front of you. Um, and, and a lot of respect for that, for giving everyone here on both sides of the issue the opportunity to speak. It is much appreciated. Uh, I concur with State Senator Brad Hoyleman and City Council Person Gail Brewer. I respectfully submit the following to you. I think in many ways, the Presbytery and Alchemy Partners has failed to address a number of items, some of which deal with the good faith and fair dealing of the Presbytery and Alchemy Partners in this matter. It is laughable that we heard a speaker from the Presbytery who cited New York State Governor and New York State Mayor's need for additional housing as reason to approve the hardship application. None of the proposed residential plans by Alchemy Partners would solve affordable and need-based housing concerns. Additionally, you heard from Councilperson Brewer about the actions of both the Presbytery and Ken Horn and Joel Breitkopf of Alchemy Partners and their attorneys at Kramer Levin with respect to allowing opposing views that pressure test and peer review their application. These reviews are, these actions are now a matter of public record. Approval of a hardship designation would suborn condemnation by neglect and the misrepresentations and self-serving actions of the applicants. At best, there are too many inconsistencies in the record of the applicants to approve this application. At worst, these applicants engaged in actions that deliberately misled and misrepresented the factual analysis and state of affairs for their gain. I would point out that there is not even overwhelming support for this application by the public, and the numbers of those opposing this application far exceed those in support of it. The record stands for itself. The LPC is an esteemed body designated with preservation and protection of the city writ large. To rely on the foregoing application and, and, the record of the app, uh, and the record of the applicants would encourage similar behavior from other applicants of a similar nature. Thanks very much for your time, and we respectfully salute all of your service. Thank you, Chairman, Chairperson Carroll, for hearing us out. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be uh, Kenneth Ruggiero. Kenneth Ruggiero will, will be followed by Edgardo uh, Gonzalez Rivera. Kenneth, if um, I will be promoting you to panelists now, if you could please uh, unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Okay. Uh, are you able to unmute yourself, please? Great. Good evening, uh, Chairperson Carroll and Commissioners. Um, my name is Kenneth Ruggiero. I speak as a minister and a person who has experience in maintaining and improving buildings and churches for over two decades. The West Park Presbyterian Church and the Center at West Park is not just a building. It's a sacred place, made so by many years of parishioners coming along with their families and praying to their God. Religious services are still being performed today. The center is being used on a daily basis for performances, plays, and other various uses to other artists. To say the building is in a huge disrepair is highly inaccurate and does not fall under Section 25-311 Type B violation. Yes, the facade may need some repairs, much like brownstone building, any brownstone building would. And actively, there are dozens of brownstone buildings currently making these such repairs. Anyone who owns a home knows that the maintenance and repairs are a daily battle. And although the building may have been neglected, uh, it does not make it unsafe. The construction materials used back then when it was erected were made of pretty high quality material. They were made to withstand the wind weather elements. The rear of the fa facade of the building, 
which is made of brick that I have showed some of the count uh, the commissioners during an early visit shows solid supported walls, the same brick which is under the facade at the front of the building, and it's being protected, which means that the brick under the facade must also be solid because the facade in the back is in pretty solid condition. Um, the LPC created in 1965, which is the largest municipal preservation in the nation, was created to preserve and landmark historical places with more than 37,800 landmark properties, much like the Statue of Liberty or the Empire State Building. This building represents generations of history in our city. In 2010, when the Landmark Commission felt it was safe enough, they landmarked this property. I ask that you use the same judgment and continue to keep it landmarked. I ask that you deny this application for hardship. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be uh, Edgardo Gonzalez Rivera. Please raise your hand uh, so that we can call you to speak. Following Edgardo Gonzalez Rivera, we will have um, Evan Taub. All right, uh, Edgardo Gonzalez, I will be promoting you to Palace, after which we ask you to unmute yourself, uh, state your name for the record, and you will have three minutes to speak. If you could please, uh, okay, great. It, it saddens me that we have come to this level of confrontation between a small community of faith and the neighborhood of the West Side. I will only pray that we can come to an agreement. And sadly, I have to shorten my speech and probably not be able to deliver it because of it is approaching a time in which I have to go and teach a class. Uh, may God bless you and keep you and grant you the wisdom to come to the right decision. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Ivan Taub. Uh, Ivan Taub will be followed by Evelyn Lutz. Ivan Taub, I'll be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to, um, to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you have three minutes to speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, my name is Evan Tao. I'm a tax attorney and resident of the neighborhood. Thank you, commissioners. I oppose the petition. With the rich environment and history of the church, it's many floors and tenants that have the opportunity to use the church facilities for performance and creative purposes. The church has been an asset to benefit the community at large. The mission of the LPC is to preserve the city's landmarks, properties, by working with the owners to ensure that plan changes are appropriate to the character and style of the building for protecting architecturally, historically, and culturally significant sites, which represent the cultural, social, and architectural history of the city to foster civic pride for the education, pleasure, and welfare of the people. Please do not enable financially motivated parties to demolish the church. For the hardship test, the church is being valued at its highest and best use as a vacant property without a designated landmark being present. Using that valuation to suggest they are not receiving a 6% return under the hardship provision makes no sense in this scenario. The church has neglected key aspects of maintaining the church with negligent behavior to try to force a demolition of the church. The church has not taken any steps to identify alternative approaches to raise money to manage the church. They did not consider selling air rights above the church, they did not consider selling the community building on the east end of the property that has 35 feet of frontage on 86th Street. 
The sole motive of the church should have been to raise sufficient funds to maintain the integrity and that condition of the church. How much money should the church realistically need to raise? Have they taken any alternative approaches since the last LPC meeting to arrive at a more balanced solution? Please do not be facilitators to this behavior and financial motive. I would suggest as a solution that the church be reimbursed for all of its out-of-pocket expenses since the church received its landmark status in 2010, plus say $500,000. They are not a for-profit entity with shareholders or investors. They should not assume or expect to receive the largest sum possible, but instead should receive a sum that is in step with the needs of the community and the maintenance of the church. Local community interests are raising funds to fund a tax exempt organization that could purchase the church and then grants could be raised from the city and other organizations to finish the repairs and renovations. The mission of the LPC is not to give up on a landmark structure, but to fight to save landmarks not to rubber stamp applications as opposed to preserving the beauty and functionality of the landmark. CB7 denied the application to demolish the church by a two to one margin. The preservation committee, the CB7 denied the application by eight to one. Nonetheless, the community fears that, fears that it will be politics as usual instead of standing up to preserve the church. Please work with Gail Brewer to preserve this landmark. Please uphold your responsibility as commissioners and do the right thing here and deny the hardship application to demolish the church. There are other options to explore that would provide the church with sufficient funds and not to have to diminish a historic landmark. It is very upsetting to many in the community that you would even consider reversing a previous LPC decision to preserve a cherished landmark building. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Evelyn Latz. Evelyn Latz will be followed by Layla Elias. Evelyn Latz, I'll be promoting you to speaker, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself, uh, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners and members of the community. My name is Evelyn Latsy, and I am a member of Lighthouse Chapel International, the church that currently holds services at West Park. I'm here to ask the commission to deny the presbytery's hardship application because the presbytery has not met the requirements of the Landmarks Law, subsection 25-309, subsection 2. The church building continues to be adequate, suitable, and appropriate for its intended purposes. My church, Lighthouse Chapel International, is a worldwide church with branches in over 190 countries. We have happily called West Park our church home since August 2016. Currently, we hold at least two services on Sundays. Pre-COVID, we also held weekday services. Over the years, our church has been home to our local members and members of our church from across the United States and the world at large who find themselves in New York City. These have included students, diplomats, physicians, and other healthcare workers who also worked uh, during the pandemic in city hospitals during the pandemic. Our congregants enjoy the beauty of the church and the neighborhood as well. Our local members come from all over the tri-state area and beyond. We enjoy the central location of West Park and the neighborhood. Before and after our church services, we patronize the many restaurants, shops, and other social points of interest in the West Park neighborhood. There is no question that the church is in need of extensive repair. This is to be expected of a building of its age. However, the building is not falling apart. I repeat, the building is not falling apart. apart. I know this because I was there barely 48 hours ago. I spent more than five hours this past Sunday at the building. And it's in need of repair, but it's not falling apart. It's not unsafe. Our children are there every day and no one feels un unsafe in the building. It should also be noted 
that the insurers of the church have continued to issue a certificate of insurance for the building, as stated earlier by Gail Brewer. An issue such as this requires a creative and innovative solution. Demolishing the church building is a simple solution, but it is not the only solution to relieving the presbytery from what it considers, unfortunately, to be a burden. There are other economically viable options for preserving and maintaining the building. It appears that the presbytery has not pursued such options because it aims to maximize profits. Allowing the presbytery and not for profits to sell to the highest bidder would go against the letter intent and spirit of its non -for, not for profit designation. West Park Presbyterian Church and the building embodies that all that is good about New York City, history, architectural beauty, diversity, arts, inclusivity, and yes, faith and community. Every Thank you day, so much. We're out of time. If you could please wrap up. Sure. The commission cannot oversee the demolition of one of the most important buildings in New York City. Demolishing the church will cause irreversible harm to the Upper West Side in New York City. There's a way to preserve West Park Presbyterian. The commission should do its job. The commission owes it to prosperity to preserve this building. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Layla Elias. If you could please raise your hand so we can call on you. Following Layla Elias, we'll have Claudette Brady. All right, Layla Elias, could you please raise your hand? I'll be promoting you to panelist. Um, once you're promoted, could you please uh, unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Layla, are you able to connect to audio? Okay. Okay. My name is Layla Elias. I have been a member of West Park Presbyterian Church for many years. While I appreciate all the work that the center has done in the past five years, I do believe that the church deserves some credit for the artistic events and the various building repairs that we have done. West Park Church pays over $50,000 in, in a year in insurance for the building, and we receive very little in return. The church has recently paid for part of the roof repair and, a, and the new scaffolding outside the church, and we are still responsible for all DOB violations. The church simply has no money to subsidize the center and its various arts groups that rent out the church space. The church should not be accused of demolition by neglect. It has done everything to take care of the building and fund the various church events. And um, this is thank you so much for listening to my statement. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Claudette Brady. Uh, Claudette Brady is our last uh, pre-registered speaker, after which we'll be transitioning to, um, to non-registered speakers who are currently still in the meeting. Uh, Claudette Brady, I'll be uh, transitioning you to speaker, after which if you could please unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon. Good evening. Oh, good evening. It is that time. I've been on here since nine o'clock this morning, so I've lost track of time. My name is Claudette Brady. I am a community activist from Bed-Stuy, responsible with my community members for the designation of the Bedford Historic District and the Stuyvesant Heights Expanded Historic District. I am also a Presbyterian. I chose to speak today because as a Presbyterian, I see so many churches 
historic Presbyterian churches in the outer boroughs that face possible demolition, sale and demolition. Unfortunately for these churches, we do not have a Debbie Hirschman, a Mark Ruffalo, a Gail Brewer as our champions. On Saturday, I attended a meeting at West Park. And at that meeting, I found my personal connection to West Park. I always believed that church should be community and that community extended to me. My first Shakespearean play was a public theater play, Hamlet with Raul Julia, who I still have a crush on today. When I was in my twenties, I was in the fashion industry and so many of my colleagues and friends died because of AIDS. At that time, I decided to volunteer with God's Love We Deliver because I felt that ministering to people with AIDS was just was also a personal connection, not just donating money, but actually visiting people and feeding them and spending time with them. I also found a personal connection with Debbie as I was a moderator for the Craftivist program at JCC. The church building can be saved. Debbie Hirschfeld has a proven track record of fundraising, of building community. And with the assistance of Gail Brewer, Mark Ruffalo, Amy Schumer, and all the residents of the Upper West Side, that ability to save this historic building is within their hands. Thank you so much for the time today. And I do hope that the commission will not I'm sorry, I'm, I'm exhausted, will choose not to deregulate, de de designate this structure. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Valerie Brett Bradley. So Valerie Bradley, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, my name is Valerie Bradley and I'm president of Safe Harlem Now. I welcome the opportunity to give testimony against the hardship application for the West Park Presbyterian Church. We opposed the application when we testified last year and we continue to oppose it. Because our historic brownstone line blocks, majestic houses of worship and sites of important 20th century African-American cultural and political accomplishments are being targeted one by one for demolition and wholesale redevelopment by real estate interests, we organized in 2015 to save the Harlem we love. We want to increase protections to the built environment of Harlem and protect its heritage. West Park's struggles are not new and they are painfully familiar to dozens of congregations in Harlem. Many of our faith-based institutions are burdened with dwindling memberships, lack of funding, deferred maintenance, large assets that are costly to maintain, and relentless real estate pressures from a city and an industry that encourages them to sell their properties in exchange for meager premiums and lofty promises. Churches are not only places of worship, they represent the heartbeat of the community that they have helped to build. We gather in churches to celebrate matrimonial unions, bless our babies, and say our last farewells to elders. Churches are our original social service provider where all community members are served regardless of their status or social station and where their needs are met. 
Park West has been all of this and things and all of these things to its community. West Park's stunning Romanesque revival style is a reminder of St. Martin's Episcopal Church, an individual landmark in the Mount Morris Historic District, and its sister church, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in the Hamilton Heights Historic District. The similarities between West Park and these two Harlem churches is not just a matter of style, but of substance too. Both Harlem churches are in distress and face the same challenges. In fact, St. Luke's is currently up for sale. The only thing that is keeping these churches standing is that they are designated landmarks. Their landmark status is also what gives hope to their surrounding community that they will never be demolished and that whatever the future brings, any proposed alterations will be subject to vigorous reviews by the commission to ensure an appropriate outcome. Allowing the demolition of the individual landmark West Park will set a terrible legal precedent that will tie the commission's hands and will make it increasingly difficult to say no to the next designated church that chooses demolition over an alternative plan of survival. Save Harlem now asks that the Landmarks Preservation Community unequivocally rejects this hardship application. Voluntary demolition of an individual landmark is not the correct way. Valerie, I'm terribly sorry you're over time. Could you please sum up your testimony? I was about to, to address the challenges faced by West Park. Dozens of churches in Harlem and others around the New, New York City we need new thinking to solve the growing problem facing the city's historic churches and their neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Catherine Abrams. So Catherine Abrams, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Okay. okay. And if you can oh. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So please state your name and uh, you'll have three minutes to speak. My name is Catherine Abrams. I live on 86th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. For over 20 years, there has been a sidewalk shed around the church that is the subject of today's hearing to protect the pedestrians from the falling uh, stone from the side of the church. Despite the shed, stone has fallen on the ground outside the shed continually. On Saturday, before the celebrities and the cameras came, somebody came and power washed away the facing of the church that was on the sidewalk. That does not mean that this church is going to continue to stand. And it would be a shame if the people on this commission had to regret deaths either inside the church or on the sidewalk when it collapses. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much for your testimony. Next up, we'll be hearing from Richard Moses. So Richard Moses, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Richard Moses, I'm the president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. LESPI remains highly opposed to this hardship application, which would lead to the demolition of the West Park uh, Presbyterian Church, certainly one of New York's great individual landmarks. Our previous testimony of June 2022 attests to our objections. 
After reviewing the additional application materials provided by the LPC, we're still not at all certain that every avenue for restoration, adaptive reuse, or sale to a new owner has been explored, particularly at the presbytery level. Still further, the plight of the church has attracted the attention of a significant number of individuals outside the preservation community who may very well be able to provide fresh ideas and other assistance that would result in safeguarding the building. Countless communities in New York City and around the country managed to save their endangered historic churches through creative financing and adaptive reuse. And we believe it is quite possible that West Park Church could be saved from demolition as well. In the meantime, under no circumstances should this revered landmark be demolished until all viable options have been vetted. Support of this hardship application and the subsequent loss of this building would not only be a great loss to New York's cultural and architectural heritage, but would set a terrible precedent that can endanger landmark churches throughout the city. We respectfully urge the commission to deny this proposal. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Kenneth Lonergan. Kenneth Lonergan, I am promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, am I on? Uh, how are we doing? Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can see and hear you. Okay, thank you. My name is Kenneth Lonergan. I am an Upper West Side native. I grew up two blocks from the church. I'm a playwright, screenwriter, and film director. I worked in New York theater for 40 years, and I know it from top to bottom. I'm here to address some of the concrete uh, discussions about not just the present of the church, but the future of the church as an arts center. Um, center at Park West is already home to several different theater companies. You've heard from them today. I've had my own work performed here and seen the work of my friends and colleagues performed and developed here for years. With an investment from the New York City arts community who already committed to its future as I speak, there's a chance, there's a good chance, there's a future for this institution to join the ranks of New York City arts institutions that are already known throughout the world and have beginnings no less modest. We're starting next season, next in the fall, the center has agreed to let me present a complete cycle of six previously produced plays, Broadway and Off-Broadway this coming fall, not to aggrandize myself, but to bring people into the center. We want to work side by side with the artists that are already in the center, with the young people who are working there and who've made it such a vibrant place. I can bring in talent, my friends and colleagues in the theater and film community, with Mark Ruffalo, Matt Damon, Matt, Matthew Broderick, Michelle Williams, Elaine May, Jay Smith Cameron, Kieran Culkin, Michael Sarah, Aubrey Plaza, fellow writers like Tony Kushner, Steve Nadley Gerges, Amy Herzog, Annie Baker, Tom Stoppard, Susan Laurie Parks, and more are already willing and able to contribute their work and their time to this kind of a theater project. Again, without displacing the artists who are already there. In terms of community outreach, nobody in the city is better equipped or better trained than New York City arts professionals to enlist and inspire young people with limited resources and limited means to inculcate hope, develop talent, foster self-reliance and breathe life potential of every beating heart in every school and every community in this neighborhood and the city at large. Every major theater company in this city started out in a basement or church or warehouse. Joe Papp's Public Theater is the most famous, the greatest example of all. This was its first home. Public theater, which when with Joe Papp in 1958, elicited from the then Parks Commissioner Robert Moses a brief scrawl and a letter of the margin of a letter from the unknown, untried Joe Papp won't work, wrote Moses. None of these institutions, not Angels, not Labyrinth Theater Company, not Manhattan Class Company, not Atlantic Theater Company, which just won five Tony Awards on Broadway. None of them started to be the center. Not the location, not the spaces inside, not the beautiful architecture inside and out. They had neither the location resources nor the backing of the powerful and influential community leaders, working theater professionals, the faith based initiatives nor the funding sources which have sprung up on every corner from every crack in the sidewalks around the church over the last six weeks alone. And we've only begun to hear from them. Either the church is falling down or it isn't. It doesn't seem to be. Either the church is a 
either the, the community, the Presbyterian community, the congregation will be made whole. Either the money is there to protect, to save the church, to build up from what it is already, or it isn't. We can get the money, we are getting the money. No designated public space in a luxury apartment complex can do what this building can do. You cannot replace an art center with a playroom. We do not need help, we need an open path to the future and the continued support of a Landmarks Preservation Commission that preserves our landmarks and makes them available. Uh, Mr. Morgan, if you yes, can- Yes, absolutely, for the future that we all share, this building, this institution, and the institutions we are building must not be redesignated, de-designated, or undesignated against the forces of reason, the facts on the ground, and the values that the LPC was founded to disseminate and defend. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you so much for your testimony. Okay, next up, we'll be hearing from Ms. Jenka. So, Ms. Jenka, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You will have three okay. minutes. Yes, my name is Janka Savorovic, and I'm from the Bronx, and I'm, um, I want to say I do not believe that West Park should be sold. It's a community and the land was built for the purpose of worshiping of God, for the art storytelling. And as an educator today, there's a lot of uh, immorality, which causes a lot of broken homes and children are not getting the religious instruction and a conscience is something that you cannot hold in your hand. So I asked some of my students, do you know what sin is? And they weren't taught. And I asked the parent and they were a little embarrassed. And that is the beginning to teach, especially young ones, why they shouldn't take that toy because they want it. It's because, because it belongs to somebody else and because it offends God and it offends their parents. You're not supposed to steal. You're not supposed to disobey your parents. You're not supposed to hurt somebody intentionally. And religion in this country, my family, I'm, my history is Eric Cole Consalvi, who was a, a marquee and a cardinal and having to do with King George, who in the 1700s fought Skyla in the Bronx, Throg's Neck was the first Pentagon and it was called St. Mary's. And Louis, King Louis and King George, like Prince Harry, didn't want an arranged marriage. In fact, they decided to be married to God and to share their money. So uh, it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. They shared their money. And Fort Skyla is a Presbyterian church in Throg's Neck. And there is also many other churches, including a synagogue. So all of these in, in America, you must worship at either a synagogue, a temple, a cathedral, a church, or a mosque or you're supposed to be deported. And we need to bring this back. And many churches are closing because I have identity theft. I'm Shirley Temple, the 1957 Academy Award winner. And that was under President Eisenhower when audio visual became one. And they're changing the timeline because Sunday at St. Francis de Chantel in the Bronx, the servants of Mary are on a land that was part of my land. And it was the Villa Marie Academy, which is run by, it was the Notre Dame where they actually have the crown of thorns from Jesus that gold was poured on it, like as in the Tower of London. So I'm just saying that I have identity theft. A cop was arrested. He stole my house. We have people that are kleptomaniacs. They steal. They don't know what they're doing. And then we have some people who were supposed to protect heirs or whatever, and they take a bribe. So right now we have, it's like Armageddon. And we need our churches. We need our art centers. We need to tell stories. And the stories are supposed to say why it's no good to feel or hurt people or disobey parents or do any thank kind you so of much your time uh your time is up thank you so much okay uh next we'll be hearing from mitch mitch i'm promoting you to panelist right now and if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record you'll have three minutes to speak hi uh, Mitch Shamroth, I'm a neighbor for close to 30 years and I'm the treasurer of the center at West Park. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to go over a few things. Uh, the report Alchemy gave is obviously self-serving and not true, which was shown by WJE. Roger Leaf was asked if there were no offer, other offers and he said, no, this is absolutely not true, which has been stated before. 
Um, also, uh, it was just stated that uh, the church was uh, cleaned on the outside before uh, Saturday's uh, gala, I mean, uh, rally. And that is absolutely true. We washed away bird droppings, not cement. Um, we've been improving and taking care of the outside and inside of the building. Also, it was stated that the church has been giving money toward fixing up the building. That was true. That is not true for certainly the last year, year and a half since they started this. Um, they have not given money to fix the building, nor have they helped to pay for the sidewalk shed. Also, the congregation, which probably is closer to five members rather than 12, they obviously need to sell the building because they don't have the money to fix it. And the Presbytery of New York doesn't want to put money in. That's fine. But the Presbyterian congregation have not kept up the building for 20 years. And now they claim that it's hardship. The center at West Park has put in over $500,000 into fixing up the building, and we continue to. Um, we agree that the church needs to sell the building. We are a willing buyer. We're not asking them to keep it. If we buy it, the con it solves lots of problems for the congregation, everything that they claim that they have. One is that the congregation will have money to support their mission and a place of worship. They can have their money and not have to take care of the building. We will. The only argument the church has used is that they didn't think that we could raise the money to care for the building. This is just not true. You've certainly heard testimony by many people that we have millions of dollars in waiting to purchase it. And once we do, that there's public funds and other monies that can be used to fix it up. So uh, with that said, um, I appreciate the time and uh, please deny this application. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Carolyn Stem. So Carolyn Stem, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Okay. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes of speaking. Hello, Carolyn Stem, are you with us? Hello, Carolyn Stem. You could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. Hi, Hello. I'm Carolyn Stem. Um, I've lived on the Upper West Side here for four decades, almost a half a century. And every day I pass this magnificent, wonderful, beautiful building. And I see in this beautiful building, I see spirituality, I see creativity, I see the arts, I've been to concerts there, I see culture there, I I, I see children there. I, I see a community, I see a community. And it's brought by this wonderful, architecturally gorgeous building. And I am so proud as a New Yorker that this is in my neighborhood, this building. And, and I, um, you know, when I think of what the, uh, uh, real estate developers see, they see money and they see a tall, big Lego building. And once they build that and they get their profit, they're gone. A uh, gone also is our, is our community that's centered there uh, around this beautiful church. What, what a wonderful project this is to create to re reestablish this this beautiful building to fix it up to restore it 
to restore it, to make it what it originally was when it was created. We can do that. We have, we have that, that capabilities, our, our, our generation. And, and, and I, uh, I, I I just am so proud to be a part of of this community that has this wonderful building, and I hope I just hope that you do not destroy it and get rid of it. You know, when I saw those pictures of of the building that the uh, uh, that Doctor Facade uh, gave. It just reminded me of my 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 chart and my X-rays, you know, and I was thinking, wow, uh, I'm I'm glad my doctor didn't tell me that I should give up and and destroy me, you know. No, he says we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. You're going <laughs> to you're going to have a transplant. You'll 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 fix yourself up. You, you're not going to destroy yourself and. That's what those pictures reminded me of. So anyhow, I'm I'm just getting very excited here. But please, please consider that this is a community. This is a gorgeous edifice. It's unique and it's historic. And let's keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we will be hearing from Judith Love. Judith Love, I am promoting you to panelist right now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, I'm just, I'm a member of the community who has attended many cultural events at West Park and happily go, uh, happily looking forward to more cultural events. It's a wonderful addition to the community. I'm very happy to be part of it. And I urge you and hope very much that you'll keep this building alive and alive for the community. And that's all, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Seed. So Seed, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, my name is Terry Young. Sorry for <laughs> not changing the title. Um, dear chair and commissioners, um, I'm the elder of Bedford Park Presbyterian Church in the Bronx. I am in support of hardship application. I believe Every effort has been made by the congregation, presbytery, and generous donors. And I do, yet I do believe that West Park faces and or faced financial hardship. First of all, the church sold men's. That's a pastor's residence. That's a house. The church had a loan from the presbytery. The presbytery, presbytery did everything to help. But please understand, presbytery has over 100 churches out there in five boroughs. And the church cannot pay the DOB ticket right now. The clock is ticking. The congregation throughout years Throughout the years, the congregation members came to the Presbytery meeting. West Park Presbytery leaders came and asked for help. That's why the Presbytery is here to support West Park Pres Presbytery members, I should say. 
not because of money. On a personal level, my church is in the Bronx and we are, I mean, our, my church is also experiencing hardship. We have been thinking, the session members have been thinking and considering options, landmarking, but after witnessing the West Park's challenges, we, we remove that option. Instead, we are considering to build affordable housing and to build a sanctuary. Inside of our sanctuary, there's no air conditioning. You know why? Because the congregation members did not want to touch the ceiling. So this is the, if the West Park is trying to rebuild it, this means SOS, desperate situation, cannot survive. We have a lot of possibilities, but those are the ones we already explored. And in the near future, you'll probably have a lot of transformations from Presbyterian churches because as members and other people, also older, other people said, our members are declining and we're trying to repurpose. We're trying to survive. I'm sorry, if you could please sum up your testimony, but, you're out you know, of time. Nothing, nothing takes precedence over safety issue. Safety is more important than the building. And we are all responsible for this decision. Thank you all. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Daisy Rivera. So Daisy Rivera, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Unmute, okay. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful, okay. Thank you uh, for accepting my uh, talk for a few minutes here. Uh, yes, my name is Daisy Rivera and I am against the, uh, um, the demolition of the church. I am a older underrepresented Latina playwright and I am also a participant uh, as a singer musician with my boyfriend at the Open Mic, West Park Open Mic. And we have been attending uh, the Open Mic since 2019, every Friday from 8 p.m. to 12 midnight or so, every Friday night. Uh, and uh, these are musicians and art artists and uh, uh, actors and uh, theater people, and I just want to quickly reach out to Mr. Mark Ruffalo for um, having come and come on and speak on behalf of the church, because if it wasn't for a friend of ours at Open Mic, um, uh, um, who knows us and knows me as a playwright, he uh, actually invited us to the dress rehearsal of Between Riverside and Crazy, and um, uh, so we were really happy to be able to attend that because we're, we're, we're not able to afford Broadway tickets. Um, so there is a whole interconnection of artists and performing artists and singers and musicians, um, older uh, musicians, playwrights, what have you. Um, and this goes beyond just the community at, at open mic. This extends to senior centers, um, Lenox Hill, um, Hamilton. Um, there are many, many retired actors, performers, singers at these senior centers. And we all connect at open mic, poets, uh, comedians, um, and it is rich with diversity. And, um, you know, there's one singer there who's 90, he just turned 97, and he has been sing, uh, performing with, you know, Nat King Cole and Tony Bennett, and he's a clarinet uh, uh, player. And 
So I would just uh, hope that I've lived in this neighborhood for 30 years and um, I'm hoping that I could one day uh, uh, produce my play at um, West Park um, and hopefully uh, as an actor in my play also, you know, uh, apply for equity, uh, you know, uh, open enrollment and uh, trying to get uh, other Latino actors uh, to enroll in the open enrollment of equity. Um, so, but if I can't produce my play, you know, and, uh, um, you know, the likelihood would, would, you know, so I would not be able to um, join the equity and, uh, you know, um, that would be a very, very sad thing. So I, I hope that it doesn't, you know, I hope that, uh, Right. Yes. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your three minutes are up. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. Good. Okay. I do not see any further hands raised for this item. Okay. I didn't. No other hands are being raised. So I will just note we also received eighty-two additional letters from residents and. Uh, all of which was submitted to the commissioners beforehand. And I will bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Great, thank you very, very much. And I wanna thank everybody for your participation today. I wanna let you know this is, um, as we've described, a very technical application. It's also a rare application for the commission. And we are going to take it very seriously. We are going to consider all information that we've heard as well as materials that have been submitted. And we will evaluate this with extreme care and rigor as we can move through the process. So the testimony today was very informative. I want to let you know we have um, already received um, much written testimony. Uh, we will keep the record open for another week as I said earlier, so that uh, anyone would like to testimony do so. And then we will begin the process of analyzing all of the information and we'll let everybody know what the next steps are. But for now, we're going to close the hearing. I want to thank, again, the public for participating. And I want to thank our commissioners for your dedication and um, care and thought and rigor as well in this process. And so um, with that, I'm going to ask Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. You and Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed. And as I said, we will keep uh, everyone posted on next steps in the process. Thank you all again for your participation. And thank you, Commissioners, for your hard work today, uh, starting at 9 o'clock this morning. So everybody have a lovely evening.